Chapter 22 SLNS Joseph Buckley plowed implacably closer to the planet Flax, decelerating steadily. Task Force 496's approach velocity dropped towards 19,000 kps, and the tension on Sandra Crandall's flag deck ratcheted steadily upward. No one was going to admit that, of course, but as Hago Shavarshian watched the men and women around him, he'd realized that quite a few more of them were more aware of the implications of what was about to happen than they cared to reveal or than he himself had suspected. Part of the tension was an odd mix of apprehension and anticipation. For some, it represented eagerly sought retribution for the destruction of Jean Bart, but for the majority, it was something far less welcome. The anticipation of launching the first real war the Solarian League had ever fought. Because that was what this really was. Crandall could present it any way she wanted, but this was no simple police action. For the first time in its history, the Solarian Navy faced an adversary which had a genuine battle fleet, a true wall of battle, even if that wall was far smaller than the SLNs. And little though any Solarian officer wanted to admit it, most of the men and women around Shavarshian were clearly aware that they were about to go up against an experienced adversary. Confident in their own equipment and doctrine or not, however contemptuous of neobarbs they might be, they were far from immune to the anxious butterflies which always affected the novice when he looked across the field of battle at a grimly prepared veteran foe in battered, well-used armor. And this particular bunch of novices is suddenly realizing just how grateful it is that it's not up against ships of the wall this time, he reflected with grim humor. Range 56.75 million kilometers, Lieutenant Commander Golbatsi announced, and his eyes flitted from the icons on his plot to the time-to-range display ticking steadily down to one side. Closing velocity, 19.38 thousand kps. Point longbow in three minutes from now. Thank you, Adam, Scotty Tremaine acknowledged and quirked an eyebrow at Lieutenant McDonald. May I assume you would have mentioned anything we'd heard from Commodore Terakov, Stilson? You may, sir, the comm officer replied, and Tremaine smiled. Every member of his staff, with the exception of Lieutenant Yelland, had seen combat before. None of the others had seen as much of it as he and Horace Harkness, but none were showing any signs of panic either, which, given the sheer tonnage rumbling towards them, was a not insignificant accomplishment Technical superiority or no technical superiority, he supposed. Any changes in their EW, chief? he asked. No, sir. Harkness shook his head, his eyes intent as he studied his own displays. We're picking up a little activity on those ALO platforms of theirs, but nobody's bringing them online just yet. We should see them pretty soon, though. This looks like pre-battle systems tests to me. Sandra Crandall crossed her arms and chewed her lower lip thoughtfully as she gazed into the tactical plot. Halo system test completed, ma'am, Wu Yang Jingwei told her. EW appears nominal. The admiral nodded curtly and her frown deepened. Assuming the range numbers from the new Tuscany dispatch boat were accurate, her task force was little more than 10 million kilometers outside the maximum powered missile envelope of those ships orbiting flax. It still seemed likely the Mantis would wait to open fire at their maximum effective range, however. The longer the range, the less accurate their fire control would be under any circumstances, and when she cranked in her task force's better EW ability and active defenses, effective range got a lot shorter against an alert fleet of super dreadnoughts than it would have been against Joseph Bing's surprised battlecruisers. Still, if Wu Yang was right about what those fleeing impeller wedges had dropped off— the Mantis probably had far more missiles than they could possibly control, and no special reason to conserve ammunition. Under those circumstances, they'd want to start whittling away at her as soon as possible, even at relatively poor hit probabilities. She was committed to close combat with them now, which meant they were committed to close combat with her as well, and they'd want to reduce her offensive power as much as possible before that happened. And they might always get lucky— even unlikely things sometimes happened. 
but there were also those graph pulses Ouyang had reported, and some of them seemed to be originating from surprisingly short ranges. If they really were from FTL recon platforms, the fact that they could get that close and survive said unhappy things about how stealthy they were. That was bad enough, but it also meant the Mantis were getting disgustingly good looks at her SDs, and she felt no inclination to start showing them an active halo system any sooner than she had to. There was no point giving their computers additional time to analyze her EW. Still... Activate Halo at 40 million kilometers, she said. Point Longbow in one minute, ma'am. Thank you, Dominica. Michelle Hankey's acknowledgement of Dominica Adenauer's report sounded preposterously calm. Particularly, Michelle realized a moment later, because that was exactly how she felt. This moment lacked the vengefulness of New Tuscany, Instead, there was a balanced, singing tension at her core, a sense of something almost but not quite like detachment, a poised, cat-like something, she realized, that she'd seen more than once in Honor Alexander Harrington, but never expected to experience herself. God, I refuse to turn into another Honor. The thought sent a ripple of amusement through her, a flicker of welcome warmth. Lord knows I love her, and we all need her, but I flat out refuse to grow up that much. She shook her head, unaware of the way her staff was looking at her, or the way her sudden smile swept across her flag deck like a calming breeze. Point Longbow, sir. Stillwell Lewis's taut-voiced announcement cut through the disciplined silence of Quentin St. James's flag deck, and Sir Ivar Terakov nodded. Engage, he said simply. Missile launch! Jacomina von Hoyts twitched as Commander Sambroth's warning rapped out sharply, and her eyes flicked to the fountain of fresh icons which suddenly speckled the plot. Range at launch 53.906 million kilometers. Sambroth sounded as if she couldn't really believe her own numbers. Assuming constant accelerations, time of flight, 7.5 minutes. Stand by, missile defense, Van Hoyts heard her own voice say, but it seemed to come from someone else, far away, as she saw the impossible number of missiles screaming towards her ship. The Saiganami C-Class heavy cruiser massed 480,000 tons, it mounted 20 missile launchers in each broadside, and it was capable of off-bore fire with both broadsides simultaneously. More, it had been designed from the outset around the Mark 16 dual-drive missile. Although it was no pod layer, it did have the capability to stack two double broadsides simultaneously, and the designers had provided it with a 60% redundancy in control links as a reserve against battle damage. Tuning in all of that redundancy gave each of Ivar's Terakov's cruisers 128 telemetry links, and each of those links was assigned to one Mark 23E missile, which in turn controlled eight standard Mark 23s. The 12 ships of Cruiser Squadron 94 and Cruiser Division 96.1 fired just over 1,500 missile pods at Task Force 496, Solarian League Navy. Estimate 12,000, repeat, 12,000 incoming. Sandra Crandall's head snapped around at Ouyang Jingwei's hard, flat announcement. She stared at her ops officer, eyes huge, too shocked by the numbers to register even disbelief. At that, she was doing better than Pepe Bautista. Her chief of staff's expression was that of someone infuriated by a lie rather than someone stupefied by astonishment. Halo active, Ouyang continued. Missile Defense Plan Able activated. Commodore Terakov's open fire, ma'am. Dominica Adenauer's report was one of the least necessary ones Michelle Hankey had ever heard. The thousands upon thousands of icons streaking across the master plot were painfully evident, none of which absolved Adenauer of her formal responsibility to tell her admiral about it. Acknowledged, Michelle said softly. Scotty Tremaine watched the hurricane racing toward the Sollies with something very like a sense of awe. 
he'd seen larger salvos, not once, but many times. For that matter, the Mutual Holocaust's home fleet and Lester Tourville's second fleet had inflicted upon one another at the Battle of Manticore dwarfed even this. But a full third of these missiles had come from ships under his command, and that realization sent an icy chill through his blood. He glanced for just a moment at Horace Harkness's profile and felt an obscure, irrational flicker of reassurance. Harkness's elemental solidity, his unflappable sense of who and what he was, was like a touchstone. It was a reminder of all the challenges Tremaine had met and surmounted in the twenty T years since he'd first set eyes on that battered, competent face, and in the wake of finding himself cast in the role of juggernaut, Scotty Tremaine took a warm and very human comfort from it. Helen Zilwicky stood at Terakoff's side, watching the same plot, and thought about how different this was from the Battle of Monica. As Terakoff's flag lieutenant, she'd been there when he and Admiral Goldpeak and Admiral Overstegen and their ops officers threshed out their plans for Operation Agincourt. Fire distribution had been one of the critical points, and no one had been prepared to make any unwarranted assumptions about the ease with which Sali missile defenses might be penetrated. They'd all been aware that Solarian anti-missile doctrine and capabilities were seriously flawed compared to those of the Republican Navy, but they'd forced themselves to adopt the most pessimistic estimates of their ability to capitalize on those flaws. Of the 12,288 standard Mark 23s in that stupendous initial launch, fully one quarter, just over 3,000, were EW platforms. The remaining 9,000-plus were distributed over 23 of Sandra Crandall's 71 super dreadnoughts. Experience against the Republic of Haven indicated that 200 to 250 Mark 23 hits would destroy, or mission kill at least, even the latest Havenite SDP, which was why Fire Plan Alpha had allocated 400 missiles to each of its targets. Spot and allocate the Bravo launch, Sir Ivar's Terakoff said. The wavefront of destruction roared toward Sandra Crandall's super dreadnoughts from far, far beyond the Solarian's own range of Ivar's Terakov's command. There was no fear-pumped adrenaline surging through the minds of the tactical officers behind that stupendous missile launch. Despite the pygmy size of their own vessels, compared to those of their opponents, they recognized the full, deadly depth of their advantages— knew the men and women aboard those super dreadnoughts could not effectively threaten them in any way. Knowing that, those minds ticked with cool, merciless precision, watching their displays, monitoring their missiles and the EW environment with hawk-like attentiveness. There was no matching coolness aboard Joseph Buckley or the other units of Task Force 496, no one in the entire task force, in his darkest nightmare, could have anticipated the sheer weight of fire streaking towards them. By any meter stick of the Solarian League Navy, it was simply and starkly impossible. The surprise and disbelief that generated were total, yet for all of the SLN's institutional arrogance and complacency, all of their own shock, the men and women of Sandra Crandall's command were professionals. Astonishment, even terror, might reach out to paralyze them, but training slotted into place like a bulwark between them and panic's palsy. Jacquemina von Hoitz heard the quick, purposeful flow of orders and responses around her, and even in the midst of her own shock, she felt a glow of pride. Fear might flatten her people's voices, incredulity might echo in their tones, but they were doing their jobs. They were responding, doing their best, not simply gaping in horror. Yet beyond that pride, there was another emotion. Sorrow because however well they did their jobs, it wasn't going to matter in the end. Hago Shavarshin watched Yang Jingwei and her assistants grapple with the horrifying surprise of that massive missile launch. Shavarshin was no tack officer, but he'd had enough tactical training to know that what was coming at them was not the blind-fired covering barrage Yang had suggested to Crandall and Bautista, the most cursory analysis of those missile signatures showed that every one of them was maneuvering as part of a coherent, carefully managed whole. The fact that that was flatly impossible didn't mean it wasn't happening, and the ops officer was totally focused on her displays, on her earbug, on the reports flowing into her from the task force's huge array of sensor platforms. The intelligence officer envied her. At least she had something to distract her. 
It's got to be some kind of E.W., Bautista protested hoarsely. The chief of staff was staring at the plot, shaking his head again and again. That's no ECM, Pepe, Crandall grated. She jabbed her chin at the secondary displays, showing Joseph Buckley's Combat Information Center's analysis of the incoming impeller signatures. They're there. But, but they can't possibly control them. Bautista turned his head to stare at Crandall. They can't have the control links, and, and even if they did, at this range, their accuracy has to suck. I doubt even Mantis would have fired missiles they can't control. Despite her own shock, despite her truculence and undeniable arrogance, Sandra Crandall's eyes were dark with a refusal to hide behind simple denial. You may be right about the accuracy penalty, but if they can throw enough salvos this size, even crappy accuracy is going to rip our ass off. Bautista's eyes went even wider at her harsh-voiced admission. He opened his mouth once more as if to say something, but no words came, and he closed it again. Crandall never even noticed. Good telemetry from the advanced platform, sir. Stillwell Lewis sounded almost jubilant. They're bringing up their halo platforms, but their shipboard systems show very little change. No surprises so far. Let's not get overconfident, Stillwell. Terakov replied calmly. No, sir. Helen suppressed an inappropriate urge to smile. Lewis's tone was chastened as he acknowledged Terakov's admonition, and she knew the Commodore was right. Yet at the same time, she understood exactly where the ops officer's confidence came from. The Ghost Rider platforms watching the Solarians were three light minutes from Quentin St. James, but those three light minutes equated to less than three seconds of transmission lag for their FTL transmitters. For all intents and purposes, Lewis was watching Crandall's ships in real time. Without Keyhole 2 platforms, there was no FTL telemetry link between Terakoff's cruisers and their missiles, yet the time lag built into their fire control and EW loop was still only half that of any Navy without Ghost Rider. That would have been bad enough from the Sollys' perspective, even if there'd been no Apollo birds driving along behind the attack missiles, but the Mark 23Es were there, and each of them represented a far more sophisticated and capable advanced control node than the SLN had ever imagined. The Echoes had been preloaded with dozens of alternative attack profiles, based on every permutation of Solarian defensive measures 10th Fleet's tactical officers and the simulators had been able to come up with, and their extraordinarily competent onboard AIs were far more capable of adjusting and reshaping those profiles on the fly than any previous attack missile would have been. Of course, even with those stored profiles in AIs, Lewis's fire wouldn't be remotely as effective as it would have been if he'd had the all-up Keyhole 2 systems instead. It was simply incomparably better than anything anyone else had. Halo active. Horace Harkness gazed at his displays, hands moving with the precision of a pianist as he refined the data. Looks like about a 20% increase on the battlecruiser's efficiency, but the filter should be solid unless it gets a lot worse. We're seeing a lot of LIDAR lighting off too, though. I think we'll be looking at the first counter missiles pretty soon. Scotty Tremaine nodded. 20% was a lower increase than the ops plan had allowed for, and he wasn't about to assume it wasn't going to go up over the next couple of minutes. But even if it did... Bravo pods in position, Commander Golbatsi said, and a fresh wave of missile pod icons blinked with the red data codes of readiness on Tremaine's plot. Launch codes receded and acknowledged by all pods. Thank you, guns. Profile Alpha Quebec 1-7, Stilson McDonald announced suddenly. Execute, Tremaine said sharply. Executing Alpha Quebec 1-7-I, Adam Golbatsi responded and sent the command that locked the entire division's first wave missiles into the final attack profile Ivar's Terakov had just ordered. A strange spike... Almost a sense of relief, or perhaps of commitment, swept Alistair McKeon's flag bridge as if everyone on it had inhaled simultaneously. The same awareness flickered across Quentin St. James's flag deck, but Terakov didn't seem to notice. His eyes, like his thoughts, were on the master tactical plot, and those eyes were blue ice. Launch the Bravo Birds, he said, and a second salvo, as massive as the first, roared out of the pods.
30 seconds and 14,177,748 kilometers short of their targets, the Mark 23 E's of Operation Agincourt's Alpha launch receded their final instructions and switched to attack profile AQ-17. The closing velocity was up to 207,412 kps, just over 69% of the speed of light, which was over four and a half times the maximum any Solarian missile could have generated given the same geometry, and the differential would only increase over the last half minute of their existence. The Apollo missile's AIs didn't really care about that, or about their own rapidly approaching destruction, except in as much as it simplified their task. They simply obeyed their instructions, considering the information transmitted to them from their slaved attack missile sensors and comparing the warp and woof of the Solarian defenses to the requirements of AQ-17. Certain minor adjustments were in order. The AIs made them, then sent out fresh instructions. The EW platforms and penetration aids seated throughout the salvo responded. Solarian counter-missile doctrine had never envisioned a salvo density like this. Traditional missile defense planning focused on identifying the attack missiles most likely to achieve hits, and then targeting each of them with multiple counter-missile launches. But there wasn't going to be time for that in the face of such a ferocious closing velocity. In fact, there would be time for only a single CM launch before the MDMs screamed completely across their engagement envelope, and even taking full advantage of the additional fire control of the Aegis refits a third of Crandall's ships had received, her super dreadnoughts could produce less than 2,000 countermissiles per launch. That was approximately one CM for every 6.5 Mark 23 slicing towards them, which would have been hopelessly inadequate under any circumstances. Now, inadequate became futile as the control missiles activated their slaved electronic warfare platforms. Missile defense officers stared in disbelief as their displays went berserk. Dragon's teeth blossomed like seductive flowers, flooding Task Force 496's fire control with false targets. The number of threat sources doubled, then doubled yet again, and again, hopelessly swamping the Solarian system's ability to discriminate the true threats from the counterfeit. The computers driving those systems, and the men and women behind those computers, did their best, but their best wasn't good enough. The incredible horde of false signatures guaranteed the limited number of counter-missiles the Solarians could bring to bear would be effectively useless, but Michelle Hankey and her officers had been unwilling to settle for that. Even as the dragon's teeth spawned, the Dazzler platform spread across the front of the attack salvo, activated in a carefully sequenced chain, ripping huge, blinding holes in Task Force 496's sensor coverage. The Dazzler's exquisitely choreographed chaos reduced even the last-ditch laser clusters of their target's point defense systems to impotence. Of the 9,200 Mark 23 attack birds in Ivar's Terakov's Alpha launch, Sandra Crandall's task force managed to stop exactly 1,007. The other 8,209 got through. SLNS Joseph Buckley lurched indescribably as the Manticoran missiles detonated and X-ray lasers ripped at her massive armor. Thick as that armor was, it was no match for the stilettos of focused radiation punching into it like brimstone awls. It shattered under the transfer energy as the lasers ripped deeper and deeper, and the huge ship bucked in agony. Jacquemina von Hoitz clung to the arms of her command chair as her shock frame hammered her. The fleeting instant in which the Manticoran missiles could bring their lasers to bear against her ship's sidewalls as they penetrated the Solarian formation with a closing velocity which had climbed to 73% of light speed was far too brief for any of Joseph Buckley's damage to register on merely human senses as individual hits. It was all delivered in one stroboscopic lightning bolt of devastation, too sudden and intense for even the ship's computers to register or sort out. Those missile-borne talons gouged and tore. Energy mounts and missile tubes, counter-missile launchers, radar arrays, point defense clusters, boat bays, gravitic sensors, impeller nodes, all of them shattered, exploding into tattered ruin in a single catastrophic moment faster than a man could have blinked. In less time than it would have taken to cough, Sandra Crandall's flagship was transformed into a broken wreck, a splintered hulk, coasting onward under momentum alone, with three-quarters of her crew wiped out of existence. Nor did Van Hoitz's ship die alone. Her squadron mates, Joseph Lister, Max Planck, and Joseph Hutton, died with her. 
Like Buckley, Hutton at least avoided immediate and total destruction, but Lister and Planck were less fortunate. Lister shattered, breaking into three distinct pieces. Planck simply disappeared in a flash of white-hot fury. Archimedes, Andreas Vesalius, Hipparchus, Leonardo da Vinci, Gregor Mendel, Marie Curie, Wilhelm Röntgen, Alfred Wegener, Avicenna, al Khwarizmi, every one of the Alpha Launch's 23 targets, 32% of Crandall's total wall of battle, was reduced to splinters and wreckage in that single, inconceivable, exquisitely synchronized explosion. Sir Ivar's Terakov watched a third of the super-dreadnought icons on his plot blink virtually simultaneously from the glaring crimson of hostile units into the purple crosses of dead ships, or into nothing at all. His arctic blue eyes didn't even flicker at the proof of how utterly outclassed the Solarian League Navy truly was, but his nostrils flared. He gazed at the display for almost a full minute, absorbing the results, watching the sudden disintegration of the Solarian Wall's formation as individual captains tried to avoid the debris of slaughtered consorts or swerved in frantic independent evasion patterns as the Bravo launch swept towards them. Then he turned to look at Stilwell Lewis. Execute exclamation point, he said. Executing exclamation point, I sir. Lewis's fingers stabbed a key at his console, and twenty seconds later, every one of the Bravo launch missiles detonated as one, millions of kilometers short of their targets. Spot the Charlie pods, but hold launch, Terakov said. Holding Charlie launch, I sir, Lewis replied, and Terakov sat back in his chair, waiting. Forty-five more seconds ticked past. A minute. 90 seconds. Then, abruptly, every surviving Solarian starship's wedge went down simultaneously. Another two and a half minutes oozed into eternity while light speed limited transmissions sped toward HMS Hercules and Quentin St. James. Then. Sir? Captain Loretta Shoup told Augustus Kumalo quietly. Communications is picking up an all-ship's transmission from an Admiral Keeley O'Cleary. She wants to surrender, sir. Chapter 23 And now, Michelle Henke thought dryly as she stood on Artemis's flag bridge, hands clasped behind her, and watched the icons of Admiral Enderby's lacks move steadily towards their destinations, for the fun part. I know I shouldn't, but I can't help thinking everything would have been a bunch simpler if O'Cleary just hadn't surrendered for another salvo or two. As it is, we've got a hell of an interesting little problem here. She snorted, grimacing at her own thoughts, but it was true. And ironically, the direct consequence of one of the Royal Manticoran Navy's greater advantages. The one huge problem with the RMN's decision to adopt increased automation in order to reduce its warship's manpower requirements was that it worked even better than anyone had expected. There were very few warm bodies aboard modern Manticoran or Grayson cruisers or destroyers, and even super dreadnoughts had crews smaller than pre-war battle cruisers. That was an enormous advantage in Fifth Space Lord Cortez's Sisyphean task of manning the Navy ships, but it also meant the smaller companies of the ships in question found it much more difficult to generate detachments for little things like, oh, boarding parties, for example. Solarian ships' companies, conversely, were even larger and more manpower-intensive than pre-war Manticoran designs had been, and Sandra Crandall had entered the spindle system with 71 super dreadnoughts, each with a ship's company of over 6,000. Even completely ignoring the rest of her task force, that had amounted to the next best thing to a half million personnel. Tenth Fleet, on the other hand, had nowhere near that many people. A Roland-class destroyer like Naomi Kaplan's Tristam had a total company of less than 70, and not a single one of them was a Marine. A Saganami C, like Ivar's Terakov's Quentin St. James, was somewhat better off. At least each of them had 140 Marines available, 
but that was out of a total crew of only 355. For that matter, even one of the lordly Nikes, like her own Artemis, had a company of barely 750, which meant the total personnel of all Michelle's warships, including Kumalo's super-dreadnought flagship and the four carriers of Stephen Enderby's Sealax Squadron and their lack groups, amounted to barely 32,000. Crandall's surviving 48 super-dreadnoughts alone carried ten times that many men and women, and that didn't even consider the 50,000 or so aboard her battlecruisers and destroyers. Nor did it consider the need to provide search and rescue parties for the nine crippled super-dreadnoughts which had not been totally destroyed. All of which meant she was incredibly short-handed for dealing with such a stupendous haul of POWs, and she frankly didn't know what she was going to do with all of them. She had nowhere near the hypercapable personnel lift to transfer them back to the prison camps in the Star Empire, currently populated by the personnel of Lester Tourville's Second Fleet. For that matter, she wasn't at all certain those camps, despite their frenetic expansion following the Battle of Manticore, would have had sufficient space for her current catch even if she'd been able to get them there. Baroness Medusa was scrambling to find some place to store them, at least temporarily. Unfortunately, no one on Flax had ever contemplated the absurd notion that the planet might suddenly have to absorb the better part of 400,000 visitors like these, and the governor's options were limited. At the moment, Michelle knew, Medusa was inclining towards the same solution Michelle herself had experienced during her brief stint as a prisoner of war on Haven. Flax possessed several large, uninhabited tropical islands, many with the sorts of climates that evoked Pavlovian salivation from vacation resort developers. There was no housing on them at the moment, but food and water could be transported in, emergency sanitation arrangements could be made, and more permanent housing could be built once the immediate crisis had been dealt with. No matter what we do, the Sollies are going to scream we've abused their personnel by refusing to house them properly and deliberately leaving them exposed to the elements, she thought glumly. But all we can do is the best we can do, and hope the Admiralty can find some place back home to keep them, not to mention the shipping to get them some place back home. From the perspective of pure combat power, Crandall's task force wasn't even in the same league as Tenth Fleet. In fact, Michelle and her senior tacticians had been shocked by the totality of their own success. They'd deliberately adopted pessimistic assumptions about their ability to penetrate Solarian missile defenses, only to find their most optimistic estimations had fallen short of the reality. Despite everything, she'd been convinced it would take at least several salvos to inflict the sort of damage required to extort a surrender from someone as belligerent and obviously arrogant as Sandra Crandall. She'd certainly never anticipated that Terakov's opening salvo would shatter its targets so completely. She was fully aware of the scale of her victory, and that her firepower advantage was overwhelming. Yet, from the perspective of securing its prizes, Tenth Fleet was in the position of someone who chartered a small boat to fish for near tuna and landed a 12-meter fluke shark instead. An impressive achievement, yes, but what did you do with the thing? Well, I guess we're about to find out, aren't we? She thought. At the moment, Terakov's cruisers and Kumalo's super-dreadnought flagship maintained their positions in orbit around Flax, just over 800,000 kilometers from what remained of Crandall's wall of battle. The undamaged Solarian ships, plus their lighter consorts, were motionless relative to the planet, sidewalls and impeller wedges down in obedience to Michelle's orders, and all of her battle cruisers lay 750,000 kilometers outside their current positions. That geometry put every hypercapable man ticker and combatant beyond effective energy range of the Solarian SDs, a uh, not so minor consideration given the fact that any one of those super dreadnoughts could have annihilated Michelle's entire fleet if she'd been foolish enough to stray into the effective envelope of their massive energy batteries. Which was the reason she had absolutely no intention of doing any such thing. It was also the reason both the Saganami Seas and the Nikes were surrounded by veritable shoals of missile pods. Even if these super-dreadnoughts' wedges had been active, 
It would have taken them six minutes at their maximum acceleration to reach energy range even of the battle cruisers, much less Terakov's cruisers. Flight time for a Mark 23 over the same range would have been only 24 seconds. Based on what had already happened to Task Force 496, Michelle rather doubted it would survive the 15 far larger salvos it would have received during those six minutes. More importantly, she felt confident the Sollies could do the same sums. But even as she held her starships at a discreet distance, her lax had maneuvered into position above and below the surviving Solarian warships. Since it had seemed likely the Sollies would have underestimated the capabilities of new-generation Manticoran light attack craft, at least as badly as they'd underestimated those of current-generation Manticoran missiles, she'd arranged demonstration firings of the Shrike Bee's massive grazers. She'd wanted no misconceptions about what those capital shipweight energy weapons could do to the unarmored topsides and bottoms of the Solarian ships of the wall. And while all that was being arranged, her destroyers, all five of them, had accelerated off in pursuit of the nine hulked SDs. Five old-style destroyers could easily have found the boarding parties for search and rescue operations aboard nine super dreadnoughts. Whether or not her five Rolands were up to the task was another question. Now it was time to find out if they were, and if her other arrangements were going to work after all. For the Sally's sake, she hoped they did. Put me through to O'Cleary, Bill, she said without looking over her shoulder. Yes, ma'am, Lieutenant Commander Edwards replied. Michelle gazed into the plot for another few seconds, then turned to face the master comm display as a fair-haired, dark-eyed woman in the white uniform of the Solarian League Navy appeared upon it. Admiral O'Cleary, Michelle said, and at this piddling range, the light speed transmission lag was barely two seconds. Admiral Goldpeak, the other woman responded. Originally TF-496's third-in-command, she'd become its second-in-command when Admiral Duniki Laszlo's flagship, Andreas Vesalius, blew up with all hands. With what remained of Joseph Buckley currently unable to communicate with anyone, assuming there was anyone on board to be communicated with, O'Cleary had become the task force's acting CO. Her voice was a little gravelly, but Michelle suspected that was normal, not something like the stunned anger glowing at the backs of O'Cleary's eyes, produced by the shocking outcome of the Solarian attack on Spindle. My boarding parties are now prepared to take possession of your super dreadnoughts, Admiral, Michelle said levelly, and I fully realize emotions are going to be running high among your personnel. My personnel have been instructed to exercise as much restraint as possible, but they've also been instructed to remember that their own security and the discharge of their orders takes precedence over all other considerations. I sincerely hope no one on either side will cause any avoidable incidents, but I remind you formally, for the record, that under the Deneb Accords, the legal responsibility to avoid such incidents by prompt compliance with my instructions and those of my designated prize crews rests with your personnel as the ones who have been permitted to surrender. O'Cleary's jaw tightened visibly, but despite her anger, she had herself firmly under control. I assure you, Admiral, that I've made all my personnel aware of that fact, she grated. As you say, emotions are running high among them. And as you, I hope there will be no avoidable incidents. Good. Michelle inclined her head in a brief, courteous half-bow of agreement, then cleared her throat. I'm sure you realize, Admiral O'Cleary, that no one here in the Quadrant has made any provision for quartering such a large number of prisoners of war. Michelle saw O'Cleary's eyes flash at the term prisoners of war, but she didn't especially care. In point of fact, she was conceding them a status she wasn't required to under interstellar law, and O'Cleary knew it. There'd been no formal declaration of war when Crandall attacked the sovereign territory of another star nation. Technically, her actions amounted to piracy on the grand scale, and Michelle was under no legal obligation to accord her officers and crews the courtesies normally do regular POWs. The fact that she'd allowed them to surrender under the provisions of the Deneb Accords meant she'd chosen to extend that status to them, but whether or not she was legally required to continue to extend it was what the lawyers like to call a gray area. 
Governor Medusa is currently making arrangements to provide food, shelter, and any necessary medical attention, she continued levelly. We'll do everything in our power to ensure that no one suffers any hardship. Despite that, however, it's very likely, inevitable, to be honest, that housing and services are going to be jury-rigged at best, at least initially. As I say, we'll try to avoid imposing hardship conditions, but again, I remind you that the Deneb Accords specifically recognize the right of any belligerent to use whatever means are necessary, up to and including lethal force, to maintain order among POWs. We have no intention of attempting to pressure any of your personnel into collaborating, and we recognize the Deneb Accord stipulation that it's the duty of captured personnel to attempt to escape. However, it would be well for you to remind your personnel that that stipulation does not grant immunity from the use of force to stop them from escaping or to maintain order among them. Is that an order, Admiral? O'Cleary asked coldly. No, it is not, Michelle replied equally coldly, enunciating each word carefully. It is, however, a very strong suggestion, and I remind you our current conversation is being recorded. It can and will be produced in any inquiry which may result from your personnel's conduct or ours while your people are in our custody. Their eyes locked for several seconds. Then O'Cleary inhaled deeply. Very well. Your suggestion is noted, and I'll speak to my people. Is there anything else? Yes, Michelle said. There is. As I'm sure you've already deduced for yourself, the combined manpower of my fleet is far inferior numerically to that of your own task force. Not that I have any intention of admitting just how inferior, she added silently. That poses some obvious difficulties for my boarding parties, difficulties which might well provoke the sort of incident we've both just agreed should be avoided, and I've been giving some thought to ways those difficulties might be alleviated. By my staff's calculations, the combined small craft and escape pod capacity of your super dreadnoughts should suffice to remove approximately 5,000 of your personnel from each ship. O'Cleary's face stiffened, and she began to open her mouth indignantly, but Michelle continued coldly. Before you say a word, Admiral, I advise you to consider your position carefully. As you've just acknowledged, interstellar law requires you to obey my lawful commands. I, on the other hand, am obligated to provide for the reasonable safety of your personnel as long as you and they do obey my lawful commands. The planet Flax is less than one million kilometers from your present position. That's well within the powered range of your life pods, even allowing a 200% reserve for an unassisted landing. In short, removing your personnel from your vessels in the manner I've indicated poses no threat to life or limb, assuming you've properly maintained the equipment in question. As a consequence, I'm formally informing you that failure to comply with this instruction will be interpreted as a decision on your part to resume hostilities. She held the Solarian's eyes with her own, daring O'Cleary to call her bluff, while silently praying the other woman was smart enough to realize it was no bluff at all. After a handful of tense heartbeats, it was O'Cleary's eyes which fell. I understand, she grated. I'm glad to hear that. Michelle gave her a tight smile. Once your small craft and life pods have separated from your starships, they'll proceed to Flax. There, they will enter orbit as Admiral Kumalo directs and comply with any additional instructions he may issue. They will not land, except as he or I specifically order. We'll make every effort to get them planet-side as promptly as possible, consonant with Governor Medusa's ability to arrange accommodations. I'll guarantee that under any circumstances, your life pods will be allowed to make planet fall well within their life support endurance. If, however, any of your small craft or life pods fail to comply with instructions from myself, Admiral Kumalo, or our designated subordinates, they will be destroyed. I realize these arrangements are unusual, but so are our present circumstances. I've attempted to reach the best compromise I can between the security of my own people and the proper treatment of yours. I expect you to make it clear to all your personnel that we intend to treat them as decently and honorably as circumstances permit, but that any disobedience to our lawful instructions will be met promptly with whatever level of force, up to and including deadly force, we feel is required. 
Is that understood as well? Yes, O'Cleary got out. Good. You may not believe this, Admiral, but I take no pleasure in issuing instructions I know must seem humiliating. Unfortunately, I have no choice. In fact, I'd be derelict in my responsibility to ensure the safety of your personnel if I failed to take the measures necessary to control the present situation and prevent the sort of escalation which would require me to use force to enforce the terms of your surrender. Michelle gazed into O'Cleary's eyes for another moment, hoping the Solarian could recognize the sincerity in her own expression. Then she nodded courteously. Gold Peak clear, she said, and turned back to the master plot with an inner sigh. Truth be told, O'Cleary's attitude had been less belligerent than she'd feared. Unfortunately, that didn't mean it made Michelle happy, nor for that matter did it mean the other officers and enlisted personnel aboard those surrendered ships were going to share O'Cleary's attitude. ATA, three minutes, ma'am, the pinnace's flight engineer said. Thank you, P.O. Pettigrew, Abigail Hearns replied, then stood and turned to face the armed, skin-suited men and women of her boarding party. Given the nature of their mission, there weren't a great many of them. In fact, there were a lot less of them than she wished she had. Three minutes, people, she said, and saw expressions and shoulders tightened. Remember your briefings and watch yourselves. We don't want any accidents or incidents, and this sort of thing can be risky enough even aboard a friendly ship. So while we'd like to avoid any unpleasantness, we'd really like to have all of you back on board safe and sound, too. One or two people chuckled, and Abigail allowed herself an answering smile. Then she looked at the youthful midshipman in the seat beside hers. In some ways, young Walter Corbett reminded her of Gwen Archer, with the same red hair and green eyes. But Corbett had a truly monumental nose compared to Archer's, and he was only nineteen and skinny as a rail to boot. He was also possessed of a nervous energy that found the onerous task of sitting still difficult under normal conditions. Today's conditions were anything but normal, however, and Corbett had sat almost unbreathing for the last ten minutes, his nose two centimeters from the viewport as he stared out it at the shattered behemoth waiting for them. Abigail didn't blame him. Corbett's snotty cruise might have been less personally and directly terrifying, so far at least, than her own aboard then-Captain Overstegen's gauntlet, but there'd been terror and cataclysm enough to go around. And, she thought, any temptation to smile fading as she remembered how the other ships of HMS Tristam's division had been slaughtered by Joseph Bing, he'd had ample demonstration of the risks attendant upon his chosen profession. And he's about to get more, she reminded herself grimly. Unlike young Corbett, she'd seen the insides of butchered starships before. Let's try to see to it he gets back aboard Tristam in one piece, so he can at least profit from the experience that's about to provide so much nightmare fodder. Remember, Walt, she hadn't spoken loudly, but Corbett's head twitched around like a startled rabbit's. You're a Queen's officer. I know you never expected to be doing anything like this on your snotty cruise. Well, I didn't expect everything that happened on my snotty cruise either, as Lieutenant Gutierrez here could testify. She twitched her own head at the massive lieutenant sitting in the row of seats immediately behind the two of them. His marine-style armored skin suit was badged with the shoulder flash of the Owen Steadholder's Guard, not the Royal Manticoran Marines, and a well-used flechette gun rode the cargo rack above his head. A sound which might have been an understatement spawn snort came from the general direction of the lieutenant in question, and a quick grin danced across Corbett's face in response. Clearly, he'd heard all about then-Sergeant Mateo Gutierrez and midshipwoman Hearns' adventures on the planet Refuge. You need to remember three things, Abigail continued in a rather sterner tone. First, you are a Queen's officer. Second, any soul is still alive in there. She nodded towards the forward bulkhead, beyond which the wreck of SLNS Charles Babbage, one-time flagship of Battle Squadron 371, Solarian League Navy, waited for them, have spent their entire careers thinking of themselves as the most powerful navy in the galaxy. 
and of the Star Empire of Manticore and its navy as an upstart little pipsqueak with delusions of grandeur. Third, we have no idea how many Sully personnel may still be alive aboard the Babbage or what kind of shape they may be in. But there are fewer than thirty people in our boarding party. She looked into his eyes steadily until he nodded, then continued. Right this minute, most of Babbage's surviving crew are probably still in a state of shock. I don't know how long that's going to last, and from our perspective, it could be either a good thing or a bad thing, or possibly even both at once. On the one hand, most of them are probably too stunned and too focused on hoping someone's going to come and find them to be thinking about any organized, effective resistance. On the other hand, even if 90% of her company is dead, there are still ten times as many survivors aboard her as in Tristram's entire complement. A lot of them are going to be too happy to see anybody coming to pull them out of the wreckage to give us any trouble, but I'll be astonished if any of them are thinking very clearly. For the ones who aren't, the shock and humiliation and the anger of being hammered so badly by a bunch of neobarbs may push some of them into open defiance. And frankly, the fact that you're only a midshipman's going to piss off a lot of the people you're about to run into. They'd probably resent taking orders from you under any circumstances. Under these circumstances, what they feel is going to be a lot worse than simple resentment. That leaves you with two problems you're going to have to balance off. First, be aware of their resentment and make what allowance for it you can, but second, remember you are an officer, that they are subject to your orders, and that an appearance of weakness may well lead to some kind of incident. She paused once more, and Corbett nodded again. Yes, ma'am, he said, and despite her grim awareness of what awaited them inside that broken ship, Abigail's lips twitched. It would have been unfair to call his tone plaintive, but that was headed in the right direction. It probably won't be that bad, Walt. Not where the survivors are concerned, at least. Yes, you have to be aware of all the things I've just said, but that's why I've attached the bosun to your group. I wouldn't go so far as saying I'm sending him along to look after you, but I will say I expect you to remember he's been in the Navy since you were five T years old. Use his experience accordingly. Yes, ma'am, Corbett said more firmly, and Abigail glanced over his shoulder at Gutierrez. The lieutenant's eyes met hers with the memory of another middy who'd desperately needed the experience of another veteran noncom, and his reassuring nod was a vast relief. Obviously, Matteo had had a few words of his own with Senior Chief Petty Officer Franklin Musgrave, Tristam's bosun. Then all I'm going to add, she told the youngster, is that you're going to see some terrible things in the next few hours. She held his gaze steadily and felt a glow of approval when it didn't waver. No matter what you think you can imagine, it's going to be worse. I know. I've seen it before, and there's no way to really prepare someone for it until they've experienced it for themselves. It's all right to feel shocked, nauseated. In fact, there'd be something wrong with you if you didn't, but whatever we feel, we still have our responsibilities, and I think if you focus on your responsibilities... On getting the job done, you'll find it helps. That's another thing I found out the hard way. Yes, ma'am, he repeated. Good. She looked up into her personal armsman's eyes again for a moment, gave him a tiny nod of acknowledgement, then patted Corbett lightly on the shoulder and, as she'd just advised the midshipman to do, turned her thoughts to her own duties. Rear Admiral Michael Overstegen watched his plot aboard HMS Rigel. Despite his relaxed, comfortable, loose-limbed sprawl in his command chair, his eyes were alert, sharply focused on the display's icons. Anything from Major Markowitz or Sebastian, Irina? he asked. No, sir. Lieutenant Irina Thomas's tone could not have been more respectful, but Overstegen's lips twitched in a slight smile. Respectful or not, it was the tone a subordinate used to inform a superior officer that he should tend to his own knitting, secure in the knowledge she would somehow remember to inform him if anyone asked to speak to him. Showing more worry than you want to, aren't you, Michael? He asked himself sardonically. 
Still, I suppose you're not the only one that's true of just now. His smile faded, and he glanced at the tactical board at Commander Steren Retallic Station. His ops officer sat tipped back, arms folded, but Overstegen knew Retallic was watching the surrendered Solarian SDs like the proverbial hawk. And, well, he should be. Like everyone else in Tenth Fleet, Overstegen devoutly hoped Michelle Henke's elaborate precautions would prove unnecessary, but he fervently agreed with his CO's disinclination to be proven wrong about that sort of assumption. At the moment, none of the Solarian SDs had more than 1,500 personnel still aboard, which, given their old-fashioned manpower-intensive design philosophy, was too few people for them to effectively move or fight. That, unfortunately, wasn't quite the same thing as saying they didn't have enough people to fire their weapons. To be sure, their active targeting systems were down, as were their wedges and defensive sidewalls, but the hugely redundant passive sensors any ship of the wall mounted would be more than capable of providing accurate target data on anything inside energy range. The Deneb Accords and Interstellar Law were very clear on the mutual responsibilities of victor and vanquished. When O'Cleary dropped her impeller wedges in the universal FTL signal that she surrendered, Tenth Fleet had been legally obligated to grant quarter rather than continuing the attack, while it waited for her formal light-speed surrender offer to arrive. Assuming, of course, that Michelle Hankey had chosen to regard them as anything besides pirates. By the same token, O'Cleary's ships were legally required to stay surrendered, with their crews obedient to the lawful orders of any boarding party, if they didn't want the other side to renew the action. There was, however, a bit of a gray area in that the crew of any captured ship had a legal right to attempt to retake their vessel, and one could argue that ambushing a boarding party when it first came on board constituted a sort of preemptive retaking. Whether or not the argument held up in court would depend upon whose court it was, but that would be cold comfort to anyone on either side who got killed in the course of the attempt. And although, at the moment, Michael Overstegen admitted with a cold lack of apology, he didn't really much care what might happen to any Sollies who tried something like that. He did care very much what happened to any Mantikran personnel who might be involved. So just remember, we're watching you, Admiral O'Clary. And it's perfectly all right with me for you to go right on sweating all those missile pods. Because the first time one of those super dreadnoughts even twitches... We are going to blow the son of a bitch straight to hell. This, Major Evgeny Markovich reflected sourly, is the kind of story you really like to kick back over a good beer and bullshit about later. Preferably much later. It's not the kind of story you enjoy while the damned thing is happening. He'd collected quite a few stories like that over the 18 T years since he'd enlisted in Her Mantikoran Majesty's Marine Corps, and he'd just as soon have avoided adding this one to his collection. Well, if I can't take a joke, I shouldn't have joined, he told himself, and turned his attention to the task at hand. The good news was that a Nike-class battlecruiser carried a 300-man Marine detachment, twice the size of a Saganami Seas. The bad news was that that still gave HMS Rigel only two companies. And the even worse news, as far as he was concerned, was that he'd been tasked to provide marine support for two separate naval boarding parties. Which wouldn't be all that bad, I suppose, if we weren't going to be outnumbered ten to one by the Sollies still aboard the dimmed ships. He glanced at Lieutenant Sebastian Varinius, Admiral Overstegen's San Martin-born flag lieutenant, standing at his shoulder, then across the pinnace's troop compartment at Captain Luciana Ingebrigtsen, the commander of his Alpha Company. He'd more or less flipped a coin to decide whether he should accompany her or Motoyuki McDermott, Bravo Company's CO. Since he was going with Ingebrigtsen, he'd sent Gunny Danko, otherwise known as Sergeant Major Evelyn Danko, along with McDermott to keep an eye on him. Both Ingebrigtsen and McDermott were good, solid officers, but they were undeniably still a bit young for their rank. There was a lot of that going around, and while he was confident in their competence, there was no harm providing a little adult supervision. 
By the same token, he was equally confident that whichever one of them he chose to accompany, it was the other one Murphy would choose to drop straight into the crapper. Both of those beliefs, he supposed, might owe a little something to his 11 years enlisted experience before the Corps sent him off to OTC. Of course, the fact that he'd assigned himself to Alpha Company also meant that Alpha Company had been assigned to board SLNS Anton von Leeuwenhoek, which happened to be the flagship of one Admiral Keeley O'Cleary, which also explained Ferenius's presence. At the moment, Ingebrigtsen was involved in a quiet conversation with Master Sergeant Clifton Palmaraki, Alpha Company's senior noncom. Palmaraki had been around the block and back again, and the chunky, muscular Master Sergeant, with his thinning fair hair and pronounced Griffin accent, would have made an admirable illustration for the term grizzled veteran. That was just fine with Markovich, especially when he contemplated the absurd youthfulness of the junior officer standing at Ingebrigtsen's elbow and nodding sagely at whatever she was saying. The captain might be young, but Lieutenant Hector Lindsay looked like he ought to be playing mumbledy peg in a schoolyard somewhere. Well, maybe it wasn't quite that bad, but it was bad enough. In fact, Lindsay was still a few months shy of his 20th birthday, standard, fresh out of OCS, which made him even younger than Lieutenant Farinius, no ancient graybeard himself, and he'd had his platoon for just under two months, having come aboard literally as Rigel was pulling out for Talbot. There was a reason, the Major suspected, Ingebrigtsen and Palmaraki had both ended up accompanying 1st Platoon instead of either of her other platoons. And he admitted to himself, if he'd thought about it, he would have picked this pinnace to help keep an eye on Lindsay. The boy was smart enough and motivated as hell, but he was so shiny and new that it hurt. Well, Markovich decided, glancing at his armor's HUD, where the pinnace's flight engineer was feeding him a duplicate of the pilot's HUD, we'll be finding out shortly how well this is all going to work. Good seal, ma'am, Petty Officer Second Class John Pettigrew announced, as a green light indicated a solid mating with Charles Babbage's emergency airlock number 117. According to the diagnostic ping, the lock's operable, but it looks like it's running on emergency local power. Thank you, Pio, Abigail acknowledged, then glanced at Gutierrez. Let's get them moving, Lieutenant, she said far more formally than she normally spoke to him. Yes, ma'am. Gutierrez took time to salute before sealing his helmet, which Abigail knew was his equivalent, under the circumstances, of pitching a tantrum. He hadn't liked the decision to place him in tactical command of the boarding party instead of staying where he was supposed to be, watching her back, one little bit. Unfortunately, the fact that Tristam carried no Marine detachment made ex-Sergeant Gutierrez the closest thing to a Marine CO Naomi Kaplan had available. That, coupled with the fact that Abigail was the only one of her Navy officers with any experience in ground combat, was what had determined who would command Tristam's boarding party. Everyone, including, perhaps even especially, Lieutenant Abigail Hearns, hoped combat experience would be completely irrelevant to her present mission. The entire reason Tristam had been assigned responsibility for Charles Babbage was the sheer extent of the Super Dreadnought's devastating damage. Although Abigail's little command was technically a boarding party, their real function was to search and rescue, and any Solly with a functional brain was going to be simply delighted to see them. Unfortunately, as she'd pointed out to Corbett, they couldn't rely on the functionality of any survivor's brains. In fact, it was entirely possible that what they'd been through could have thoroughly unhinged some of them, in which case all bets were off and all of Matteo Gutierrez's experience might be required after all. He understood that as well as she did, but he also understood that it meant he was going to be concentrating on running the boarding party's entire security element instead of solely watching over one Abigail Hearns. And while he was far too professional to object, it was obvious he didn't see any reason to pretend, with Abigail at least, that he was at all amused. Well, you're just going to have to deal with it, Matteo, she thought, smiling affectionately at his broad back. Chapter 24 
Evgeny Markovich had never thought much of officers who fretted over details which should have been left in the hands of their noncoms. He'd seen entirely too many examples of that from the noncoms' perspective, which meant he knew exactly how much it pissed off the noncoms in question. What was worse, it represented a misuse of the officer's time and attention. He was supposed to be in charge of managing his command, however big or small it might be, not allowing himself to become absorbed in the sorts of details which could all too easily distract him from that management function. At the moment, he found that somewhat more difficult than usual to remember. The boat bay aboard SLNS Anton von Leeuwenhoek, Admiral Keely O'Cleary's flagship, was larger than it would have been aboard a Manticoran super dreadnought. Partly that was because Solarian ships carried greater numbers of small craft. That had been true even before Manticoran crews had been downsized, although the difference was even more marked these days. For another thing, Solarian small craft tended to be larger than their Manticoran counterparts. According to his briefing, they didn't carry any more personnel or cargo, in fact they carried slightly less, but they had a longer designed operating radius, and their basic designs were much older and hadn't profited from the RMN's wartime emphasis on greater operational efficiency and component reduction. At the moment, all those small craft, aside from two purely reaction-drive cutters, were absent, however. By this time, they were sitting obediently in orbit around Flax, under the watchful eyes and weapons of Commodore Terikov's cruisers, and the boat bay was a huge gaping cavern in their absence. A cavern which looked even larger, with only a trio of Manticoran pinnaces docked in it like lonely interlopers. Captain Ingebrigtsen had Lieutenant Lindsay and Platoon Sergeant Francis Harper handle first platoon's debarkation, and Markovich had been pleased by the way Ingebrigtsen managed not to hover. For that matter, he'd been pleased by the way Lindsay had let Harper get on with it. But now, as the platoon's 44 men and women formed up in Leeuwenhoek's boat bay gallery, he recognized Ingebrigtsen's itchy expression. He ought to, given that he shared the same ignoble temptation to start fooling around with those details he was supposed to stay clear of. Fortunately, young Lindsay seemed unaware of the pair of incipient backseat drivers somehow managing to restrain themselves. The lieutenant glanced around, and then looked at Sergeant Harper. Let's get a squad on each of the lift banks, Frankie, he said. Aye, sir, Harper replied and barked a few crisp commands. The platoon quickly and smoothly unraveled into its constituent squads, and Markovich gave a mental nod of approval. It was a simple evolution, but the confidence in Lindsay's voice and the briskness with which he'd acted were both good signs. And unlike one Major Markovich, Lindsay appeared completely immune to the temptation to micromanage his platoon sergeant. Be secure, ma'am, Lindsay reported a moment later to Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Hector the captain replied gravely, and keyed her battle armor's calm. Bay secure, she announced. Second platoon, come ahead. Aye, aye, ma'am, Lieutenant Sylvester Jackson responded almost instantly. On our way. The second pinnace's hatch cycled open, and Jackson's platoon swam briskly down the personnel tube. They fell in just inside the gallery, and Jackson, four years older than Lindsay, with sandy hair and a pronounced Sphinxian accent, reported to Ingebrigtsen. You know what to do, Sly, Ingebrigtsen told him. Aye, aye, ma'am. Jackson saluted her and Markovich, then turned to his own platoon sergeant and passed through Lindsay's people into the central shaft of each bank of lifts. They did not enter the lift cars, however. Instead, they sent the cars upward, overriding the automatic command to close the shaft doors behind them, and, as per their pre-mission orders, followed the cars up the shaft in their armor. Markovich didn't really expect anyone aboard Leeuwenhoek to be stupid enough to try anything, but if anyone was so suicidally inclined, he had no intention of offering his people up in neatly packaged, easily bushwhacked lots. All right, Aldonza, Ingebrigtsen said over her calm. Your turn. Understood, ma'am. Lieutenant Aldonza Navarro, 3rd Platoon CO, had a more pronounced San Martin accent than Farinas's. At 172 centimeters, 
She was on the short side for most of the San Martinos Markovich had met, but there was nothing wrong with her efficiency, and third platoon quickly assembled in the boat bay. Markovich, meanwhile, was monitoring his HUD, watching the icons of Jackson's Marines as they ascended the lift shafts. Jackson's second squad left its shaft at the 03 deck lift doors. The lieutenant himself stayed with his first squad, leaving the shaft at the 02 deck level. His second squad continued to the 01 deck, and Markovich gave another mental nod as all three squads settled into position. Take the banks, Aldonza, Ingebrigtsen instructed, and 3rd Platoon relieved Lindsay's people as the anchoring security element on the lift banks here in the boat bay. At the same time, 1st Platoon fell back in, and Ingebrigtsen nodded, in her case physically, in approval. Ready to proceed, sir, she said formally, turning to Markovich. Very good, Captain, Markovich smiled. Let's get this show on the road, then. Aye, aye, sir. Head them up shaft, Hector. Aye, aye, ma'am, Lindsay acknowledged, and 1st Platoon started climbing into the shaft Jackson had used, with Ingebrigtsen, Farinius, and Markovich trailing along behind. This time, Markovich noted, Lieutenant Lindsay hadn't quite managed to keep his excitement out of his voice, but the Major was inclined to cut the youngster a little slack. After all, his platoon had been chosen to accompany Markovich to Levenhook's flag bridge to formally accept Admiral O'Cleary's personal surrender before the rest of his Marines began moving through the rest of the Corps hull to secure it which meant young Hector Lindsay was about to go into the Corps history books as the first junior officer, very junior officer in his case, of any star nation to command the squad which took a Solarian League Navy's flag officer surrender on the flag deck of an SLN super dreadnought. Markovich wasn't exactly immune to the same awareness, which was one reason he couldn't justify taking Lindsay to task for it. At the same time, though, he wondered if Lindsay had figured out he'd drawn this particular assignment because he was the least experienced of Ingebrigtsen's platoon commanders. Navarro, with the most combat experience of all, had taken over the boat bay detachment because it constituted Markovich's reserve. If something went wrong and dropped them all into the crapper after all, he wanted somebody who'd been there and done that in charge of the force assigned to pull them all back out again. I wonder if Luciana had the heart to explain that to Lindsay, he wondered. I know I didn't. Abigail Hearns took one more look around. The passageway immediately inboard from the emergency airlock was longer and a bit wider than it would have been in a Manticoran or a Grayson-designed warship, but it looked rather cramped at the moment, with her entire boarding party and six countergraph sleds of salvage and rescue gear packed into it. Other than that, about the best she could say was that it was still atmosphere tight. Only the emergency lights were up, and close to a third of the lighting elements were dead. One of her engineering ratings had already determined that the backup hardwired emergency comm system was down, but from the look of things, that could just as easily have been due to lack of maintenance as to the damage Charles Babbage had suffered at Manticoran hands. The ship, or rather the battered hulk which had once been a ship, was under an apparent gravity of about 1.2 g. The wreckage had been rotated perpendicular to its line of flight, putting the decks and deckhands back where they ought to be, and Tristan was playing tugboat to slow what was left of the Babbage down, in many ways, Abigail would have preferred to remain in microgravity. It would have made getting about faster and simpler, not to mention avoiding the stress the deceleration was putting on damaged structural members. And she was well aware that the deceleration might actually be life-threatening for survivors under some circumstances. Unfortunately, the wreck's velocity of almost 18,000 kilometers per second had already carried it past Flax. It was now hurtling across the inner system at roughly 6% of light speed, bound for a fatal encounter with the gas giant Everest in just under 20 hours. It was extraordinarily unlikely, given Tenth Fleet's limited manpower, that the SAR parties would be able to completely search ships as mangled and torn as Babbage and her consorts in that time, which meant they had to be slowed down somehow. Tristam looked like a guppy tethered to a whale as she worked to decelerate Babbage's wreckage, 
but there wouldn't have been any point using a larger, more powerful vessel. Tristam could break them at the current rate indefinitely, and they dared not apply any greater deceleration for a lot of reasons. At this rate, it would take over 15 T days, and the next best thing to 12 light hours, to actually stop them relative to the system primary, but it would also divert them well clear of any collisions with odds and ends of system real estate, which would be a very good thing from the SAR perspective. Assuming anyone who maintained their internal systems as poorly as these people appeared to have had managed to survive to be rescued in the first place, of course. Don't rush to conclusions, Abby, she reminded herself. This is strictly an emergency access way, and the lock's the only thing it leads to. Let's not decide all of their maintenance is as half-assed as it looks right here until we've actually seen it. She told herself that rather firmly, and she knew she had a point. But she couldn't help reflecting on how any Manticoran or Grayson executive officer would react to something like this, even if it was only an emergency access way. In fact, especially if it was only an emergency access way. There was a reason things like that were provided when a ship was designed, after all, and when an emergency finally came along and bit your posterior, it was a little late to think about catching up on that overdue maintenance you'd really been meaning to get to sometime real soon now. At least we're in, we're in one piece, and we're in solid calm contact with the pinnace, which means... All right, Mateo, let's go, she said. Yes, ma'am, Lieutenant Gutierrez replied, then nodded to P.O. First Class William McFarlane, one of the non-coms to whom he'd issued another flechette gun. Lead him out, Bill. Yes, sir, McFarlane acknowledged in turn and started cautiously down the poorly lit passage. Three more ratings with flechette guns followed him, with Gutierrez behind them. The lieutenant and Bosun Musgrave had spent the better part of half an hour deciding which naval personnel should be trusted with things that went bang. McFarlane and the other flechette armed ratings, there were three more bringing up the rear, were the ones with actual combat experience or who had most recently qualified with the weapons. Everyone else carried at least a sidearm as regulations required, but Gutierrez had been bloodthirstily explicit when he explained what would happen to anyone other than his designated flechette gunners who dared to switch any weapon from safe to fire without his specific instructions to do so. Given the profoundly stupid things Abigail had seen people do with firearms, she heartily approved of her armsman's attitude. Now the rest of the party followed McFarlane to the airtight door at the end of the airlock access way, and Selma Wilkie, one of Lieutenant Fonzarelli's engineering techs, examined the controls. Power's down, ma'am, she reported to Abigail over the general net, then continued in a carefully expressionless voice. According to the telltales, they are standard pressure on the other side, though. Abigail heard someone snort contemptuously and shook her own head. They were well inside the Super Dreadnought's outer armor, but still well outside the big ship's core hull. Passages like this one were specifically designed and intended to be depressurized when the ship went to action stations as a means of limiting blast damage when the armor was breached. The fact that Charles Babbage hadn't bothered to do that said an enormous amount about the Solarian League Navy's readiness states, or about Task Force 496's pre-battle appreciation of the threat levels it faced, at least. Well, it's nice we'll have air, Selma, Abigail responded mildly. On the other hand, who knows? They may actually have depressurized the next lateral. Besides, I understand Solis don't like to take showers or wash their socks— so, if it's all the same to you, I think we'll just keep our helmets sealed anyway. Suits me just fine, ma'am, Wilkie replied with a chuckle, and someone else laughed out loud. That laugh sounded just a bit nervous, perhaps, but Abigail wasn't going to fault anyone for that. Open it up, she said. Aye, aye, ma'am. Wilkie engaged the manual unlocking system and gripped the old-fashioned wheel. It took her a second longer, and a lot more effort, than it ought to have to get it moving, and the squealing sound it made set Abigail's teeth on edge. Not just because of the fingernails on a blackboard effect, either. 
there was no excuse at all for not properly maintaining the manual override mechanism on an emergency escape hatch. Once Wilkie managed to undog the pressure door, it swung smoothly open. McFarlane stepped quickly through it, turning to his left, up ship, and one of the other flechette gunners stepped through it to the right. Clear port, McFarlane reported. Clear starboard, the other man said. Go, Gutierrez responded, and the rest of the boarding party flowed quickly through the opening under his critical eye. Fortunately, everyone remembered how he'd briefed them, and no one fell over his or her feet in the process. In fact, although Abigail knew he'd never admit it, his vacuum sucker spacers moved with commendable caution and speed. She herself paused and bent to examine the emergency hatch more closely. The passageway to which it had granted access was also illuminated only by emergency lighting, but at least all of the lighting units seemed to be up this time. And as she examined the hatch, she found that the normal power-assisted unlocking system appeared to have been far better maintained than the manual system had. Of course, there was the minor problem that at the moment it didn't have power, wasn't there? A shadow fell over her, and when she looked up, she found that Musgrave had been looking over her shoulder. Ain't that a kicker, ma'am, the bosun muttered in tones of profound disgust. Over, she noticed, his dedicated link, not the general net. It does seem just a bit slipshod, bosun, she acknowledged over the same link. But not a lot more than leaving pressure in here. Someone needs his butt kicked up between his ears, begging your pardon, ma'am, Musgrave concurred. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. On the other hand, the SLN's a peacetime navy, or it was anyway. I imagine they put up with quite a bit of sloppiness. Peacetime or not, they should have had the brains to at least pump the air. And even allowing for that, this is an example of piss-poor maintenance discipline, Musgrave growled, glowering at the neglected manual unlocking system. Less I'm mistaken, accidents have been known to happen in peacetime too, ma'am. That they have, Abigail agreed more grimly. Even aboard Solarian ships of the wall, I suppose. She straightened and consulted the schematic which had been loaded into her electronic memo board. Theoretically, at least, she had the deck plans for the entire ship, or for the scientist class as originally designed at least, supplied specifically for SAR by Admiral O'Cleary. She hoped the schematics really were complete, without any surprises, intentional or unintentional, but she wasn't prepared to trust them fully. Still, they offered at least general guidance, and she'd marked them with the damage Tristam sensors had been able to map before she downloaded them to the board. All right, Walt, she said to Midshipman Corbett, who carried an identical memo board. This is where we split up. According to our damage map, this passage should extend another hundred meters forward before you hit a breach. It's got to be good for at least fifty meters, since that's the closest set of blast doors in that direction. You take your people and head forward. She tapped her own memo board with a stylus, and a lift bank flashed amber on both boards simultaneously. Make sure your comm link doesn't get compromised and stop at this lift bank, she continued, indicating the flashing section of the schematic. Meantime, I'll head aft to lift 19. Whether there's power to the lifts or not, we can use the shafts to move inboard. I am, ma'am. Corbett acknowledged. Bosun? I'm on it, sir, Musgrave said with just a hint of reassuring gruffness, nodded to Abigail, and started down the passage in the indicated direction with his extraordinarily youthful superior officer in tow. Abigail watched half of the boarding party moving off with them, then turned to grin at Gutierrez. Let's go, Mateo. Major Markovich followed Captain Ingebrigtsen and Master Sergeant Pomeraki out of the lift doors at the zero-zero deck level. According to the schematic in his battle armor's memory, he was approximately 60 meters aft of Leeuwenhoek's command deck and 100 meters forward of her flag bridge. The zero-zero deck corresponded to the Royal Manticoran Navy's Axial One, the central and best protected deck of a warship's core hull, and Leeuwenhoek's was both broader and higher than the other decks stacked above and below it. The passage before Markovich was well lit. 
yet he felt uneasily aware of its vastness, as if he couldn't quite make out details. Don't be stupid, Evgeny. You can see just fine. It's just that you shouldn't be seeing this much empty space aboard any warship. He snorted mentally, then turned to the dark-haired SLN lieutenant who'd been waiting at the lift doors. Allowing for prolong, she was probably somewhere in her thirties, he estimated, old for her rank in the RMN. Then again, the Sollies hadn't had as many vacancies created for promotion over the last couple of decades as Manticore had. The name Pabst V was stenciled on the breast of her skin suit, and she wore no helmet. She was of slightly above average height, although she looked like a stripling standing in front of his looming battle armor. Major Markovich, Royal Mantikoran Marines, he said crisply over his armor's external speakers. Lieutenant Pabst, Valencia Pabst, she responded. I'm Admiral O'Cleary's flag lieutenant. Excuse me, lieutenant, Ingebrigtsen put in a bit sharply. But don't Solarian officers salute superior officers? Pabst looked at her for a moment, as if Ingebrigtsen had spoken in some foreign tongue. Then she shook herself visibly, flushed, came to a reasonably correct position of attention, and saluted Markovich. I beg your pardon, Major. There was more than a little anger in her voice, but Markovich figured she was entitled to that. I realize this has all come as something of a shock, Lieutenant Pepst, he replied, charitably ascribing her lapse in military courtesy to the aforesaid shock as he returned her belated salute. Yes, sir, it has, she agreed, still with that core of cold anger and resentment. If you'll follow me, please. Lead on, Lieutenant, Markovich replied. Top, Ingebrigtsen said quietly to Palmaraki. On it, ma'am, the master sergeant replied and dropped back beside Lieutenant Lindsay. He spoke very quietly to the young man for a moment, and then Lindsay and his platoon's first squad arranged themselves unobtrusively at Ingebrigtsen and Markovich's heels. The second and third squad stayed put, keeping an eye on the lift banks, while Master Sergeant Palmaraki and Platoon Sergeant Wilkie kept an eye on them. Markovich really wished Palmaraki was along to watch his back, but he supposed that between them a grass-green lieutenant, an experienced captain, and a weary old major who'd once upon a time been a battalion sergeant major ought to be able to manage a single squad of marines. The hike from the lift to Leeuwenhoek's flag bridge seemed to take far longer than it ought to, and Markovich suspected he wasn't the only person who found the silent emptiness of the deck eerie. Pabst obviously didn't feel much like making small talk, for which he scarcely blamed her, but no one had much to say over the Marines' comnet either. Good communications discipline, the Major thought wryly. Maybe we should try boarding surrendered solely super dreadnoughts more often as a training technique. Lengthy as the walk seemed while they were making it, it ended abruptly at an open pressure door. Pabst glanced at Markovich, then stepped through the door. He followed her and found himself on the SD's flag deck. Like the passageway outside it, Leeuwenhoek's flag deck was considerably more spacious than a Mantikran flag deck would have been. That was interesting, Markovich thought, given the far larger number of people crammed aboard the Solarian ship. A Mantikran designer with considerably more volume to play with would have fitted the command stations into no more than two-thirds of the volume Leeuwenhoek's architect had assigned to them. The various displays and consoles had a sleek, aesthetically pleasant grace to them. Their shapes and spacing seemed to flow into one another, almost as if they'd been designed to do just that, Although, he thought as he glanced over them, they didn't seem to be arranged quite as well from the viewpoint of information flow. The ops officer on a Mantikoran admiral staff, for example, was placed so that he could see the astrogator's display by looking in one direction and the master tactical plot by looking in the other, all without moving out of his bridge chair. The way Leeuwenhoek's command stations were arranged, however, the ops officer would have to stand up, take at least two steps, and crane his neck awkwardly to see the astro display. 
and one of the reasons he'd have to was that he had at least twice as many assistants as a Mantikranops officer would have required, and he would have had to walk around one of them to see it. Obviously, they figured the guy who does the shooting doesn't have to see where the guy who's steering is headed, he thought dryly. Not to mention the minor fact that they're way over manned. He noted those details out of the corner of one eye. Most of his attention was focused on identifying Admiral Keely O'Cleary. In one way, it wasn't very difficult, since his armor's memory had been loaded with her picture. But what he hadn't counted on was the sheer number of stars stenciled on various people's skin suits. He was still registering the fact that the compartment seemed to be filled with an extraordinary number of flag officers when O'Cleary stepped forward. She looked at him, dark eyes stony, and he saluted. Major Evgeny Murkovich, Royal Mantikaran Marines, ma'am, he said. Admiral O'Cleary, she replied, acknowledging his salute with frigid correctness. I trust you'll forgive me if I don't add, welcome aboard, Major. Silence, Markovich decided, was golden, and he contented himself with a courteous little half-nod from behind his armor's visor. Vice Admiral Hanson Chamberlain, my chief of staff, O'Cleary continued, indicating a short, squared-off officer to her right. My operations officer, Rear Admiral Tang Tsung Ming. My staff intelligence officer, Rear Admiral Lavinia Fairfax. And my staff communications officer, Captain Kalidasa Omprakash. At last, someone who isn't an admiral, Markovich thought as he acknowledged each introduction in turn. Then he indicated his own officers. Captain Ingebrigtsen, he said. Lieutenant Ferenius, Rear Admiral Overstegen's flag lieutenant, and Lieutenant Lindsay. All three of them saluted, and O'Cleary returned the courtesy. Then she looked back at Markovich. I suppose I should be handing you a sword or something, Major, she said tartly. Unfortunately, I'm afraid the Solarian League Navy isn't very practiced at this sort of thing. It could have come out with an edge of humor, but it didn't. Nor was there any humor in the cold smile which accompanied it. If I've discovered one thing over the last twenty years or so, Admiral, Markovich replied, meeting her eyes steadily, it's that we don't get much of a chance to practice a lot of the more important things until it's too late. O'Cleary's lips tightened, but then, visibly, she made herself stop and draw a deep breath. I imagine that's something we should all bear in mind, she said then. In the meantime, however, how does your Admiral Goldpeak wish to handle this, Major? Mim, as soon as I have formally received your surrender, and that of Captain Lister, I will so notify Admiral Goldpeak's staff. At that time, I will place one of my squads on the command deck, one in central engineering, and another in each of your boat bays to provide traffic control and security. As soon as that's been accomplished, a naval boarding party will come aboard Levenhook and complete the task of securing the vessel. I am to extend Admiral Goldpeak's compliments to you and invite you to return aboard Rigel. Admiral Overstegen's flagship with Lieutenant Farinius. My understanding is that Admiral Goldpeak will be arriving aboard Rigel shortly herself. I see. O'Cleary gazed at him for several moments, her face expressionless, then nodded. Very well, Major. It would seem that I, like the rest of this task force, find myself in Admiral Goldpeak's hands at the moment. I will, of course, comply with her wishes. Thank you, Admiral. Would you prefer to receive Captain Lister's surrender here or on his command deck? Since my orders are to secure the bridge as well, ma'am, I think it would probably be more convenient for the captain if he simply waited there for me. Markovich kept his voice as politely, militarily impersonal as he could, and O'Cleary nodded again. There might actually have been a trace of awareness of his efforts not to step any more heavily on her toes or Lister's than he had to. Of course, there might not have to. 
Kalidasa, please be good enough to inform the captain that Major Markovich will meet him on his bridge, she said without looking over her shoulder at Captain Omprakash. Yes, ma'am. Well, I suppose that concludes the formalities. Here, at least, she said, and gave Sebastian Varinas a thin smile. Should the other members of my staff accompany us, Lieutenant? If you so desire, ma'am, Farina said. I feel certain Rear Admiral Overstegen would be pleased to offer them the hospitality of his ship. The decision, however, is yours. In that case, I'd like Vice Admiral Chamberlain to accompany us. Of course, ma'am. Iwaski, Lindsay said over the platoon net, and Corporal Dunstan Iwaski and his section of three stepped forward, arranging themselves as an honor guard around O'Cleary, Chamberlain, and Farinas. Well, the kid got that right, Markovich decided after glancing at Ingebrigtsen. From the captain's expression, it was obvious she hadn't set that up ahead of time, and that she was as pleased to see it as Markovich was. O'Cleary cocked her head, smiling slightly, as if she were trying to decide whether it was an honor guard or a security detail to keep her from making some kind of break for it. Then she snorted quietly, a bit less bitterly somehow, and nodded to Markovich. If I don't see you again, Major, she said, allow me to thank you for your courtesy in a difficult situation. Thank you, ma'am, he acknowledged, and he and his officers saluted her again. She and Chamberlain returned the salute, then followed Farinius out of the compartment. We've got a pair of survivors, ma'am. Abigail stopped in mid-stride, raising one hand to stop the rest of her party, as Midshipman Corbett's voice came over the comm. There was something about his tone. Are you all right, Walt? She asked quietly over her private link. Yes, ma'am, he replied over the same link. It's just... He paused, and she heard a distinct swallowing sound. It's just kind of bad in here. Abigail looked down at her memo board and checked the icons representing Corbett and his party. Her own party had already encountered over 70 dead and only six survivors, all of whom had been in skin suits and trapped in compartments they could not escape. They'd also counted 23 life pod hatches which showed vacuum on the other side, which presumably meant whoever had been close enough to them had already escaped the ship. Her six survivors had been sent back to the pinnace, escorted by a single one of her spacers, and all of them had seemed too dazed by the scope of the disaster and too grateful to be alive to offer anything resembling resistance. Yet so far, Corbett hadn't located a single survivor and only a scattering of bodies. But that, she realized as she punched up the scale on the board, had obviously just changed. He and his party were one passageway farther in than her own, and he'd just entered the core hall. In fact, if the schematic was accurate, he was in one of the nodal damage control compartments. Which, she thought coldly, is supposed to have upwards of 40 people in it when the ship's at action stations, so if he's only got two survivors... Do you need any more hands? She kept her voice impersonal. No, ma'am, not yet anyway. Corbett might have swallowed again, but his voice was a little stronger when he resumed speaking. The bosun and my sick birth attendant have them stabilized in life support stretchers. I'm detaching two of my people to take them back to the pinnace, then return here. Uh, if that's all right with you, I mean, ma'am. Walt, it's your call, she told him. And of course you've got the bosun there to make sure you don't step on your sword, she added silently. Thank you, ma'am. His voice was definitely stronger this time, and she smiled crookedly. You're welcome, she said. Now, let's be about it. Chapter 25 Afraid it's not quite so simple as all that, Admiral. The consensus of my House Committee is quite firm on this point. Before the administration could possibly get Congress to sign off on any formal treaty especially one in which the Republic accepts some sort of war guilt clause, the futures of these star systems have to be settled. 
That, after all, was the reason we voted to support the resumption of hostilities in the first place. Honor Alexander Harrington bit her tongue rather firmly. It was an exercise with which she'd had an unfortunate amount of experience over the last five or six weeks. In fact, she'd gotten to practice at it almost every time Gerald Younger opened his mouth. She drew a deep, unobtrusive breath and thought longingly of public dueling grounds and ten-millimeter pistols as the representative sat back in his chair, jaw-clenched with manly fortitude and brown eyes hard with steely determination. It wasn't so much that she was unwilling to believe his committee members felt or could be brought to feel exactly as he'd just said they did, although she doubted they were nearly so adamant or united as he was suggesting. No, the problem was that she could taste the real emotions behind his argument, which meant she knew he personally didn't give a single solitary damn about the future of the disputed star systems and never had. He'd been harping on this point for a full half day now, but what he really wanted was something else entirely. It was unfortunate that she couldn't pluck exactly what that something else was out of his mind, but she'd come to the conclusion that he was probably after one of two things— Either he intended to give in eventually on the unstated understanding that his concession on this point would earn a matching concession from her on another point, probably the amount of reparations the Republic was going to ante up eventually, given the way he kept harping on linking the issue to war guilt, or else he didn't want anything out of her at all. In fact, the way he kept referring to the reasons the Havenite Congress had voted to support the Pritchard administration's resumption of hostilities suggested to Honor that the latter possibility was more probably the correct one. He'd been just a little too careful, just a tad too obvious, about not saying explicitly that the real reason the Republic was in its current dire predicament was due to missteps by that same administration, which strongly suggested that the real target of his extortion was Eloise Pritchard. Honor had no idea what sort of domestic concession he might want to squeeze out of the Pritchard administration, but it was at least equally probable that there was one, and that he knew Pritchard would eventually promise it to him if he'd only shut up. The fact that he hadn't said one single word about the Green Pines allegations might be another indicator pointing in that direction. They would have made a much more suitable stick for beating the Star Empire directly at any rate, of course, from what Honor had come to know of Pritchard, it was entirely possible there were other reasons he'd chosen not to reach for that particular club. However that might be, though, he was clearly after something, and from the taste of Pritchard's mind glow, she was clearly of the same opinion, and probably thinking about the Havenite equivalent of dueling grounds, too. Mr. Younger, Honor said, once she was reasonably certain she had her temper under control, I don't really think it's very practical for us to sit here and dispose of the political futures of entire star systems without actually consulting the people who live in them. As I'm sure you're well aware, the majority of the star systems which were still in Manticoran possession at the time hostilities were resumed were militarily strategic ones, which had been retained only for their military value. Pending the conclusion of a formal peace treaty, those star systems would have been granted their independence or returned to Havenite control, depending on local conditions and desires. Certain other systems, admittedly, were still in our possession mainly because they were so far in our rear and had been occupied for so long. Those systems which had indicated their desire to remain independent of the Republic would have been permitted to do so by the Star Empire, pending the conclusion of that same treaty. Some of them, as you're well aware, had already expressed a desire to remain independent before the resumption of our current hostilities, and I strongly doubt that Her Majesty would be willing to force them back into the Republic's welcoming arms at Bayonet Point if that's not where they want to go. At the moment, however, if it's escaped your attention, none of those star systems are currently in Manticoran possession at all. Given that fact, and the past history I've just summarized, I fail to see precisely why you expect Her Majesty's government to countersign some sort of blank check for the Republic to determine their futures at this conference table, instead of consulting with them after the cessation of hostilities. I'm not asking you to countersign anything, Admiral, Younger replied. 
I'm asking you, as Queen Elizabeth's representative, to acknowledge the validity of the results of the plebiscites conducted in those strategic star systems following their liberation from Manticoran occupation by Republican armed forces, and to pledge to abide by plebiscites to be conducted on any other planet which was previously part of the People's Republic of Haven and which is currently occupied by Republican forces. And I'm telling you, sir, Anna replied in a tone whose patience would have made anyone who knew her well extremely nervous, that Her Majesty is not prepared to acknowledge anything anywhere in any star system without first having had the opportunity to examine the evidence and the results to be sure the processes were free, open, and legitimate. Are you suggesting the results of the plebiscites the Republic has already conducted might not represent the true desires of the system's inhabitants? Younger's eyes had narrowed, and there was an edge of ice in his voice. All in all, no one could possibly have misinterpreted the offense he'd taken at the mere suggestion of electoral chicanery. Honor, however, was fully aware of the actual emotions behind that bristling facade, and she felt Nimitz stir on the perch beside her chair as he tasted her almost overwhelming desire to punch Younger squarely in the nose— from the feel of the tree cat's emotions, he was entirely in favor of the notion. He knew as well as honor that the Havenite legislator understood perfectly well that she was suggesting nothing of the sort. In fact, what Younger felt at the moment was a powerful sense of satisfaction, undoubtedly at his ability to burn time on such a minor issue. And speaking of time, she decided, it was time for a certain amount of candor. Mr. Younger, she said calmly, you and I are both perfectly well aware I'm suggesting nothing of the sort. His eyes widened, and she tasted his surprise at her head-on approach. Well, that was too bad, wasn't it? After all, she was an admiral, not a diplomat, and he could either like that fact or lump it. At the moment, she didn't much care which, either. I haven't said Manticore won't acknowledge the validity of the plebiscite results— what I've said is that Manticore won't acknowledge their validity without the opportunity to evaluate their reliability, accuracy, openness, and honesty for ourselves. You're as aware as I am of the distinction between those two positions, and you're also as aware as I am that this is a point on which I, as the Star Empire's representative to these talks, am not going to make the concession you're demanding— I can only assume, therefore, that your purpose in demanding it is to use up time, which, I observe, you are doing despite the fact that I informed you perfectly straightforwardly at the beginning of these negotiations that there was a limit to how long I was authorized to continue talking before the Star Empire resumes active operations against the Republic. He started to open his mouth, his expression indignant, but she raised her right hand between them, index finger extended vertically, in an unspoken command to be silent, and continued in the same measured tone. There could be many reasons for your desire to run out the clock, including the belief, mistaken, I assure you, that Manticore is so desperate for a settlement with the Republic, in light of the potential for conflict with the Solarian League, that if these talks can simply be strung out long enough, we'll accept revisions to our more substantive demands, such as the clarification of our differences over our pre-war diplomatic correspondence. If that is what you're hoping for, I'm quite certain President Pritchard doesn't share your belief. She didn't so much as glance in Pritchard's direction, but she could feel the president stiffening ever so slightly in her chair. Not because Honor was wrong, but because Pritchard was surprised by just how correct she was. I suspect you're well aware that the president believes accurately, as it happens, that my instructions are to return to Manticore with no treaty rather than with a bad treaty, time limit or not, which suggests to me, sir, that you're bringing a domestic agenda to this table in the belief the President will give you whatever it is you want from her here in the Republic in order to convince you to stop wasting time. Whether or not that belief of yours is accurate is, of course, more than I could say, I would suggest, however, that signing up for fiddle lessons when the house is already on fire is scarcely the most profitable use of your time. Bearing that in mind, I think that rather than sitting here wasting valuable time, we should take a short recess, 
during which you may discuss with President Pritchard just what it is you want and stop trying to get it out of her by using my mission as your pry bar. Younger's face had darkened steadily, and the power of his anger pulsed in Honor's awareness like a blowtorch. He had himself sufficiently under control to glower at her in hot-eyed silence, rather than open his mouth and let his fury betray how accurately she'd read him, however. She met his glare steadily for a moment, then looked at Pritchard at last. The president's topaz eyes met hers with commendable steadiness, although the firm lips below them might have quivered ever so slightly. Honor wasn't prepared to swear to that either way, but she could taste the other woman's mingled irritation, frustration, and, overwhelming this last emotion, entertainment. I believe, under the circumstances, that a recess probably is in order, Pritchard said after taking a moment to be certain she had her own voice under control. I see it's very nearly lunchtime anyway. If I may, Admiral... I'd suggest we take a couple of hours for lunch, during which Representative Younger can contact the members of his committee and converse their response to your forthright statement of the Star Empire's position on this point. She smiled pleasantly at Honor, then turned to Younger. If you desire, Gerald, she continued pleasantly, I'm sure Leslie and Walter and I could also make the time available before our next session with Admiral Alexander Harrington and our delegation to discuss the administration's view on this point. I'm always happy to hear Congress's views and advice, as you're well aware, and if the members of your committee have pronounced reservations on this point, I'd like to be made aware of them. I would never seek to dictate to the consciences of the Republic's elected representatives, but I must confess that at this moment, I'm unaware of any general groundswell of opinion on this point. If it's going to present serious difficulties, I'd appreciate a briefing on it. The expression Younger turned on her was even closer to a glare than the one he'd bestowed on honor, but he kept a firm leash on his anger and nodded with at least a pretense of courtesy. Well then, Pritchard said just a tad brightly, smiling at honor. In that case, Admiral, we'll meet back here in two hours. Will that be convenient for your delegation? Well, that was certainly entertaining, wasn't it? Honor observed with an edge of whimsy as the members of her delegation herded along by the alert sheepdogs of her armsmen, filed through the door into their suite's dining room. Like the conference room Pritchard had provided for their negotiations, the dining room's windows looked out over the boiling foam of Frontenac Falls, and she crossed the floor to gaze out at the spectacular scenery. I'm not sure entertaining is exactly the word I'd choose, Your Grace, Twominen said dryly. Your approach to the rarefied and refined world of diplomacy seems just a trifle direct, shall we say? Oh, come now, Voido. Sir Barnabas Hugh shook his head, smiling broadly. You know you enjoyed seeing that insufferable young bugger taken down a notch just as much as I did. Talk about poisonous little vipers. The permanent undersecretary shook his head and glanced at Honor. I don't know what the specifics of his agenda may be, Your Grace, but I'm convinced you nailed what he's up to. Nimitz and I have been discussing him for a while, Honor said, which was true enough as far as it went, and Hugh Twomenen and Baroness Selleck all nodded. She'd shared her, and Nimitz's, of course, impressions of all of the Havenite negotiators, although she'd been a bit less explicit about Pritchard, Theismann, and Nesbitt for various reasons. Of their entire delegation, she continued, Younger and Tullingham are undoubtedly the most cynical and self-seeking. Maguire's no prize, you understand, but I think he's at least aware that in the Republic's current circumstances, a certain pragmatic resignation is in order. Tullingham could scarcely care less what happens to Pritchard's and Theismann's constitution, which personally I don't think is the most desirable possible trait in a Supreme Court justice, but my impression is that while he's the sort who thinks it's a perfectly wonderful idea to put legal opinions up for sale to the highest bidder, 
He's definitely not the sort who'd risk writing something like this down in flames just to satisfy his personal ambitions. His approach is more a case of business is business, you might say. Younger, on the other hand. She shook her head, not trying to hide her own disgust. What about him, Your Grace? Selleck asked, regarding her narrowly, and Honor tasted her speculation. Of course, the Baroness had been included among her advisors in no small part because of her familiarity with the various opposition groups which had emerged to resurrect the Republic after Saint-Just's death. I'm more than a little surprised he hasn't tried to use green pines, actually, Honor admitted. I know that was what we hoped for when I had my little chat with the President, but I honestly didn't expect him to keep his mouth completely shut about it. Nor, she thought, had she anticipated the shiver of fear which went through the representative's mind glow whenever it looked like someone else might be about to bring it up. But the more we see of him, the more convinced I am that he'd been fishing in some very murky waters long before we ever turned up in Nouveau Paris. You might be right, Selleck said. As you've just said, I still don't have a good feel for how the internal dynamics of his party fit together, but my sources are suggesting more and more strongly that he's a more prominent player than we thought before. Are you suggesting he's a more important player than we've realized even now? That's hard to say, Carissa, Anna replied thoughtfully, turning away from the windows and moving towards the table as James McGinnis appeared in the doorway on the other side of the room, keeping an eagle eye on the Navy stewards who'd been sent down from Eighth Fleet to provide him with a reliable security screen support group. I don't know how important a player he actually is, she continued, seating herself at the head of the table. For that matter, I don't know that he's really as important a player as he thinks he is. Obviously, he's got some stature, or he wouldn't have been included in Pritchard's delegation in the first place. The problem is that he's one of those people who just knows he's smarter, sneakier, and just generally all around better than anyone else. I have no idea what it is he wants out of Pritchard, but whatever it is, it never crossed his mind that he wasn't going to get it in the end. Or not until she asked him for that briefing, anyway. She chuckled, and most of the others joined her. Then she looked up at McGinnis. And just what are you planning on feeding us this afternoon, Mac? I trust you'll find it palatable, Your Grace, McGinnis said with a small bow and a lurking smile. But you're not going to tell me what it is until you put it on the table in front of me, are you? I do treasure my little surprises, he acknowledged with a broader smile, and she shook her head fondly. All right, bring it on, she challenged, and he chuckled as the stewards whipped away covers and set bowls of rich-smelling she-crab soup in front of the diners. Excuse me, Your Grace. Anna looked up from her second serving of cherry pie as Lieutenant Tummel appeared apparently by magic at her shoulder. It was obvious to her that he'd been taking teleportation lessons from McGinnis, and she'd come to realize she valued his gift for unobtrusiveness even more because Tim Mears hadn't had it. Mears had been just as efficient as Tummel, but he'd never had Tummel's ability to blend into the background and pop out of it again at exactly the right moment, which meant it was at least one way in which Tummel didn't constantly remind her of her last flag lieutenant and what had happened to him. Yes, Valdemar, she said, allowing no trace of the familiar pain the thought of Mears caused her to show in her eyes or voice. We've just received a dispatch from Manticore, relayed from Imperator. It's a personal to you from Her Majesty, and I'm afraid it's flagged as urgent. I see. Honor laid down her fork, wiped her lips on her napkin, and rose. Anxious, or at least intensely speculative eyes followed her, and she smiled slightly. Don't mind me, people, she said. Go ahead and enjoy your dessert. Twenty minutes later, Honor sat back from the display in her own sweet sitting room, and her expression was much less amused than it had been. She tipped back her chair and crossed her legs, and Nimitz flowed up into her lap and sat upright facing her. Not so good, is it, Stinker? she asked, reaching out to stroke his ears. 
Actually, she realized, not so good might be putting it entirely too optimistically. The news was over three weeks old, after all. By this time, it was only too probable that Michelle Hankey had already had the opportunity to prove or disprove the more optimistic estimates of the superiority of Manticoran military hardware. She felt Nimitz's concern mirroring her own, but then he twitched his upper pelvis in imitation of a human shrug. Mike is strong, his fingers flickered. She can deal with this. For just a moment, Honor was tempted to ask what made him an expert on the subject of battle fleets. Fortunately, the temptation disappeared as quickly as it had come. Treek had understanding of advanced technology and weaponry was still for all intents and purposes non-existent, but those who'd adopted humans had been sufficiently exposed to it to understand what it did, even if they didn't grasp how it did it. And Nimitz had seen more naval combat than the majority of professional naval personnel ever saw in an entire lifetime. Some of that combat had come uncomfortably close to killing both him and Honor. In fact, ever since Paul Tankersley had designed his first tree cat skin suit, he'd seen exactly the same combat she had from exactly the same command bridges. And he knows Mike better than almost anyone else does, too, she reflected. So yes, he definitely is entitled to an opinion. I hope you're right, Stinker, she said quietly, instead of what she'd started to say and he bleaked in amusement as he felt her shift gears. She shook her head at him with a smile and gave his left ear a gentle yank. He smacked her hand with carefully retracted claws, and she chuckled, but then her smile faded, and she folded her arms about him, hugging him while she thought. The question, she said aloud, using the cat as her sounding board once again, is whether or not we tell Pritchard about this. You want to tell her, Nimitz signed, and she snorted. <laughs> yes, actually, I do, she admitted. He flicked his ears in silent question, and she sighed. Beth hasn't made Mike's dispatches public yet, or she hadn't when she sent her message, at least. Sooner or later, though, that's going to change, which means Pritchard's going to find out eventually whatever happens. I don't want her deciding I was so nervous about her possible reaction to the news that I tried to keep it from her. I don't think she's likely to get infected with whatever Younger has and start playing stalling games, but I could be wrong about that. And I've been as candid with her as I could from the very beginning, including leveling with her about Green Pines. I don't want to jeopardize whatever balance of trust I've built up with her. Nimitz considered that for several moments, grass-green eyes thoughtful. Unlike any other member of Honor's delegation, he'd been able to sample Eloise Pritchard's mind glow even more thoroughly than Honor had, and it was obvious to her he was considering what she'd said in the light of that insight. She wasn't about to rush him either. Unlike the steadily decreasing number of Manticorans who continued to reject the evidence of Treecat intelligence, Honor Alexander Harrington had enormous respect both for the ability of cats in general to follow complex explanations and for Nimitz's judgment in particular, where human nature was concerned. Finally, his fingers began to move again, and her eyes widened. The real reason you want to tell her is you like her, he told her. I, she began, then stopped as she realized that, as usual, Nimitz had come unerringly to the point. You're right, she admitted out loud which may not be a good thing. She smiled ruefully. I don't think hard-nosed professional diplomats are supposed to like the people they're trying to beat a treaty out of. So, Nimitz signed, not what Soul of Steel sent you to be. She sent you to get agreement, not just talk and argue. Besides, I like Truth Seeker, too. Truth Seeker? Anna repeated, leaning back and looking deep into his eyes. Is that what you've decided her tree cat name should be? Nimitz nodded, and Honor's eyes narrowed. As a general rule, the names tree cats assigned to humans usually turned out to be extraordinarily accurate. 
Some of them were more evocative than truly descriptive. Her own, for example, Dances on Clouds. But even those were insightful encapsulations of the humans involved. And now that she thought about it, Truth Seeker summed up her own feel for Pritchard's personality. Slow down, Honor, she told herself firmly. That's certainly the personality you want her to have, and so does Nimitz. So maybe you're both reading more into what you're picking up from her than is really justified. And maybe you're not, too. And have you come up with a name for Thomas Theismann, too? She asked. His right true hand closed into the letter S and nodded up and down in the sign for yes, but it seemed to honor to be moving a little slower than usual. He looked at her for a second or two, and her eyebrows rose. She could literally feel him hesitating. It wasn't because he was concerned about how she might react to it, but more as if... as if he didn't quite expect her to believe it. Then he raised his right hand, palm in, touched his forehead with his index finger, then moved it up and to the right. As his hand rose, his forefinger alternated back and forth between the straight extended position, indicating the number one, and the crooked position, indicating the letter X, before the hand turned palm out and closed into the letter S once more. Then both hands came together in front of him, thumbs and index fingers linked, before they rose to his chin, left in front of right, thumb and first two fingers of each hand, signing the letter P. They paused for a moment, then separated downward, and Honor felt her eyebrows rising even higher. Dreams of peace? She said, speaking very carefully, as if she couldn't quite believe what she heard herself saying. That's his tree cat name? Nimitz nodded his head very firmly, and Honor tasted his confidence, his assurance about the name he'd assigned. No wonder he'd been hesitant to share it with her. If anyone in the galaxy had demonstrated his unflinching, tough-as-nails readiness to do whatever duty required of him, however grim that duty might be, it was Thomas Theismann. He was the one who'd rebuilt the Republican Navy into a war machine that could actually face the RMN in combat. The man who'd planned and executed Operation Thunderbolt. The man who'd planned Operation Beatrice. The man... Her thoughts paused, and Nimitz stared up into her eyes with an intensity which was rare, even for the two of them. They sat that way for several endless seconds, and then Honor inhaled deeply. Yes, Theismann had always done his duty, would always do his duty, without flinching or hesitating, whatever its demands. But she supposed the same thing could be said of her, and what was she doing here on this planet of all planets in the universe— if she didn't dream of peace. And the more she thought about it, about what it must have been like to spend all those years trying to defend his star nation against an external enemy, even while he saw state security making examples out of men and women he'd known for years, out of friends, the more clearly she realized just how longingly a man like Thomas Theismann might dream of peace. I wish Elizabeth were here, she thought. Maybe she can't taste Ariel's emotions the way I can taste Nimitz's, but she trusts Ariel. And if he told her he agreed with what Nimitz has named Pritchard and Theismann... You do realize that what you just told me doesn't make my decision any easier, don't you, Stinker? She asked him with a crooked smile. He blinked once, slowly, then bleaked in agreement, radiating his love for her and his simultaneous deep amusement. Nimitz understood perfectly well that they'd come to Haven on serious business. He even understood exactly what stakes they were playing for. Yet when it came down to it, this whole business of negotiating was a two-leg concept which had very little meaning for a race of telepaths who couldn't have engaged in diplomatic subterfuge even if they'd ever had any desire to do so in the first place. He knew Honor had to play by two-leg rules— but he found the entire process incredibly roundabout, cumbersome, and just plain silly. Yeah, sure, she said, hugging him once more. Easy for you, bub. Yes, Admiral? 
Eloise Pritchard's expression was politely curious as she gazed out of Honor's comm display. Even without the physical proximity, which would have permitted Honor to physically sample the president's emotions, it was obvious Pritchard wondered why she'd screened when their delegations were due to sit down together again in less than half an hour. Well, she's about to find out, Honor thought, and it'll be interesting to see if she and Theisman react the way someone with Stinker's notion of their tree cat names ought to. I'm sorry to disturb you, Madam President, she said out loud but I've just received a dispatch from home. It doesn't require any immediate action on our part, she assured Pritchard as the other woman's eyebrows rose, but I thought I'd share it with you. As part of the deep background for the Star Empire's negotiating stance, as it were. By all means, Admiral, if you think that's appropriate. Pritchard sat back in her chair, shoulders squared, and looking into those topaz eyes, Honor could see the other woman's memories of the last time she'd provided her with deep background. Appropriate can be such an interesting word, Honor observed wryly. I hope it applies in this case, but I suppose we'll just have to see, won't we? At any rate, Madam President, it would appear that just over three tea weeks ago, one of our destroyers, HMS Reprise, returned to the spindle system from Myers with what I suppose could be called interesting news. It would appear that notwithstanding all of the historical evidence to the contrary, it really is genuinely possible for a Solarian ship of the wall to make it all the way out into the verge under its own power. In fact... Chapter 26 Well, Elizabeth Winton said dryly, I suppose the question presently before us is, now what the hell do we do? I suppose so, Your Majesty, William Alexander replied. On the other hand, our decision trees have just been rather brutally simplified. Once you're on the Hexapuma's back, your only real options are to hang on or get eaten. Not necessarily, Willie, his brother said. Baron Grantville looked at him, eyebrows rising, and Hamish Alexander Harrington barked a laugh. There was no humor in the cold sound, and his blue eyes were even colder. You really think there's another option, Hamish? The Prime Minister asked skeptically. Of course there is. If you can reach your pulsar, you put a dart through the six-legged bastard's brain instead, the Earl of Whitehaven replied harshly. Grantville's face tightened as he heard the combined anger, vengefulness, and confidence in his brother's voice. The Alexander temper was famous throughout the Royal Manticoran Navy, and Grantville had enjoyed even more experience with it than most of Whitehaven's fellow officers. For that matter, he had it himself in full measure. And he knew his brother well enough to understand exactly how a man who'd commanded the men and women of the Royal Navy in battle would feel about someone who'd cold-bloodedly set out to annihilate a handful of battle cruisers and heavy cruisers with an entire fleet of super dreadnoughts. The fact that things hadn't worked out the way Sandra Crandall had expected wasn't likely to do a thing to make Whitehaven any less angry either. Nor, for that matter, should it. After all, it's the thought that counts, isn't it? Granville reflected. On the other hand... You know, Haim, I've been doing a little historical research of my own since Mike's first reports about New Tuscany got back to us, he said. You were right when you suggested Lincoln to me, but there are some other interesting tidbits in Old Earth history, too. For example, I assume you're familiar with the term victory disease, aren't you? As a matter of fact, I am. Whitehaven's teeth flashed in something which bore a certain vague resemblance to a smile, and Samantha flattened her ears as she lay stretched tense and angry along the back of his chair. On the other hand, we're the ones who were supposed to be the recipient of a Pearl Harbor attack this time around, not the ones stupid enough to launch it. And I'm not proposing any of us underestimate the scale of the threat either. What I am pointing out is that there's no point pretending none of this has happened or that the League's going to accept the outright destruction of 23 super-dreadnoughts and the capture of 48 more 
not to mention all Crandall's escorts, screening elements, and supply ships, without doing its damnedest to turn the entire Star Empire into rubble. In my opinion, Mike did exactly what she should have done under the circumstances, given an opposition force commander who obviously couldn't have poured piss out of a boot even if it did have instructions on the heel. But the fact that she chose the right option doesn't mean she chose a good one, since there weren't any good ones available to her. He paused, inviting anyone to disagree with anything he'd just said. Queen Elizabeth clearly didn't, and as much as Grantville would have liked to, he couldn't. Sir Anthony Langtree seemed torn between a diplomat's responsibility to find an option short of war and an ex-Marine's bloodthirsty belligerence. Sir Thomas Caparelli and Admiral Patricia Givens, on the other hand, were in obvious agreement with Whitehaven. All right, the Earl continued when no one accepted his invitation. Since the Sollies are going to decide, as the Queen put it before Crandall actually showed up, that the Star Empire's a nail and the thing for them to do is reach for the biggest damned hammer they've got— there's not much point kowtowing to that jackass Kolokoltsov and his pain-in-the-ass equally arrogant buddies. The way they've been viewing that green pines crap with alarm and calling for an impartial interstellar investigation by frontier security of all people into the Tsar Empire's apparent involvement in terroristic actions is a pretty fair indicator of where their brains such as they have and what there is of them, were headed even before Mike kicked Crandall's ass. So I think our best option is to tell them flat out that the entire mess is the result of the way their people have f uh, screwed up by the numbers and that we're all done putting up with it. Send them the tack recordings from Spindle and ask them how many more super dreadnoughts they want our cruisers to kill before we even bring up our battle cruisers, much less our own wallers, and get down to the main event. And while we're doing that, we go ahead and activate Case Leakawan too. Faces tightened around the table with his last sentence. Case Leakawan was the Royal Manticoran Navy's plan to close all wormhole nexi under its control to Solarian traffic. Or rather, that was the first phase of Leakawan. The second phase included active commerce raiding and the extension of de facto Manticoran control to every wormhole nexus within its reach, regardless of who that nexus normally belonged to. I realize what we're talking about here, Whitehaven said grimly, and I know the Sollies are going to scream bloody murder about our interference with free trade even before we decide to move to Leakwan too but the realization of just how much we can hurt them economically, coupled with what happened at Spindle, may actually be a big enough clue stick to get through even to Solly's. It's the biggest one we've got, short of launching a general offensive at any rate, so I think we have to see whether or not it's big enough to do the trick. It's not like we've got all that much to lose anyway. Worst case the League goes ahead and does what it was going to do anyway, and we get to find out whether or not Honor's right about how fragile it is. Best case, though I'm not going to suggest anyone hold his breath waiting for it, somebody in old Chicago suddenly sprouts an IQ higher than his body temperature, and they decide it just might not be a good idea after all to get a couple or three million of their spaces killed. He shrugged. I'm not saying it's a good idea, but I am saying that, just like Mike, we're fresh out of good alternatives. So it's time we stop trying to avoid the inevitable and position ourselves to fight the League as effectively as humanly possible, if, when, it comes to that. The silence in the Mount Royal Palace conference room was intense, and Whitehaven leaned back in his chair his face hard. I don't really like saying it, Langtry said finally. But I think Hamish has a point. Nobody's ever captured a Solarian ship of the wall before, far less blown 23 of them out of space. 
And unless I'm mistaken, no one's ever killed anyone's super dreadnought using nothing but heavy cruisers. Talk about rubbing salt into the wound. He shook his head, contemplating the way Solarian arrogance was likely to react to the insult of being that casually and totally trounced by someone who hadn't even used a capital ship in the process. We're in uncharted territory, he continued, and unfortunately the one thing I think we can all agree on is that the League isn't going to take the news well, shall we say? That being so, the only modest change to Hamish's proposal I'd suggest would be to include a diplomatic note, which basically tells Kolokoltsov we consider Crandall's actions at Spindle yet another act of war, and that if they are not repudiated, publicly and in the strongest possible terms, within two standard tea days of the receipt of our note, Her Majesty's government will assume it represents the Solarian League's chosen policy vis-à-vis -vis the Star Empire. In that case, given the existence of a state of war of the League's choosing between it and us, we will immediately close all Nexi under our control to all Solarian traffic and inform all our station commanders that we're at war with the League and that they are to act accordingly. I don't have a problem with that, Whitehaven said. I don't expect it to do any good, but at least there won't be any questions about our pre-war diplomacy this time around. Wait. Elizabeth raised one hand, and her expression was rueful. I don't believe I'm about to say this, but here goes. Don't you think it might be a good idea to find out whether or not we're going to get a treaty out of Pritchett before we go sending any ultimatums to the Solarian League? With all due respect, Your Majesty, Langtree said, the ultimatum's already been delivered by the League, not us. It arrived in Spindle about two weeks ago. That's Hamish's entire point. Fortunately, judging from Duchess Harrington's dispatches, the chance of our getting a treaty out of Nouveau Paris is actually pretty good. I'm not counting any chickens before the eggs hatch, you understand, but we can't allow our policy towards the League to be dictated by concerns over our relations with the Republic. Obviously, we've got to bear both concerns in mind, and they're going to influence one another heavily, but we can't afford to couple them too closely together when we start formulating policy and military strategy. All right, I can see that, Elizabeth said, but let's pursue this notion of sending them the tactical recordings a little farther. Is there really much chance they'll draw the proper conclusions from them? Pat? She looked at Admiral Givens, and the woman who headed the Office of Naval Intelligence flashed an unhappy smile that was almost a grimace. Your Majesty, I'm afraid that comes under the heading of nobody knows. There's simply no way to predict the answer. Crandall obviously didn't draw the right conclusions from what happened to Bing, but I think we'd all agree she wasn't the sharpest stylist in the box. And for that matter, the Battle of Spindle's a rather larger exclamation point than what happened at New Tuscany. On the other hand, old Chicago's a lot further from Spindle than Myers is from New Tuscany, and the truth probably is that their so-called intelligence analysts have been so insulated from reality for so long that no one's telling the bureaucrats who are actually calling the shots just how bad the balance of military capabilities really is from the SLN's perspective. Assuming, of course, any of the aforesaid analysts want to tell them in the first place. Why shouldn't they want to? Elizabeth asked. That's their job, isn't it? And it's their navy that's going to get reamed if they screw up. Why didn't Highridge's and Janacek's analysts tell them what was really happening, Your Majesty? Givens countered sadly, almost gently. After studying what we've recovered from the databases Admiral Goldpea captured at New Tuscany, I'm even more of the opinion that everyone in the League's been telling their superiors what those superiors wanted to hear for so long that it's unlikely any of them remember how to tell someone an unpalatable truth. And truth to tell, I actually sympathize with them. A little, anyway. Excuse me? Elizabeth's eyebrows rose, and Given shook her head. Your Majesty, there's always a temptation for any analyst to choose the hypothesis she knows her superiors, or her government, or the people responsible for shaping policy, want to hear. Telling them something else isn't the way to make herself popular, after all. 
but it's not necessarily even a matter of a self-serving refusal to rock the boat either. Sometimes it's even a case of recognizing what their superiors are willing to hear, of avoiding truths that will simply get them disregarded or fired, because they know that if they go, they'll only be replaced by someone even less willing to risk flouting the party line. Of course, it can be a case of simple mental laziness, too. In fact, that happens a lot more frequently than most of us in the intelligence community like to admit. But even more often than that, probably, perfectly honest, hard-working analysts screw up by the numbers simply because they've gotten into a habit of thought. Because someone's allowed herself to become so firmly wedded to one view of the evidence, often without even realizing she's done so, that her own internal filters screen out anything that would challenge the existing interpretation. Frankly, that's a huge part of what's happened to the League, and it's happened because the League's been able to survive anyway. It hasn't bitten them on the butt, the way Jurgensen's failures at O&I bit us when Theismann launched Thunderbolt. The League is so big and so powerful that, to some extent at least, the Sorleys really have been able to make reality be what they wanted it to be. After all, who was big or nasty enough to pound them if they were wrong? So they've gone happily along, seeing themselves as the lords of all creation, literally, for centuries. Of course it's going to be hard for any doomsayers to get through to the real decision-makers. Even with the tactical records from Spindle in front of them? Assuming the analysts themselves believe the records in question are genuine, they'd still have to get them past their own superiors, Your Majesty. And that's not likely to be as simple as it would be in an ideal galaxy. I'd say it's possible, even probable, someone higher than them in the food chain's going to be suppressing any unfortunate little evidence that she helped create the current FUBAR. I mean, the current situation. And even if that isn't the case, those superiors are going to have preconception filters of their own. And I'd estimate it's at least equally probable that someone's going to tone down the analysts' reports in the interests of cool reason and avoiding hysterical alarmism. Potts raised a couple of good points, Your Majesty, Whitehaven said, and Elizabeth returned her attention to him. For one thing, she's absolutely right about the inertia quotient, the way the currently accepted wisdom, whatever it happens to be, has a tendency to throttle anything that challenges it. He snorted acerbically and shook his head. I've had a little personal experience with that, if you remember that minor disagreement Sonia Hempel and I had going on for so long. That much can happen to anybody, even someone who's making a genuine effort to be intellectually honest and fair, if he's not aware that he's investing too much confidence in what he already knows is true, without making enough allowance for the fact that things might have changed. But she's also right about the attitude we're likely to see out of the SLN's senior officers, too, because they're not going to be anywhere near as interested in intellectual honesty as they are in covering their arses. I never thought I'd say this about anyone— but compared to quite a few of the Solis' most senior officers, Edward Janacek was competent, far-sighted, and thoughtful. I wouldn't go quite that far, Hamish, Caparelli interjected dryly. Almost, and I'll grant you the Solis are probably even worse, but nobody could actually make Janacek look good. All right, Whitehaven nodded, accepting the correction. But my point stands. These people have been gaming the system for so long, without believing for a moment there could possibly be any realistic threat to the system, that their very first thoughts are going to focus on making sure nothing threatens their personal positions within the system. Some of them will be stupid enough to try to make it all go away by suppressing... What was it you called it, Pat? Any unfortunate little evidence that could possibly implicate them when it comes time to play the blame game? And others are simply going to be so unaccustomed to thinking about external threats 
They literally don't recognize one when they actually see it, or not until it's too late, at least. We do have Admiral O'Cleary's official report to support the data, Langtry pointed out, and it was Givens' turn to snort. Yes, we do, Mr. Secretary, she agreed when he raised an eyebrow at her. But first, the very fact that O'Cleary surrendered is going to be a severe blow to her credibility as far as the people back on Old Earth are concerned. Not only are they going to be thinking in terms of personal cowardice on her part, but I guarantee you someone's going to suggest she has a powerful interest in overstating the effectiveness of our weapons technology. After all, if we really have super weapons at our disposal, then her cowardly decision to surrender looks a lot better, doesn't it? That's not the only thing that's going to help people who want to undercut her credibility either. There's also the matter of our willingness to transmit her report to them. That's suspicious in its own right, isn't it? We undoubtedly have our own sinister motives for getting it to them as quickly as possible, don't we? And, for that matter, there's the little question of why it was left up to her to do the surrendering and report writing, isn't there? The brief silence which answered her was thoughtful, to say the least. I take it you don't incline to the theory that it was suicide after all, Elizabeth said after a moment. At this point, I don't have a strong feeling either way, Your Majesty, Givens replied. I'd have to say that if I were a Solarian admiral who'd managed to make the absolutely wrong call on every single decision and gotten twenty-plus ships of the wall destroyed as an obvious consequence of my own abject stupidity, the temptation to just go on and shoot myself in the head would definitely be there. On the other hand, most people who decide to shoot themselves in the head don't shoot themselves in the back of the head. For that matter, she could have used the overrides of her skin suit's med panel to administer a lethal dose that would have put her painlessly to sleep. We don't like to talk about it, but every spacer knows how to do that, given all the nasty, lingering ends we can wind up facing. That sounds to me like you don't think it was suicide. Well, there's no question it was her pulser, Your Majesty, and it was in her hand when Admiral Goldpeak's marines recovered her body. Judging from the Admiral's report, there's no forensic evidence to suggest anyone else fired the fatal dart for that matter. Unfortunately, there aren't any witnesses who actually saw her do it either, which is pretty suspicious in its own right. And given the fact that everyone on her flag bridge was skin-suited, there probably wouldn't be any forensic evidence, even under ideal conditions. But if it wasn't suicide, who killed her? Granville asked, frowning intently. From our perspective, that question's wide open, Given said. I don't want to sound too Byzantine, but one possibility that's occurred to me is that someone else on her flag bridge, probably one of her own staffers, was also working for manpower and had orders to see to it she didn't have an opportunity to discuss her decisions and the reasons for them with us. The problem, though, is that our perspective isn't the important one at the moment. The important one is the one from Old Chicago, and it's likely to occur to someone back on Old Earth that Admiral Crandall's demise was arranged by some nefarious manty. But why? the Prime Minister asked, almost plaintively. Why, in order to make sure O'Cleary wrote the official dispatch, Mr. Prime Minister? Obviously, she's either turned her coat in return for some bribe on our part, or else we delicately informed her that the same thing that happened to Crandall could happen to her if her report didn't say what we wanted it to say. The fact that despite all the damage the Buckley took, Crandall was the only fatality on her flag bridge would be suspicious enough for some people, even without the possible irregularities of her self-inflicted wound or the mysterious lack of witnesses. Wonderful. Elizabeth reached up and lifted Ariel down into her lap. She sat stroking the cat for several seconds, then drew a deep breath. All right, we're basically spinning our wheels. That's not a criticism either, only a reflection of how little chance we have of guessing how the solid bureaucracy is going to spin this for its own internal consumption, much less the media. But I do have one other question I'd like all of you bright people to consider with me. Yes, Your Majesty? Grantful asked just the least bit warily when she paused. 
I think we're all in agreement that, preposterous as it seems, the real prime mover in all of this has been manpower and or Mesa. The queen shook her head as if even now she couldn't quite believe what her own voice was saying. I know we don't have any direct evidence linking Crandall to what happened at New Tuscany, or for that matter proving being knew he was working for manpower. We do know manpower was behind Monica, and this uneasy Movna's involvement at New Tuscany as well clearly demonstrates they were pulling the strings, whether he realized it or not. And the official Mason version of what happened at Green Pines pretty clearly indicates that the system government itself is carrying water for manpower where we're concerned. My point is that it seems to me we'd be just as guilty of filtering out inconvenient evidence as we're accusing the Solis of being if we didn't face the fact that all of our threat analyses have fallen seriously short of the mark where manpower and Mesa are concerned. So, given that we have so much evidence of manpower's involvement in both Monica and New Tuscany, do we go directly after Mesa? As in taking direct military action against the system, Your Majesty? Caparelli sounded like a man who wanted to be positive he was interpreting her correctly. That's one possibility, Elizabeth said grimly. Frankly, it has a certain definite appeal, too. If Eighth Fleet can take out the Haven System's defenses and infrastructure, a couple of battle squadrons ought to be more than enough to do the same job on Mesa. But I was also thinking about making the point to the Sollies and demanding that they investigate the extent to which manpower's been manipulating their military forces. From a purely military perspective, taking out Mesa wouldn't be that difficult, assuming they don't have a surprise for us even more fundamental than our surprises for the Solis, Your Majesty, Caparelli said. Of course, getting there could be a bit difficult, not to mention time-consuming, and if we took action unilaterally, I'd say there'd have to be at least a pretty fair chance some of Mesa's proxies in the League would point to it as yet another example of mindless Manticoran military aggression, this time directed at a star system well inside the shell, even if it isn't formally a member of the League. I wouldn't have any fundamental objections to carrying out the strike, Tom, Whitehaven said thoughtfully. Not if we have the situation with Haven under control, at least. Frankly, I don't see where it could make our relations with the League any worse, at any rate. I think I'm inclined to be a little more cautious about that, Your Majesty, Langtree said. I'm not going to shed any tears for anything we do to those manpower bastards, and I could see a lot of pluses to pointedly suggesting to others who might wish the Star Empire ill that every action produces a reaction— at the same time, the propaganda version of Green Pines is still playing to the hilt with the mainstream Soli newsies. Except for O'Hanrahan and a couple of other muckrakers, no one seems to be choking on Mesa's version, and Abruzzi is working it for all he's worth over at Education and Information. If we act precipitously against Mesa, the people buying into that version are going to see it as an escalation of our earlier attacks on the system, and probably an effort to shut them up before they turn up something still more damaging about what really happened at Green Pines. So, are you suggesting that their cock-and-bull story should paralyze us militarily? Whitehaven asked, a bit more caustically than he usually spoke to his old friend, and Langtree frowned. No, Haim, I'm not, the foreign secretary said but I am suggesting that Mesa isn't going anywhere. There's time to get around to dealing with manpower and Mesa later if we decide to, and I'd prefer not to complicate things with the League any more than we have to at this point. But our hitting Mesa might actually give the League an out, Tony, Elizabeth countered. He looked a question at her, and she shrugged. If we were willing to commit to active military operations against Mesa— it would be pretty convincing evidence we really think they're responsible for what's been going on in Talbot. It's possible even Solis would recognize the opportunity to back away from a direct confrontation with us 
at least long enough to find out whether or not our suspicions were justified. Possible, Your Majesty, Langtree conceded. Frankly, though, I think likely would be another matter entirely, especially not with that damned green pine story clouding the issue. At least some of the talking heads are going to argue that backing the ballroom in green pines is an example of our already conducting active operations against manpower in what we hoped would be an untraceable fashion. Under that interpretation, open military action would only be more of the same. And since we've resorted to backing terrorist attacks, we're tarred with the same brush, aren't we? I mean, isn't there a moral equivalence between Anisimovna's blowing up the new Tuscan space station and our nuking a city full of civilians? Where do we get off trying to claim some sort of moral superiority over our enemies in that case? Let's not reject the notion out of hand, Tony, Grantville said, then chuckled harshly at Langtree's evident surprise. I know I'm the one who's been most nervous about expanding our current unpleasantness with Haven into an even broader conflict, the Prime Minister continued. But I think the Queen may have a point here, and it's not as if we have to make up our minds about it this afternoon. We've provided the Sollies, and their newsies for that matter, with all our evidence about manpower's involvement in both Monica and New Tuscany. If we go ahead and send them the talk data from Spindle, as Hamish is suggesting, and which I think is a very good idea, by the way, we can also remind them about our belief that manpower's at the bottom of what's been going on in Talbot. I don't imagine even Kolokholtsov and the others are going to decide overnight to formally declare war. First, because I have to think it's at least possible simple disbelief and shock over what happened to Crandall is going to make even Solis hesitate, at least briefly, while they try to find out what really happened. And second, because even if that doesn't happen, getting a formal war declaration out of the Assembly is going to be the next best thing to impossible, green pines or not, given how their constitution's written. So even if they decide to throw the League Navy at us anyway, it's going to be a de facto state of war, not a de jure one which means that if we continue to insist manpower's really to blame, and if we act consistently with that belief down the road, they'll still be able to pull in their horns if and when they finally figure out, or decide to admit at any rate, that we've been right about manpower all along, and that they've been had over green pines. In fact, if they get chewed up even remotely this badly in a couple of more battles— they may find themselves looking desperately for some sort of statesmanlike way to climb out of the hole they've dug for themselves. And much as what I'd really like to do is start shoveling dirt in on top of them, the smart thing to do would be to reach down and give them a boost when they start trying to climb. If they start trying to climb. In the short term, though, Tony, I'm inclined to agree with you. We can always decide to pursue the military option with Mesa later, there's no reason we have to add it to the pot right this instant and risk complicating our relations with the League even further. All right, Elizabeth decided. I agree with both of you, so we'll set aside any immediate direct military action against Mesa. At the same time, though, Sir Thomas, I want the Admiralty to be working on the operational planning to do exactly that, if and when the moment seems appropriate. Yes, your majesty. And in the meantime, the queen continued more grimly, you and Hamish are formally instructed that the crown has determined that an effective state of war exists between the Star Empire and the Solarian League. You are authorized and directed to transmit the appropriate activation orders for Laocoon I and to make any military movements you deem appropriate in its support. I want to avoid any additional provocations, if at all possible. But that desire takes secondary priority. The security of our ships, personnel, and citizens, and the accomplishment of Leakowan's objectives are to be your primary consideration. And you are also instructed to take all necessary and prudent steps to prepare for the execution of Leakowan too, as well. Is that clearly understood? It is, Your Majesty. Whitehaven replied quietly, and she met his eyes steadily for a handful of heartbeats, then nodded. Good. Chapter 27 
Fleet Admiral Alan Higgins felt a familiar mix of leftover surprise, regret, apprehension, and amusement as he stepped out of the lift car onto the flag bridge of his super dreadnought flagship. He was accustomed to all those feelings, but they'd grown sharper in the weeks since Duchess Harrington had resumed command of Eighth Fleet and headed off for the Haven system. The surprise stemmed from the fact that he, of all people, held his current position. Alan Higgins had been one of the flag officers Edward Janicek had appointed to a major fleet command. Not only that, he was connected by marriage to the Janicek family. Under the circumstances, he was amazed he'd been retained on active duty at all, and he supposed the fact that he still had a flag bridge to call his own said interesting things about Earl Whitehaven, since one of Janicek's very first moves on reassuming the post of First Lord of Admiralty had been to purge the Navy of every single Whitehaven protege and ally. He hadn't even pretended the purge wasn't largely inspired by his personal hatred for the Earl either. Frankly, Higgins had expected Whitehaven, with whom he himself had never gotten along very well, having once fallen afoul of the infamous Alexander Temper, to wield an equally thorough retaliatory broom. And if he were going to be honest about it, he also had to admit that, based on the Navy's performance in the face of the Havenites' Operation Thunderbolt, Whitehaven would have been completely justified. Yet the Whitehaven Admiralty had shown a surprising degree of tolerance— possibly because it didn't have much choice. It could hardly have fired every serving and surviving flag officer after all, given the frantic need to expand the Navy once more and the demand for experienced admirals that entailed. Higgins didn't think that was the real explanation, though. Instead, to his considerable surprise, the new admiralty had contented itself with removing the more outrageously political Janicek appointees and those whose demonstrated performance had proven conclusively that they weren't suitable material for combat commands. Given the minor fact that Alan Higgins had been the commanding officer on Grendelsbane Station when the peep offensive rolled over it, he'd expected to find himself on that list of less-than-suitable material officers. After all, he was the one who'd lost several hundred lakhs and seven SDPs, discovering the peeps did indeed have lax and MDMs of their own, and the one who'd abandoned the system in the face of the overwhelming attack and, just incidentally, destroyed the 19 Sealax and no less than 73 modern ships of the wall lying helpless in the station's building slips to keep them from falling into peep hands. And, of course, there was the minor matter of the 40,000 yard workers he'd been unable to take with him as well. It was the memory of that cataclysmic day which accounted for the strand of regret which wove itself through his emotions at moments like this. And yet, he hadn't been beached by Whitehaven after all, despite Grendelsbane. He wondered sometimes how much of that was due to the fact that even though he'd been a Janicek appointee, he'd never pretended to be an admirer of Edward Janicek. Or to the fact that he'd been summarily placed on half pay by Janicek, pending the determination of a full and impartial board of inquiry, as soon as he got back to Manticore. The truth was that the main reason he'd been retained on active duty under Janicek in the first place was that he happened to be married to one of Janicek's cousins. Janicek hadn't kept him on because he valued his services or trusted his cronyism, he'd kept him on as a combined sop to his critics and a way to keep peace in the family. Higgins had actually felt uncomfortable about serving under Janicek, especially since he knew the reasons the opportunity had been offered to him. He'd silenced his own conscience by arguing that at least some competent flag officers had to remain on duty, but he felt confident Janicek had never really trusted him, which was probably why he'd found himself assigned to Grendelsbane when he thought about it since it had been far enough away to keep him safely out of sight, out of mind. And which was also why Janicek had decided his cousin-in-law had made an admirable choice when he needed someone to throw under the ground car after Thunderbolt blew Grendelsbane, among other things, into dust bunnies on Janicek's watch. In his more cynical moments, Higgins was confident Janicek's obvious decision to scapegoat him was a major factor in Whitehaven's decision to rehabilitate him. A sort of tit-for-tat way to plant one right in Janicek's eye. On the other hand, Whitehaven had left him dirt-side 
until the Board of Inquiry reported on Grendelsbane, and the Board's conclusions had been that no one could have done better than Higgins, given the numerical odds and the knowledge he'd possessed about Havenite weapons capabilities. So it was certainly arguable that Whitehaven, Sir Thomas Caparelli, and Sir Lucian Cortez had decided to offer him a command solely on the basis of that report. In his less cynical moments, Higgins didn't find that difficult to accept, yet he was still more than a bit bemused by the quirk of fate which had put him in command of home fleet and in the process converted him into the only admiral of the fleet currently in Mantikran service. Of course, he wouldn't have been where he was if not for the massive losses the Royal Mantikoran Navy had suffered in the Battle of Manticore. To his considerable astonishment, Alan Higgins had become one of the dozen or so most senior flag officers in the entire Navy in the wake of that brutal winnowing. When Duchess Harrington had relinquished command of Home Fleet to resume command of Eighth Fleet, or rather when there had been enough Manticoran and Alliance ships of the wall to rebuild a home fleet in addition to Eighth Fleet, Alan Higgins had found himself replacing her. Well, stepping into her position, since it was unlikely anyone could actually replace her. Although Higgins respected Alexander Harrington's accomplishments, he was also one of those officers who was well aware of the role the media had played in creating the legend of the Salamander. To her credit, she seemed to genuinely attempt to avoid that sort of media adulation, but coupled with her stature on Grayson and her political status as one of the main leaders of the opposition to the High Ridge government, it had turned her into the next best thing to a physical avatar of the goddess of war as far as the Manticoran public was concerned. And for that matter, as far as most of the Navy was concerned, which had made stepping into her shoes an interesting experience. It also accounted for some of his current apprehension. After all, no matter how well he did, he was going to find himself being compared to the memory of Sebastian Dorville, who died leading the previous home fleet into headlong battle, or of Duchess Harrington, whom Higgins had relieved as home fleet CO, and whose eighth fleet had saved the home system from Operation Beatrice. And if he were going to continue to be honest, part of that apprehension also stemmed from what had happened in Grendelsbane. There was no point trying to pretend the experience hadn't scarred him. He didn't think it had left him doubting his judgment, but it had left him dreading a repeat performance. He would have felt much more comfortable if he'd been able to convince himself lightning didn't really strike twice in the same place. Unfortunately, it did. So instead, he spent his time telling himself disasters like Grendelsbane weren't really lightning bolts, so he didn't have to worry about stupid proverbs. Which, he reflected, makes me feel ever so much better when I think about it. His lips twitched as that brought him almost full circle through the cycle of thoughts which always ran through his mind at moments like this. It was fortunate his sense of humor, at least, had survived Grendelsbane and the Battle of Manticore, he supposed. It was a drier and sometimes more biting sense of humor than it once had been, but it was still there, and he suspected he was going to need it now that Laocoon I was in effect. The League wasn't going to be happy when it discovered Manticore had closed the junction to all Solly traffic, or that non-discretionary recall orders had been issued to every Manticoran merchantman in Solarian space. Or, now that he thought about it, that orders had been dispatched to every station commander to take whatever steps seemed necessary to protect Manticoran ships, property, and lives from Solarian action. No, they weren't going to be very happy about that at all, he thought. In fact, he reflected, as he looked at his flagship's crest, mounted on the flagbridge bulkhead beside the lift doors, a lot of them were going to be taking his flagship's name in vain when they heard about it. HMS Inconceivable He wasn't sure what he thought of Inconceivable as the name for one of Her Majesty's starships, but it was certainly a fitting appellation for his flagship under the circumstances. I don't suppose you've got that flight schedule for me yet, a patient, long-suffering voice said as Colonel Andrew LaFollet of the Harrington Steadholders Guard stepped through the office door, and he looked at the speaker with an artfully innocent expression. Flight schedule? he inquired blankly. 
Which flight schedule would that be? His sister glared at him, and the tree cat on the end of Miranda LaFollet's desk bleaked a laugh. The one, she said with a ferocious glower, for the trip to Sphinx. You do remember the trip to Sphinx? The one for Clarissa's birthday? Oh, that schedule. He smiled at her. What makes you think I might have it? You're the one in charge of things around here when the Steadholder and Mac are away, not me. Miranda glowered some more, but the smile twitching at the corners of her mouth gave her away. After a moment, she gave up. There was no point trying to change her big brother at this point. Besides, she'd be disappointed if she succeeded, she thought. All right, she said. You win. I'll make the flight arrangements, but I can't do that until you hand me the security plan. So where is it? Oh, well, I've got that right here, he told her with a chuckle and tossed the chip folio across to her. She missed the catch, but Farragut reached up a long-fingered true hand and plucked it neatly out of the air. Thanks, she told the cat as he handed it across to her. Nice to see that at least some male members of the species are capable of showing a modicum of courtesy, she added, looking rather pointedly at Andrew. <laughs> He's just sucking up to his celery source. Miranda laughed and Andrew winked at her, then waved casually and headed back out of her office. She smiled after him for a few moments, then shook her head and inserted the data chip into her reader. A file header appeared on her display, and her smile faded into a frown of intensity as she studied the file's contents. She supposed it was entirely possible, even likely, that a great many Manticorans would find it more than mildly ridiculous for someone to file a security plan that ran to better than 50 pages just for a day trip to take a 10-month-old baby and his grandmother to his aunt's birthday party. Miranda La Follet, on the other hand, did not, because the grandmother in question was her steadholder's mother, and the ten-month-old was Raoul Alfred Alistair Alexander Harrington, who would someday, Tester willing, be her steadholder. Not that she'd be around to see that day. At least she hoped she wouldn't, she thought, with a familiar edge of bittersweetness. She'd been just too old for Prolong when the Treaty of Alliance with Manticore brought it to the planet Grayson. At 50, she was 13 years younger than Lady Harrington, but if anyone had simply looked at the two of them, they would have thought the interval was twice as great and in the opposite direction. Miranda would have been more than human if there hadn't been time she resented the extended lifespans Manticorans took for granted, but she'd truly come to terms with it, or she thought she had at least. And if neither she nor Andrew would ever be able to receive the prolonged treatments, their younger siblings, like her brother Micah, certainly had. She sat gazing sightlessly at the display for a couple of seconds, then shook her head with a snort. She had more important things to do than sit around brooding, she told herself tartly, and returned her attention to Andrew's plan. Stupidest damned idea I've ever heard of. It's not like we don't have other things, worthwhile things we could be doing instead, after all. And if anything ever really happens to the station, who the hell's going to have time to run for a friggin' lifeboard in the first place? Ensign Paolo D'Arezzo felt a very strong desire to throttle Lieutenant Anthony Berkeley. Unfortunately, he lacked Helen Zilwicky's aptitude for hand-to-hand -hand mayhem. Or perhaps fortunately, given the fact that Berkeley was a full senior-grade lieutenant, which would have brought up all sorts of sticky things about striking a superior officer, the Star Empire then being in a state of war. He rather doubted a court-martial would feel, because the deceased was such a loud-mouthed moron, constituted sufficient justification for violating Article 9. Although if the members of the court actually knew Berkeley... And another thing, the lieutenant went on, waving his right hand, index finger extended to emphasize his point as he shared his insights. How the hell much did this little brain fart cost? I mean, launching every single port the station has? Jesus! Just recertifying all of them is going to take weeks, and you know they're going to downcheck at least some of them. You know, Paolo thought, it was a lot more fun aboard Hexapuma, even when people were shooting at us. If Helen had to get herself sent back off to Talbot without me, 
Why couldn't I have at least stayed aboard the ship, like Aikawa? For that matter, why couldn't I have stayed anywhere that would have kept me away from a klutz like Berkeley? Deep inside, he rather suspected he would have been grumpy any place they sent him if Helen wasn't around. That thought was one he tried not to examine too closely, though. It still made him uncomfortable after he'd spent so many years running away from any sort of serious emotional entanglement. But the truth was that her absence left an empty place down inside him, one he'd never realized was there, when all he'd been able to think about was the attractive physical packaging Manpower Incorporated had designed into someone it had intended to sell as a pleasure slave. A sex toy, really. But, be that as it might, assigning him to work directly under Anthony Berkeley had to come under the heading of cruel and unusual punishment. If there'd been any real justice in the galaxy, he'd have been assigned to Admiral Yeager's Research and Development Division with Captain Lewis. That would have been interesting, especially for someone with Paolo's natural bent for the electronic warfare officer's career track. But no, in their infinite wisdom, the powers that were at the Bureau of Personnel had decided he and Senior Chief Wanderman should get a little hands-on time with the fabrication side. Which, little though he cared to admit it, might actually contain at least a modicum of rationality. It never hurt for an EWO to have at least some familiarity with the nuts and bolts of his hardware, after all. But there had to be some way for him to get that familiarity without putting up with Berkeley. If only there were some way he could quietly and discreetly leave the small classroom in which their party of evacuees had been instructed to wait. Unfortunately, there wasn't one, and Berkeley happened to be the senior officer present, which put him in charge of their small detachment. If Paolo tried to sneak out, the lieutenant would demand to know where he was going, and somehow, anywhere you aren't, didn't seem the most diplomatic possible response. Truthful? Yes. Diplomatic? No. And if we just had to do something this stupid, Berkeley continued, at least we could have done it when we weren't. Excuse me, lieutenant, a contralto voice said from the doorway. But exactly what stupid something did you have in mind? Berkeley's mouth shut with an almost audible click, and he spun towards the slender, dark-haired commander standing in the open door with her head cocked to one side. I, uh, didn't see you there, Commander McGillicuddy, he said. No, Commander Anastasia McGillicuddy agreed pleasantly. I don't suppose you did. However, I was just passing through when I heard what sounded remarkably like a raised voice. I was down at the end of the hall, you understand, so I wasn't completely certain that was what I was hearing. I decided to find out. Her smile was as pleasant as her tone, but her brown eyes were cold, and the much taller and bulkier Berkeley seemed to shrink slightly. As I drew closer, I realized you were availing yourself of this opportunity to continue the instruction of the junior officers entrusted to your care, she went on. I was impressed by your apparent vigor, Obviously, you'd been discussing a subject you felt strongly about, so I thought I'd take this opportunity to find out what it was. Ma'am, I was just... that is... well... Berkeley's abortive response trailed off, and despite himself, Paolo actually felt a feeble, very feeble, flicker of sympathy. He throttled it without difficulty. Should I assume, Lieutenant, that you question Vice Admiral Faraday's priorities? McGillicuddy asked softly. Berkeley said nothing at all, and her nostrils flared. Then she looked past Berkeley to the junior officers and enlisted waiting in the classroom. She considered them briefly, then returned her attention to Berkeley. Since you feel qualified to critique this exercise, Lieutenant, she told him, I'll arrange for you to present your view of it directly to Captain Sugihara. Berkeley's fair complexion turned considerably fairer at the mention of Captain Brian Sugihara, Rear Admiral Trammell's exo. In the meantime, I strongly suggest you give some consideration to the appropriateness of your present forum, especially considering that you happen to be the senior officer present. You might want to spend the time more profitably doing something like, oh, I don't know, considering your report to Captain Sugihara, perhaps. In fact, you might want to give a little thought to whether or not Article 10 figures into your thinking as well. 
Paolo felt his lips trying to purse in a silent whistle as that last salvo landed. Obviously, McGillicuddy had heard even more and was even more pissed off than he'd thought. From the little Paolo had seen of her, she didn't seem like the sort who normally screamed at a subordinate, even a stupid subordinate, in front of that subordinate's juniors. The fact that Berkeley had ticked her off enough to do that was sufficiently significant on its own, but her last sentence had been so pointed not even Berkeley could miss the implication. Article 10 was the article which forbade actions or speech prejudicial to discipline and the chain of command. If Berkeley was brought up on that charge and it went into his personnel record... McGillicuddy held Berkeley's eyes for another few seconds, then nodded, glanced once at the breathlessly watching group of JGs, ensigns, and enlisted, and left without another word. Well, I'm undoubtedly the most unpopular officer in Wayland, Claudio Faraday said with an air of satisfaction. For that matter, I might well be the most unpopular officer in the entire beta subsystem. I think that might be going just a bit far, sir, Marcus Howell replied at least as far as the entire subsystem's concerned. Although, now that I think about it, they probably aren't too fond of you down on Griffin at the moment either. Nope. And I imagine I may be hearing a little something from the bean counter's back at Admiralty House, too. Faraday sounded a bit more serious, but his air of contentment was unabated. We've probably just written off, what, 10% of the station's life pods, after all? Not to mention shutting down the entire R&D section until we get the pods recertified, sir, Howell pointed out respectfully. Oh, thank you for recalling that little detail to my attention, Marcus. One of the things chiefs of staff are good for, sir. Faraday glowered at him, but the vice admiral didn't seem able to work up much wattage. Then he allowed his chair to come upright, planted his elbows on his desk, and leaned forward over his folded forearms. Actually he said much more seriously. The downtime bothers me most, but I don't expect Admiral Hempel to kick up much dust over it. I know most people think of her as the tech weenie's tech weenie, but she's got a lot better understanding of the realities than some of her research people out here do. He shook his head. Frankly, I think quite a few of them haven't figured out they're actually in the Navy and hence subject to the service's little foibles, like making sure they're up to date on the relevant emergency procedures. And even for most of the others, the thought that anyone might possibly want to hurt them never enters their minds, which doesn't even consider the fact that genuine accidents can happen even aboard the most modern space station. Howell nodded. He wasn't sure he agreed with Faraday's decision to actually evacuate the space station and send all but a tiny caretaker detachment down to the planet Griffin he was perfectly ready to admit that the readiness state of Wayland's disaster and evacuation planning had been, well, disastrous, though, and Faraday was certainly correct about the possibility of accidents. There hadn't been a major catastrophe aboard any of the Star Empire's main industrial platforms in decades, but there'd been several moderately severe accidents, and catastrophe was always possible, however improbable it might seem. If that had happened aboard Wayland a few weeks earlier, personnel losses might have been cataclysmic. The series of simulations Faraday had ordered had created a great deal of anger and frustration. At the same time, his grumpy subordinates had finally been forced to accept that he was serious about trying to get them off the station alive if something went wrong. They might not have been happy about it, but they'd at least started going through the motions with something resembling efficiency. Of course, they'd known it was only going to be simulations, which would let them get back to work on more serious concerns after a half hour or so of nonsense. Until this morning, that was, when the exercise had concluded with the words, This is no sim, which was basically all the warning they'd gotten before their life pods blasted out of the station and headed for Griffin, whose authorities had had no more notion they might be coming than they'd had that they might be going. The Planetary Authority's disaster and evacuation planning for Wayland had come up a little short as well, with the station's personnel jammed into whatever improvised holding stations they could come up with while they tried to figure out what to do with them. Since they were supposed to already have detailed plans for doing just that, 
the current planetary FUBAR probably wasn't going to make Vice Admiral Faraday very popular with them when their efficiency reports, or their civilian equivalents, got written. All in all, a good day's work, Faraday concluded. I figure we should be able to start redocking the fabrication section's pods in a couple of days. I want to start there at any rate. May I ask why, sir? Howell asked with a slight sense of trepidation. Indeed you may, Faraday replied with a shark-like smile. While we're redocking fabrication's pods and recertifying researchers' pods, you and I and Admiral Jaeger and a security team from O&I, which just happens to have been in system when I called this little exercise, are going to do a walkthrough. We'll be sending an updated backup down to Griffin for storage just in case. And we're also going to see just how many of Jaeger's worker bees remember to secure their classified data properly before heading for their pods. Ouch! Howell's wince wasn't entirely feigned, and Faraday chuckled nastily. I'm already unpopular with them, Marcus. I might as well go whole hog and kill as many birds as possible while I'm chucking stones. And I already warned Jaeger this was coming. I won't say she's looking forward to it, but she understands why I'm doing it, and that I'm not going to deliberately collect any more heads than I have to. Which, unfortunately, doesn't mean some aren't going to roll anyway, of course. Howell nodded again. Some people never seem to understand that military efficiency demanded a certain degree of ruthlessness. Military commanders weren't, or shouldn't be at any rate, in the business of winning popularity contests. They should be in the business of promoting the efficiency, which definitely included the survivability of the units under their command. Not only was it a CO's duty to prune away deadwood, but it was also his responsibility to make all the personnel under his command aware of the fact that he'd do that pruning with ruthless dispatch whenever it was required. Punishing those who screwed up in order to encourage the others had been an axiom of military discipline for so many centuries because, whether it was nice or not, it worked. Punishment may not be the best possible motivator, but it's one that works, Howell thought. And it's one any effective officer has to have in his toolbox for the times when it's the only one that will. And at least Claudio understands the nuts and bolts of positive motivation as well, now that he's got their attention, at least. The chief of staff's lips twitched on the brink of a smile, but he suppressed it and paged to the next item on his electronic notepad. All right, sir. I'm going to assume from what you've just said that you want us to give the immediate priority to getting the fabrication section's life pods back aboard. Having said that, though, there's the question of engineering. In particular... Millions upon millions of kilometers from Vice Admiral Claudio's day cabin, shoals of missile pods continue to bore through space at 20% of the speed of light, and the visible disks of the stars called Manticore A and Manticore B grew steadily larger before them. Chapter 28 What happened wasn't anyone's fault. Unlike the Hyridge government's abysmal intelligence failure, in more than one sense of the word, during the run-up to Operation Thunderbolt, no one had ignored any warning signs. Perimeter security and home fleet had maintained their unceasing watch for any threat, despite the negotiations with Haven. Neither Admiral Givens' ONI nor any other of the Star Empire's intelligence services had misinterpreted, disregarded, or even overlooked a single scrap of relevant evidence that was hidden in their files. True, none of the analysts involved had been looking in the right direction— but they were scarcely alone in that, since no one outside the innermost core of the Mason Alignment even knew the Mason Alignment Navy existed. So it wasn't surprising Manticoran Intelligence's attention had been focused elsewhere, given all the other distractions the Alignment had arranged to keep the Star Empire occupied. But because no one had been aware of the Alignment's existence, or had even a clue as to its ultimate objectives— no one had ever heard of something called the Spider Drive, either, or suspected for a single moment that it might actually be not only possible but practical to launch something like Oyster Bay 
without its intended victim's elaborate, exquisitely sensitive, carefully maintained early warning systems detecting the attack, with plenty of time to prepare for it. Indeed, it might have been argued, although with debatable justice, that if there was a failure on the Mantikoran's part, it was one of hubris. After all, the Royal Mantikoran Navy had just been given overwhelming proof of its technological superiority to the vaunted SLN. Coupled with Manticore's persistent ability to stay ahead of Havenite R&D efforts, there was a certain confidence in the prowess of the RMN's hardware. To their credit, the Admiralty strategists had conscientiously maintained their awareness that, as Thomas Theismann had demonstrated in Operation Thunderbolt, any technological advantage was transitory. Despite that, however, they were convinced that right now, at this particular moment, their overall advantage was overwhelming, and so, in most respects, it was. The ships which had mounted Oyster Bay, however, represented a radical departure from anything the galaxy had previously seen, which was just as impressive in its own way as anything Manticore had accomplished. They weren't a particularly graceful departure, of course. In fact, compared to any impeller drive ship, they were squat, stumpy, and downright peculiar-looking, because unlike the gravitic drives everyone else used, the spider generated no impeller wedge. Instead of using two inclined planes of focused gravity to create bands of stressed space around the pocket of normal space which surrounded a ship, the spider used literally dozens of nodes to project spurs or spikes of intensely focused gravity. For all intents and purposes, each of those spurs was almost like generating a tractor or a presser beam, except that no one in his right mind had ever imagined tractors or pressers that powerful. In fact, at a sufficiently short range, they would have made quite serviceable energy weapons, because these focused directional beams were powerful enough to create their own tiny foci, effectively holes in the real universe, in which space itself was so highly stressed that the beams punched clear through to the alpha wall, the interface between normal space and hyperspace. No single beam would have been of any particular use. Powerful as it might be, it was less than a shadow compared to the output of even a single one of any starship's beta nodes, far less an alpha node. It wasn't even enough to produce the ripple along the hyperspace wall which Manticore used for its FTL communications technology. But it did lock onto the wall, and that provided the ship which mounted it a purchase point in deep space, one which was always available anywhere in any direction. And when dozens of those beams were combined, reaching out, locking onto the alpha wall, and pulling in micro-spaced bursts, they produced something that was very useful indeed. The maximum acceleration the new technology could theoretically have attained was vastly lower than the acceleration theoretically attainable under impeller drive. After all, in theory, an impeller wedge could be accelerated instantaneously to the speed of light. There were, however, a few shortcomings to that sort of acceleration, which was why theoretical acceleration rates had always been of far less interest to practical ship designers than the maximum rates which could be compensated for with sufficient efficiency to allow mere humans to survive without being turned into extremely thin layers of paste on the bulkheads. And in that respect, even the spider drive's lower theoretical maximum acceleration presented a definite challenge given the fact that it produced no impeller wedge. Without a wedge, it also produced no convenient sump for an inertial compensator, and that meant the maximum survivable normal space acceleration for a spider-drive-equipped ship was limited by the ability of currently available grav plate technology to offset the consequences of acceleration. Unfortunately, grav plates were far less capable in that respect than inertial compensators, which had an inevitable effect on the maximum acceleration a spider-drive ship could attain. It also meant that unlike impeller-drive vessels, a spider-drive ship's decks had to be aligned perpendicular to its axis of movement rather than parallel, which was a large part of what produced its shorter, squatter hull form, not to mention requiring some significant rethinks about the way spacecraft designers had been arranging ship interiors literally for centuries. Although the alignments physicists had been inspired to push graph plate technology harder than anyone else, there were still limits. Up to an actual acceleration of 150 gravities, 
it could achieve an efficiency of over 99%, producing a felt acceleration of only one gravity. Above that level, however, the plate's efficiency fell off dramatically. The physical plant itself grew larger and more massive on a steeply climbing curve, which cut into internal volume, and even then, each additional gravity of actual acceleration produced a felt increase of approximately 0.05 g. That didn't sound too terrible, but what it meant was that 50 additional gravities produced an apparent increase of 2.5 gravities, which raised the ship's internal gravity to 3.5 g, at which point the crew's ability to move about and perform even routine duties began to become impaired. And it also meant that grav plates powerful enough to produce that effect required almost twice the volume required to produce the 150 to 1 ratio. After considering the situation carefully, the architects had designed and stressed the ship's structures and control stations to permit effective maneuvering and combat at up to four gravities, but combat efficiency began to decline noticeably at that rate of acceleration due to the physiological limitations of the crew. Moreover, that still equated to an actual acceleration of only 210 gravities, which was pathetic by the standards of any impeller drive warship. Actual acceleration could be pushed, in emergencies, and briefly at least, to almost 310 gravities, but that produced a felt gravity of 9G. Crew acceleration couches were provided for just that contingency, yet 310 gravities was still barely half of the acceleration which the RMN's biggest super dreadnought could currently attain, and even with the best acceleration couches in the universe, no one could stand nine gravities for long. Worse, smaller spider drive ships had no acceleration advantage over larger ones, and the need to stabilize the ship relative to the hyperwall required at least three sets of spider legs, which led directly to the triple skeg hull form which had been adopted, which in turn meant that instead of two broadsides, a spider drive ship had three, none of which could be protected by the impenetrable barrier of an impeller wedge. That meant both that areas no impeller drive ship had to armor did require massive armor protection aboard a spider drive warship, and that there was no wedge floor and roof for a sidewall to stitch together. And just to make matters even more interesting, the spider drive could not be used through a spherical sidewall like the ones fortresses generated. All of that was true, and all of it constituted indisputably significant disadvantages. But the spider also had one overwhelming advantage. It was effectively undetectable by any sensor system deployed by any navy, including the MAN itself, at any range much beyond a single light second. Even for the MAN, it was damnably hard to detect. For someone who didn't even know what to look for, the task was about as close to outright impossible as challenges came. For all intents and purposes, a spider drive ship's drive field was invisible, and it was actually the drive signature of a ship for which virtually all long-range passive sensors searched which explained how Admiral Frederick Topolov's and Rear Admiral Lydia Panikitis's strike forces had been able to deploy their missile pods without anyone's ever noticing they were there. And it also explained how Commodore Carol Ostby's and Commodore Milena Omelchenko scouting forces had been able to prowl undetected about both components of the Manticore binary system for over two months, while Commodore Roderick Sung scouts and Admiral Jennifer Colenso strike ships had done exactly the same things at Yeltsin Star. And no one knew a thing about it or even suspected what was about to happen. Now the Mason attack came sweeping in out of the darkness. The incoming weapons had extraordinarily low radar signatures, and they were coming in at barely 60,000 kps. Even if some of them had been detected, their velocity was so low it was unlikely to pop through the defender's threat filters. As it happened, however, none of them were picked up as they sliced deeper and deeper in system, unseen and undetected, like the talons of some huge, lethal, invisible bird of prey. There were actually six separate attacks on the Manticore binary system itself, one for each inhabited planet's infrastructure, and each divided into two separate waves— although they'd been carefully synchronized to form a single devastating sledgehammer of a blow. 
The first wave of each attack consisted of a weapon which was as much a fundamental breakthrough in its own way as the Manticoran introduction of the multi-drive missile, a grazer torpedo which used its own variant of the spider drive. It was a large and cumbersome weapon, with the same trilateral symmetry as the Shark-class ships which had launched it, and for the same reasons. The torpedo's size made fitting it into magazines and actually firing it awkward, to say the least, and the sharks had never been intended to deploy it operationally. For that matter, the sharks themselves had never been supposed to be deployed operationally. The Leonard Detweiler class, which had been intended to carry out this operation, had been designed with magazines and launch tubes which would make it possible to stow and fire torpedoes internally, but none of the Detweilers were even close to completion, and it had required the development of an ingenious external rack system to allow the sharks to use it for Oyster Bay. For all its size, it was also a slow weapon. It was simply impossible to fit a spider drive capable of more than a few hundred gravities acceleration into something small enough to make a practical weapon. As compensation, however, its drive had almost as much endurance as most of the galaxy's recon drones, which gave it an impressive absolute range, and a large percentage of the torpedo's volume had been reserved for systems which had nothing at all to do with propulsion. Whereas the Royal Manticoran Navy had concentrated on improving the efficiency of its standard laser heads, Daniel Detweiler's R&D staff had taken another approach. They'd figured out how to squeeze what amounted to a cruiser-grade grazer projector into something small enough to deploy independently. The power of the torpedo's grazer wasn't remotely comparable to that of the weapon mounted by current-generation Shrikes, yet it was more powerful than any single-bomb-pumped laser head. Of course, there was only one of it in each torpedo, but R&D had decided the new weapon could sacrifice the laser head's multi-shot capability because it offered three highly significant advantages of its own. First, it was just as hard to pick up as a spider drive ship, and the best anti-missile defense in the universe couldn't hit something it didn't know was coming. Second, the torpedo carried extraordinarily capable sensors and targeting systems, and an AI which approached the capability of the one Sonia Hempel's people had fitted into the Apollo control missile. As a consequence, its long-range hit probability was significantly higher on a per-beam basis than anything short of Apollo itself. And third, a bomb-pulsed laser had a burst endurance of barely five thousandths of a second. A laser torpedo's grazer's endurance was a full three seconds, and it had a burn-through range against most sidewalls of over 50,000 kilometers. Fitting all that into something the size of a torpedo had required some drastic engineering compromises, and there'd never been any possibility of squeezing in the power supply for more than a single shot. Even if there had been, no one could build a grazer that small and that powerful, which could survive the power bleed and waste heat of actually firing. But that was fine with the MAN's designers and tacticians. In fact, they were just as happy every grazer torpedo would irrevocably and totally destroy itself in the moment it fired, since they weren't looking forward to the day one of their enemies finally captured one intact and figured out how to duplicate it. Now the time had come to find out just how profitably they'd invested their R&D time. The torpedoes had begun accelerating well before they or any of the missile pods accompanying them reached the range at which any transmission from the communications platforms the Ghost-class scout ships had emplaced could have reached them. On the other hand, they had less need for any additional information than the missiles did. They already knew where to find their targets, and they pulled steadily away from their purely ballistic pod companions. That's funny, Sensor Tech First Class Franklin Sands murmured. He reached out and tapped a command into his display, then frowned as the more detailed readout appeared. Ma'am, he said, looking over his shoulder, I'm picking up something funny over here. Lieutenant J.G. Tabitha Dombrowski, HMS Starwitch's junior tactical officer, had the heavy cruiser's combat information center watch, and she quirked one eyebrow as she looked in Sand's direction. Something funny wasn't how the competent and experienced tech normally reported his findings. What is it? Dombrowski asked, walking across CIC's relatively spacious compartment towards him. Then she snorted. 
Forget I asked that. I imagine that if you already knew what it was, you'd have told me, wouldn't you? I believe the lieutenant might reasonably assume that, ma'am, Sands replied gravely, but his eyes twinkled. Lieutenant Dombrowski had made fewer mistakes than quite a few JGs he'd known over the years, and she was more than willing to admit that even her enlisted personnel could probably teach her a thing or two. All right, I will, she told him as she reached his command station and looked over his shoulder. So what is it we haven't been able to ID? This, ma'am, Sans said more seriously. He indicated his readouts, and Dombrowski gazed thoughtfully at them. There wasn't much to see. Starwitch's division of obsolescent Star Knight-class heavy cruisers were conducting routine training exercises in preparation for deployment to Silesia. They'd been listed for disposal when the Battle of Manticore burst upon the RMN, at which point they'd been pulled back out of reserve and refitted for service, so they had more training to worry about than most. It might be argued that since they were headed for what had become an admittedly important but still strategically secondary assignment— and weren't even scheduled to leave for another two and a half weeks, there was no tearing urgency to the process. But Commodore James Tanner, Crew Div 114.1's commanding officer, didn't believe in letting last-minute details pile up. He'd gotten permission to conduct formation exercises in a conveniently empty area, well inside the hyperlimit, but above the ecliptic, which was what he'd been doing for the last three days. Between maneuvering and tactical exercises, each ship had been tasked with completing her own system tests, while there would still be time for the techs aboard Hephaestus to correct any faults before their scheduled departure as well. As part of her own tests, Starwitch had deployed half a dozen Ghost Rider recon platforms, and Sands was currently in charge of monitoring their telemetry, not that he'd really expected to find anything. All he was doing was to make certain CIC's computers and the drones were talking to each other properly, and a less experienced or conscientious rating probably would never have noticed the tiny scrap of transmission he'd picked up. Any idea who it's from? Dombrowski asked after a moment. I mean, who's out there on that bearing? That's what's funny about it, ma'am. Sand shrugged. It's directional as hell, and it originated from even further above the ecliptic than we are. As far as I can tell, there's nobody out there. No one according to any of our shipping logs, anyway. What do the computers make of it? Dombrowski's frown deepened. That's just coming up, Sand said as another display blinked. They both looked at it, and he pursed his lips in a silent whistle. That's one Damned big burst packet, ma'am, he said. Yeah, Dombrowski agreed. More to the point, though, we don't even recognize the encryption. Internal Andamani or something, ma'am? Sand sounded puzzled, but not yet really concerned, and Dombrowski shook her head grimly. Even if it's Andermani, whoever sent it wouldn't have used that encryption unless they wanted to keep anyone who happened to detect it from understanding it. And like you say, it's a big packet, and one coming from somewhere none of our people are supposed to be. But, Sands began, then shut his mouth rather firmly. I know what you're thinking, the lieutenant told him, and you've got a point. I don't know how anyone who's not supposed to be here could have gotten in either, Not how she could have gotten past perimeter security without being detected on the way in, anyway. And I may be jumping at shadows. All the same, though, this is something to be passed on to older and wiser heads, I think. She rested one approving hand lightly on Sand's shoulder for a moment, then keyed her headset. Commander Newkirk, she requested. Newkirk, a deep, slightly sleepy voice responded after a brief pause. Dombrowski, sir, in CIC, I'm sorry to disturb you, but we've just picked up something down here that makes me a little nervous. Nervous? Lieutenant Commander Gilderoy Newkirk's voice sharpened. As Starwitch's tactical officer, he was Dombrowski's immediate superior. She hadn't been aboard all that long, but he'd formed a positive opinion of her judgment. Yes, sir. It's a burst transmission. It's a big one. It looks like our platform crossed its path before we caught all of it, despite its compression. According to our shipping logs, there shouldn't be anyone at its apparent origination point either. And sir, 
It's encrypted, and we don't even recognize the encryption. Newkirk sat abruptly upright in bed. Inform the bridge immediately, he said sharply. Then screen Captain McMahon. Tell him I suggest he get up, get dressed, and meet me in CIC as soon as possible. Ah, uh, excuse me, my lady, Andrew LaFollet said with infinite politeness. But unless I'm mistaken, isn't Lady Clarissa's birthday today? Dr. Allison Chu Harrington, one of the Star Empire of Manticore's premier geneticists, looked up from the unhappy youngster on the changing table and gave Lord Raoul Alexander Harrington's personal armsman the sort of look which had been known to level tall mountains and reduce glaciers to steaming swamps. If you would like to shoulder your responsibilities as this young monster's guardian and change his diaper yourself, Colonel Andrew LaFollet, I'm sure we could facilitate things, she told him. Assassins, blades, bullets, and bombs come with the job, my lady, he replied solemnly. Diapers and the surprises they so often contain weren't listed anywhere when I signed up. Well, they should have been, she said, reaching for the cleansing tissue he extended to her. In fact, as both of them knew perfectly well, Allison had volunteered to change Raoul. It was, she said, a grandmother's duty. Besides, she liked babies, especially her own personal grandbabies, of which, as she had pointed out to her daughter upon occasion, she still had only one. Well, two, counting Catherine, of course. There, baby she said, sealing the clean diaper in place and scooping him up for tickling and an enthusiastic hug before she tucked him back into his onesie. All clean and fresh-smelling, for now at least. He gurgled happily and she laughed. Despite the volume of which he was capable, he was actually an extraordinarily even-tempered baby. He took particularly vocal exception to having his diapers changed for some reason, Yet other than that, he spent a lot more time being delighted with the universe than he did complaining about it. It had been 62 tea years and some change since Raoul's mother had been his age, but Allison didn't remember young Honor Harrington being quite as cheerful as he was. Then again, Honor hadn't met Nimitz until she was 12, and Raoul was, for all intents and purposes, being raised by tree cats as well as humans. God only knew where that was going to end up. I'll go give Jeremiah the heads up, La Follet told her, and she nodded. Sergeant Jeremiah Tenard was actually her daughter Faith's personal armsman, but the twins' armsmen frequently doubled up watching the kids so that one of them could keep an eye on her or Alfred, which was how he'd come to be assigned to Allison when she came ahead to Sphinx to reopen the Copper Wall's house, and how he'd become her limo pilot for this little junket as well. And they're so damned well-meaning and eager about it, I can't even work up a good mad, she thought. Even if it does sometimes make me feel like they think I'm another nine-year-old they have to keep track of. Lindsay? she called. Yes, milady. Lindsay Phillips, Raoul's nanny, poked her head into the nursery. I think we're ready, Allison told her. He smells better anyway. Milady, I could have done that, you know, Lindsay told her. Unless I'm mistaken, it's listed somewhere in my job description. No, is it? Allison smiled at the young woman, who was also Catherine Alexander Harrington's nanny, as she'd been for Faith and James Harrington as well. You mean that all these years, I could actually have had you changing diapers? As a matter of fact, you could have, Lindsay told her gravely. Ah, oh, if only I'd known... Lindsay chuckled and took Raoul, balancing him against her shoulder, and the two women walked out the nursery door and down the short hallway in the comfortable centuries-old house high in the Copper Wall Mountains. They paused on the veranda, gazing out across the dense green trees of Sphinx and the just visible blue flashes of the Tannerman Ocean far beyond and below them. A customized armored air limousine in the green livery of Harrington Steading sat on the parking circle, with La Follet and Sergeant Tenard talking beside it. Overhead, a pair of heavily armed sting ships circled patiently, and Allison shook her head. It was at moments like this, especially when all the security was focused here on the Harrington Freehold, which had been in her husband's family since the plague years, 
and which had been her own home since she returned with him to Manticore from Beowulf so many decades before, that the absurdity of the changes in her life snapped into crisp, unambiguous clarity. And it was also at moments like this that she found herself most wistfully wishing things hadn't gotten quite so complicated. But there's no point wishing, she reminded herself once again. And however complicated things may seem sometimes, you couldn't change any of it without changing all of it, and then where would you be? Somehow, I don't see you giving up Raoul or Catherine just to avoid having to put up with other people's schedules. Here we are, Andrew, she said, and Raoul's armsman turned and smiled at her. I hope we haven't really made you late, she said. Actually, we are running a little late, my lady, he said. But that's all right. Miranda just screened. It seems Faith had a little accident when they were leaving the landing house— Something to do with sliding down the grand staircase banister again. Oh, Lord. Allison rolled her eyes and Lindsay chuckled. Honor's younger sister was almost nine T years old, and she developed a veritable obsession for banisters after watching half a dozen tree cats go tobogganing gleefully down them. Thankfully, her twin brother James seemed to have avoided that particular mental aberration. It's all right, my lady, Andrew assured her. At least she didn't break anything this time. Would that be that she didn't break any portion of her own person, or that she didn't break anything else? Allison inquired, and the armsman chuckled. Neither in this case, he said. But she did manage to bloody her nose with predictable consequences for her clothes. So, what with picking her up, stopping the nosebleed, her father's discussion of questionable decisions, and then getting her changed, they missed their flight out of landing and had to rebook. They're in transit now, but Miranda says Lady Clarissa's pushed her party back an hour to give them time. I see. Allison shook her head. Well, by the time they get here, I'm sure Raoul will have come with another delay of his own, but until then, let's get your show on the road. Of course, my lady. The torpedoes were unaware that anyone had overheard their email. Not that they would have cared if they had known, of course. Nor were they particularly impressed by the meticulous precision, planning, and execution by their merely human masters, which had gotten the transmitting platforms into position to send it to them without any Manticoran ever spotting the MAN at it. They simply receded the portion of it which was addressed to them and ignored the rest. Special caps fitted to protect their sensors from particle erosion and micrometeorites during their long ballistic run into attack range were blown free while onboard artificial intelligences considered the updated targeting information and concluded that none of it required significant modification of their pre-launch instructions. Their targets were rather large, after all, and they'd already known exactly where to find them. The tricky part had been synchronizing the attack waves— Manticore A and Manticore B were far enough apart that even if the Manticoran's FTL station's range was great enough for transmissions between them, which seemed, to say the least, unlikely, it would take the better part of 13 minutes for word of what happened around one component of the binary system to reach the other. Because of that, Oyster Bay's planners had been willing to settle for only approximate coordination between those separate parts of the operation— Within the Manticore A subsystem, however, timing was far more critical. Although the planet's Manticore and Sphinx were well over 25 light minutes apart at the moment, it was imperative that all the attacks be executed in a time window too narrow to allow for any effective reaction by the system's defenders. And unlike certain members of the Solarian League Navy, the MAN had a very powerful respect for the Royal Manticoran Navy. Not only that... But as they'd studied and updated Oyster Bay's planning requirements, they'd become painfully aware that the Manticoran's reaction was going to be even faster and better coordinated than they'd originally allowed for, given the existence of their grav pulse communicators and how they'd undoubtedly upgraded their routine readiness postures in the wake of the Battle of Manticore. No doubt they'd based any changes on the need to defeat a repeat of any attack using known weapon systems, since one didn't normally make plans on the basis of threats one didn't know about. 
but the MAN had found that reflection less than completely reassuring. In the alignment strategist's opinion, it was generally a good idea to proceed with caution when one decided to march into a napping tigress's cave to steal her young, and so the initial deployment of Oyster Bay's weapons had been painstakingly planned and calculated, then carried out with meticulously rehearsed precision, none of which mattered at all to the weapons in question themselves. The 18 torpedoes heading the mic attack wave bound for the planet Manticore simply adjusted their courses very slightly, while those leading the Sierra attack, bound for the planet Sphinx, didn't even have to do that. Onboard passive sensors located the unmistakable emission signatures of their targets, and pre-attack testing signals began cascading through their systems. No, sir, Lieutenant Commander Newkirk said. I don't have any more idea what this could be or who it could have come from than Lieutenant Dombrowski has, but I think she did exactly the right thing by reporting it up the line. I agree entirely, Commodore Tanner replied. And I've already kicked a flash report up to perimeter security, but even with the Gravcom, it's going to be another couple of minutes before we hear anything back. If anyone has any powerful insights, I want to hear them now. The silence, Tanner reflected, was deafening. His comm display was divided into four quadrants, which were occupied, respectively, by the faces of Captain Matheson Marcos, the commanding officer of HMS Stardance, which also made him Tanner's flag captain, Captain Vince McMahon, Star Witch's CO, and both cruisers' senior tactical officers. Commander Alexandros Adriopoulos, Tanner's chief of staff, was physically present, still holding the mug of coffee he'd been sipping when Starwitch's emergency transmission came in 370 seconds previously. And none of them, obviously, had any insights at all, powerful or not. Fair's fair, Jim, he admonished himself. You know just as much as they do, and you don't have any brilliant analysis to offer either— except for the blindingly obvious point Newkirk already made, of course. So don't go taking your grumpy out on them. All right, he said out loud. A few things we can do on our own while we wait for perimeter security to get back to us. Commander Newkirk, your request to deploy additional Ghost Rider platforms is approved. Use however many you think you need, but try to find me whoever sent that transmission. Newkirk started to open his mouth, but Tanner's raised hand preempted anything the lieutenant commander had been about to say. I know, I'm asking you to find a very small needle in a very large haystack, commander. But we've got at least an approximate bearing, and I don't want that datum getting any older before we start trying to chase it down. Do your best. No one expects miracles. Yes, sir. Alexandros? The Commodore turned to his chief of staff. I think it's time we woke up the division's other skippers and tack officers. The more people we have looking for this, the better. And while I'm thinking about it, get a flash directly off to home fleet as well. I'm sure perimeter security will be keeping Admiral Higgins in the loop, but let's see if we can't cut the transmission time as much as possible. Yes, sir. In the meantime, Tanner continued, turning his attention to Marcos and McMahon. I think we should... Excuse me, sir. Tanner's eyes darted to Newkirk's image as the tactical officer's suddenly hoarse voice cut him off in mid-syllable. Newkirk looked as if he'd just been punched in the belly. The lieutenant commander was staring at something outside his comm pickup's field of view, and Tanner could actually see the color draining out of the younger man's face. Then Newkirk inhaled deeply and looked back at the Commodore. I think I knew what it was about, sir he said in a voice like crushed gravel. The mic attack torpedoes reached the proper point in space. They aligned themselves with finicky precision, double-checked and triple-checked their targeting, then fired. Every one of them activated in the space of a single second, and three seconds later, not one of them still existed. But their closing speed on their target was well over 70,000 kilometers per second, the target in question was completely unprotected by impeller wedge or sidewall, which increased their standoff range to the next best thing to a half million kilometers, and their approach vectors had been carefully calculated. One moment, the Manticore binary system was going about its routine business, peacefully and calmly. The next moment, 
18 powerful grazers ripped through Her Majesty's space station Hephaestus like demons, there was absolutely no warning. No time to bring up the station's spherical sidewall, or to evacuate, or don skin suits, or set internal pressure security. There was no time at all, as that devastating wave of destruction struck like a chainsaw hitting an egg. Despite the provision of her sidewall generators, Hephaestus had never truly been intended or designed to survive that sort of attack. Even if its builders had ever dreamed in their worst nightmares that something like it was a real possibility, it would have been physically impossible to structure and armor the station to face it. But none of those builders had ever really imagined something like this getting past perimeter security and home fleet actually reaching attack range of the Star Empire's capital planet without so much as being challenged, and so no one had even tried. For that matter, there'd never been a single comprehensive construction or expansion plan of any sort for Hephaestus. The station had simply grown, steadily and inevitably, adding additional lobes and habitats, cargo platforms, personnel sections, heavy fabrication modules, shipyards, as they were required taking advantage of the flexibility microgravity made possible, expanding into a huge, lumpy agglomeration of raw industrial power, which had its own peculiar beauty as it floated in orbit, by far the brightest single object in the planet Manticore's night skies. It stretched over 110 kilometers along its central spine, and tentacles reached out in every direction, some of them the better part of 40 or even 50 kilometers long in their own right. It boasted a permanent population of over 950,000. By the time transients, ship crews, field trips by visiting schoolchildren, and other visitors were added, the station's total population on any given day was certainly upward of a million, and probably close to twice that on most days. Yet for all its sheer size, all the industrial processes churning away in and about it, Hephaestus was a fragile structure a fairy tale construct which could never have survived its own weight inside a planetary gravity field, and which was certainly far too frail to survive Holocaust when it came. Chapter 29 No one ever managed to accurately reconstruct exactly what happened during the first few seconds of the attack. There was simply too much mayhem, too much chaos. And despite the multitude of sensor systems, civilian as well as military, operating throughout the inner system, no one was looking in the right direction when it all began. Had anyone been in a position to chart the damage, however, they would have known that the very first hit, first by almost an entire tenth of a second, struck compartment HF 1-17-1336-T-1219 of HMSS Hephaestus. HF 1-17-1336-T-1219 was the control section of module GM-HF 1-17-13, a general manufacturing module attached to the Royal Manticoran Navy shipyard HF 1-16 and shipyard HF 1-17, which were currently assigned to Buship's Refit and Repair Command, Hephaestus. HF-1-16 happened to be empty, awaiting the arrival of the brand-new Nike-class battlecruiser HMS Truculent later that afternoon. HF-1-17, on the other hand, was occupied by the Roland-class destroyers HMS Barbarossa, HMS Saladin, and HMS Yamamoto Date, all three of which were completing their final fitting out, with almost their full complements embarked. The 32 technicians manning HF 1-17-1336-T-1219 never even realized the station was under attack. Working in a shirt-sleeve environment, concentrating on routine tasks and the hectic pace at which Hephaestus always operated, they were totally unprepared for the ravening blast of focused gamma radiation, which killed them instantly, splintered the compartment around them, and ripped open one entire flank of GM-HF 1-17-13. At the instant it fired, the torpedo which struck the control section was moving at the next best thing to 70,000 kps, and deliberately yawing on its axis, sweeping its grazer in a spiraling cone to traverse the entire volume of the station. The beam itself moved away from GM-HF 1-17-13, but the lethal overpressure of the explosion shock front, 
followed by equally explosive decompression, killed the 16 techs working directly in the 20,000-ton fabrication module almost as quickly as the control room techs had died. Splinters of HF 1-17-1336-T-1219 blew into and through GM-HF 1-17-13, carried all the way across the module compartment, and opened the far bulkhead into the vacuum of HF 1-17. The second breach of the fabrication module could scarcely have mattered less to the people who'd been working inside it, since they were all already dead or dying by the time it occurred. It mattered a great deal, however, to the 48 space station personnel moving through the outsized boarding tubes, connecting the three destroyers' main airlocks to the space dock gallery and the station proper. None of them were in skin suits when the flying battle axes, which had once been part of GM-HF 1-17-13, shredded the tubes and spilled them into the enormous docking bay's merciless vacuum. As the boarding tubes were torn apart, atmosphere vented from them in a hurricane. GM-HF 1-17-13 had already decompressed almost entirely, but the vacuum around the station sucked greedily at the wounds, and at least a quarter of the equally unprepared crewmen aboard the three destroyers found themselves in death pressure before emergency blast doors slammed shut under computer control. As it happened, the blast doors made no difference at all, however. Even as the grazer which had ripped HF 1-17-1336-T-1219 moved away, cutting deeper towards the station's central spine, another grazer moved towards HF 1-17 and HF 1-16. It sliced across both shipyards in a searing eye blink, and if it was less powerful than a Shrike's weapon, its power was more than ample for the minor task of cutting an unarmored destroyer, unprotected by impeller wedge or sidewalls, cleanly in half. It did precisely that to HMS Saladin, whose fusion plant abruptly lost containment with absolutely no warning to the engineering safety systems. Not even cybernetic reflexes were equal to that sort of cataclysmic failure— and the resulting fireball made whatever other damage the torpedoes might have done to that section of HMSS Hephaestus totally superfluous. HMS Longshoreman, one of Hephaestus's ready-duty tugs, was headed away from the station, towing the brand-new Saganami C-Class cruiser Jessica Rice towards traffic control's impeller limit when the attack came in. The two ships were accelerating at the piddling rate of barely ten gravities, out of deference to the fact that Jessica Rice was on internal grav plates only, since her inertial compensator was inoperable without the impeller wedge traffic regulations forbade her in such close proximity to the station. They were well clear of the ship in which Jessica Rice had been berthed, but that didn't matter. One of the Mason torpedoes scored a direct hit on the station's spine, slashing outward and across successive secondary axes in a horrendous bow wave of secondary blasts and explosive decompressions. It reached the outer edge of the station and kept right on going until it ripped lengthwise across Jessica Rice's unarmored topsides, shattering the big, powerful ship. And then she, like Saladin, blew up. The explosion disabled Longshoreman's after-impeller ring, sending her wedge into automatic shutdown, and leaving her unprotected as a chunk of what had once been HMSS Hephaestus, which outmassed the tug by at least 50%, slammed into her and destroyed her completely. Jesus Christ! Lieutenant Edouard Boivin, executive officer of HMS Stevedore, looked up in surprise at Senior Chief Petty Officer Oksana Karpova's exclamation. The senior chief had primary helm control for the powerful tug's approach to Hephaestus, and that sort of outburst from her was unheard of. Boivin opened his mouth to demand an explanation, but nothing came out. As he looked up, he saw the same visual display Karpova and her backup helmsman had been watching, and his vocal cords froze. He felt himself sitting there, unable to look away, unable even to speak, as the entire space station blew apart before him. It was impossible for his stunned brain to pick individual explosions out of the chaos of devastation ripping across the station. Bits and pieces of it registered with horrifying clarity, not then, but for later replay in the nightmares which would plague him for years. Individual modules blown loose from their moorings, 
spraying across the backdrop of incandescent explosions like fragile backlit beads before the wavefront of destruction reached out and engulfed them as well. The pieces of a heavy cruiser, her spine broken, spinning end over end and breaking up into smaller bits as they spun. A construction ship, underway on reaction thrusters, vanishing into the fiery vortex's maw. Those tiny vignettes, snapshot images of catastrophe's outriders, would come back to him in those nightmares. But all that registered at the moment was the sheer impossibility of what he was seeing. There wasn't even room for horror, not in those first fleeting seconds. The unbelievability of it would be the first and forever most overwhelming impression of any of the surviving witnesses, their sheer incredulity. Yet even though Edouard Boivin couldn't look away, the ingrained acquired reflexes of relentless training moved the thumb of his right hand to a button on his command chair's armrest, and Stevedore's emergency signal blared from speakers throughout the ship. Not really a problem, Admiral. Oh, it sounded like it was going to be a bear, but once I started looking into it, it was only a scheduling snafu. Captain Karamat Fonzarelli, refit and repair senior officer aboard Hephaestus, said. Rear Admiral Margaret Truman, Hephaestus's CO, nodded. She'd suspected it was something like that, but it was a relief to hear she'd been right. I've been on the screen to logistics about it, Fonzarelli continued from his end of the comlink. According to them, it's mostly a question of when and where we want the spares delivered, so I told them to— Truman's display went abruptly blank. Her eyebrows were still only beginning to rise in surprise when another torpedo's grazer sawed directly through her quarters and her. Look, Daddy, what's that? John Cabezadas was struggling with his carry-on bag. The damned thing's strap insisted on twisting, especially when he was carrying Serafina. The 16-month-old was usually as good as gold, but of course, whenever he was having trouble with the carry-on bag, she was inevitably fretful. He'd just decided he was going to have to hand her to his wife, Laura, when his older daughter, Jennifer, asked the question. I don't know, he told her, unable to entirely keep the irritation out of his voice. The girl was incredibly bright and even more curious than most nine-year-olds, and she'd been one question after another ever since their shuttle delivered them to Hephaestus. To be honest, much as he loved her and happy as her keen-wittedness normally made him, John was looking forward to getting her settled aboard the ship to Beowulf, where there'd be no convenient windows and she could ask her questions of the ship's library. "'What are you talking—' he began— turning and looking through the transparent wall of the personnel tube, which had been provided to give tourists a panoramic view of the station's huge bulk. He never finished the question. There wasn't time. There was barely enough time for him to begin to reach for Jennifer, to feel Laura and 12-year-old Miguel at his back, to experience the first terrible flicker of a father's utter helplessness, and then the explosion tore the tube apart around them. I am so friggin' tired of worrying about the Mantis tender damn sensibilities, Jacqueline Rivera groused. Rivera had never been a great admirer of the Star Empire of Manticore's pretensions to grandeur, even before this latest crisis had blown up, and she deeply resented the front office's insistence that she tone down her usual commentary. It wasn't simply that she disagreed with corporate editorial policy— she had, in this case, but that hadn't been the real cause of her current ire. No, what she'd resented was being reminded of editorial policy by some executive assistant producer, who probably owed her position solely to the fact that she was someone's cousin-in-law or current live-in lover, as if Jacqueline were some unknown newbie and not one of Solarian News Service's senior reporters. So, all right, she might have been hitting just a little harder at questions about the credibility of the Manti version of events in Talbot than corporate might have preferred, once the great Audrey O'Hanrahan herself backed off. Sure, it was true, St. Audrey had urged everyone to reserve judgment, especially now that the authenticity of the official New Tuscany report to which she'd gained access had been called into question by Solarian reporters actually in Talbot. And, of course, she might have a point when she'd argued that the Mantis' enemies might have fed it to her 
as part of a clever, deliberate disinformation campaign. It was even possible the Mason System Authority's claims about the Green Pines terrorist attack were fabrications, although Rivera damned well knew better than that. She'd filed three good casts on that very point, as a matter of fact, which was why corporate had sent her out to Manticore and told her to make nice while she was here, the stinking bastards. More flies with honey indeed. The damned mantis had finally come out into the open, proving they'd always funded and supported those murdering ballroom bastards, just as Rivera had always known they were doing, and this was the time to go for the jugular, not demonstrate journalistic impartiality and detachment. Calm down, Jackie, Manfred O'Neill, her longtime recording tech, said pacifically. It's hardly the end of the world. After all, this is the story at the moment. Oh, yeah? Rivera glared at him. Look, you may think they sent us out here to do us some kind of favor, but I know better. We could have been covering Green Pines instead, damn it. Never said anyone did it to do us a favor, O'Neill replied cheerfully. I only said it's going to turn out to be the hot corner, and it is. Hotter than Green Pines, for that matter, especially if there's anything to these new rumors from Spindle. Everybody's already pretty much mined Green Pines out, and it's not like the system authorities are hunting out any fresh info anyway, but there's going to be lots of stuff coming through here if things really are going to hell for the Mantis in Talbot, and when it does, I don't think anyone back home is going to be worrying a lot about reminding us to watch our P's and Q's when we report it. Rivera looked at him for a moment, then felt at least a little of her resentment easing away. Manny had a way of cutting to the heart of things, and maybe he had a point. Not that it changed the fact that... The Mason Grazer, which incinerated passenger concourse Green 317, terminated Jacqueline Rivera's reflections upon her career prospects, along with her, Manfred O'Neill, and 419 other arriving passengers from the Hauptmann Line starship Starlight. Approximately three hundredths of a second later, Starlight, her crew of 28, and the 200 through passengers to Sphinx, who hadn't disembarked, followed them into destruction. Is Aikawa back aboard yet, Ben? Anston Fitzgerald asked as his steward poured him a second cup of coffee. No, sir, steward first class Benjamin Frankel replied with a smile. He's not due back until this afternoon, I believe. Hmm. Fitzgerald frowned thoughtfully. Hexapuma would be in the yard dog's hands for at least another three or four weeks, but she'd just been assigned a trio of bright, shiny new midshipmen. Frightening as the concept seemed in some ways, he decided to ask Aikawa Kagiyama to take them under his wing. He was confident Aikawa would rise to his responsibilities and set them a good example. Of course he was. He snorted in amusement at his own thoughts, but he couldn't really deny that a part of him was actually a little relieved at having at least another few hours before he found out whether or not his confidence was justified. Well, in that case, HMS Hexapuma blew up with all hands as the Mason Grazer ripped across her fusion plant. The destruction of HMSS Hephaestus was, for all intents and purposes, total in the first three seconds of the Mason attack. Some of the surviving fragments of the station were large enough and sufficiently intact to hold pressure, and a handful of the ships which had been docked survived more or less in one piece. Three of them, the destroyer Horatius, the Grayson freighter Foxglove, and the tug Bollard, actually came through the Holocaust virtually undamaged, Horatius's paint wasn't even scratched. But they were the exception to the rule, tiny pockets of survival in a hurricane of devastation, and the attack on HMSS Vulcan was equally successful. The MAN's Sierra attack wasn't quite perfectly synchronized with the Mike attack's assault on Hephaestus, but the delay was less than four seconds. By the time visual evidence of what had happened to Hephaestus could have reached Vulcan, moving at the limited velocity of light, Sphinx's space station had been just as completely demolished. Between the two space stations alone, the first ten seconds of Oyster Bay had already cost the old Star Kingdom over four million dead. 
Alan Higgins' face was parchment pale as he stared at the FTL platform-driven Flagbridge master plot. It was only chance he'd been on the Flagbridge at all, but that coincidence wasn't much help, as CIC's computers emotionlessly updated the plot. Homefleet was much too far away from either space station to have offered any sort of protection even if it had realized the attack was coming, or been able to see it when it did. Because it was, it was also too far away to be attacked, and in some ways that made it far worse. The people who were supposed to protect the Star Empire, who were supposed to die to prevent something like this from ever happening, were perfectly placed to see exactly how totally they'd failed in that purpose, and the fact that it wasn't even remotely their fault meant nothing at all beside that terrible sense of failure. And for Alan Higgins, their CO, it was even worse than it was for the rest of them. For a moment, he was paralyzed, his mind replaying the memories of Grendelsbane with merciless clarity. Yet that lasted only for a moment, only until he realized how infinitely much worse this disaster was. And then the conventional Mason missiles began their attack runs. Daniel Detweiler's researchers hadn't yet figured out how to fit multiple full-size, sustainable drives into a single missile of manageable dimensions. They had, however, realized what the RMN must have done, and they were working industriously to duplicate the Manticoran advantage. In the meantime, they'd come up with the Cataphract, a variant of their own based on taking the standard missile bodies for the SLN's new generation anti-ship missiles and adding what amounted to a separate final stage carrying a standard laser head and a counter-missiles drive system. For Oyster Bay, they'd brought out the longest-ranged, heaviest version of their new weapon, fitted the birds into outsized pods, then launched them behind other specialized pods, which carried nothing but low-powered particle screens and the power supplies to maintain them for the ballistic run in system to their targets. The missile-laden pods had followed in the zone swept by the shield-equipped platforms. Now they completed their own system checks and began to launch. A version of the new weapon had been used with lethal effectiveness against Luis Rozak ships at the Second Battle of Congo. Unfortunately, the full report on that wasn't available to the RMN. They knew something had improved the range of the missiles which had been provided to the People's Navy in exile, and they'd managed to deduce approximately how it had been done, but that was about it. And even if they'd had access to Rozak's report, it wouldn't have fully prepared them for this. Rozak had faced the Cataphract A, based on the SLN's new cruiser-destroyer Spatha ship killer. The pod-launched missiles of Oyster Bay were Cataphract Cs, based on the capital ship Trebuchet, with much heavier and more powerful laser heads. The combined package had a powered range from rest of over 16 million kilometers and a terminal velocity of better than 0.49 c. That attack envelope would have made it formidable enough by itself, but installing the high-speed drive as the last stage also gave it far more agility when it came to penetrating the target's defenses during its terminal maneuvers. That agility, however, was scarcely required today. There were no active defenses, just as their targets made no attempt at evasive maneuvers because no one knew they were coming in time to react. There was time for their targets, or some of them at least, to realize they were under attack, to see the impossible impeller signatures of missile drives swarming away from the pod's ballistic tracks. Some of those missiles were effectively wasted because of targeting decisions made by officers who hadn't felt justified in relying solely upon the efficacy of the as-yet-untested torpedoes. Those laser heads either never fired at all, or else used themselves up picking off chunks of wreckage large enough to satisfy their targeting criteria. But the vast majority of them had other concerns. There really weren't many of them, given the number of targets they had to cover, but it didn't take very many to kill targets as naked as these. They roared in on the carefully plotted positions of the totally unprotected orbital shipyards floating around Manticore and Sphinx with devastating effectiveness. Bomb-pumped lasers ripped deep, mangling and shattering, spewing bits and pieces of the Star Empire of Manticore's industrial might across the heavens, and behind them came the old-fashioned nuclear warheads, warheads which detonated only if they were unable to obtain a hard kinetic kill. 
Fireballs glared like brief-lived, intolerably bright stars, flashing in stroboscopic spikes of devastation, and more thousands of highly skilled workers and highly trained naval personnel died in those cataclysmic bubbles of plasma and radiation. Within a total space of barely 11 minutes, both of the Star Empire's major orbital industrial nodes and well over 90% of its dispersed shipyards, along with the better part of 5.5 million trained technicians and naval personnel, and all too often their families, had been wiped out of existence. By any yardstick anyone cared to use, it was the most devastating surprise attack in the history of the human race, and it wasn't over yet. Bring her heart to port, Chief. Fifty degrees, now! Fifty degrees, aye, sir, Chief Petty Officer Manitoba Jackson acknowledged, and HMSK turned sharply. Bring her to... Lieutenant Commander Andrew Sugimatsu, KCO, stabbed a look at his maneuvering plot. Five hundred and ten gravities and layer on her side. Put our belly towards any wreckage with our name on it. Rolling ship and coming to five one zero gravities, I sir. Jackson's voice was flattened and stunned, as if actual awareness was seeping past the sheer shock effect of such unmitigated disaster. Sugimatsu gave him a sharp look. The CPO had been in the Navy almost as long as Sugimatsu had been alive, but he'd spent his entire service as one of the highly skilled specialists assigned to the management of the home system's tugs. He'd never actually seen combat, unlike Sugimatsu, and what he was seeing at this moment was the massacre of people he'd known and worked with for decades. The lieutenant commander would have trusted Jackson's nerve and composure in the face of any conceivable natural disaster— but there was nothing natural about this, and Sugimatsu spent a brief moment being grateful that CPO Leslie Meyerson, Kay's second helmswoman, was a combat vet. Sir, another voice said from the other side of Kay's small bridge, there's going to be a lot of wreckage coming this way pretty darn soon. I'm well aware of that, Truida, Sugimatsu said. He looked across at Lieutenant Truida Verstappen, his executive officer. The problem, he continued, is that anything coming our way is also coming the planet's way, and unless I'm really badly mistaken, we're all that's in a position to intercept it. Verstappen looked at him for a moment, then nodded as he confirmed what she'd already realized must be his intentions. Get ready with the tractors, Sugimatsu told her. No way we can catch all this crop with the wedge, so we're going to have to roll back down and grab the bigger pieces that get past us before they hit atmosphere. We've only got six tractors, Verstappen pointed out quietly. Then we're just going to have to hope there are only six pieces big enough to survive re-entry, Sugimatsu said grimly. Even as he said it, he knew they would never be that lucky, not after something like this. Kay drove sideways, accelerating hard to put herself directly between the wreckage of HMSS Vulcan and the planet Sphinx. As Sugimatsu had observed, she was the only ship in a position to intercept the avalanche about to come crashing down on the planet. Most of the station's wreckage might be small enough to be completely destroyed when it hit atmosphere, but some of it definitely wasn't going to be. In fact, some of it was going to be solid hunks of battle steel armor, specifically designed and manufactured to resist direct hits by capital ship range energy weapons. The good news, such as it was and what there was of it, was that at least half the wreckage which had been blasted out of Vulcan's orbit had been blown outward, not inward. There'd be plenty of time for someone to deal with it before it became a threat to anyone, and most of the planet-bound wreckage was clustered in a fairly tight pattern which gave Sugimatsu the chance to put Kay directly in the center of the debris track, using the tug's impeller wedge as a huge broom or shield. Anything that hit the wedge would no longer be a problem— that, in fact, had been one of the unspoken reasons there were always ready-duty tugs on call at each of the space stations. If necessary, they were supposed to interpose their wedges to protect the stations against collision or attack. Well, that part of the plan didn't work out so well, did it? Sugimatsu thought grimly. But maybe we can still do a little something for the planet. The problem was that the wedge wasn't big enough. Fairly tight pattern was a purely relative term, unfortunately— especially when one used it in relation to something the size of HMSS Vulcan and a planet, and while his present course would take Kay directly through the central, densest portion of the wreckage stream, he couldn't possibly intercept all of it. 
nor could he come around in time for a second pass, even with the tug's enormous acceleration rate. He simply couldn't kill speed fast enough. So one pass was all he got, that and his ship's half-dozen powerful tractors, and a lot of those chunks of debris were bigger, much bigger in some cases, than Kay herself. He punched a button on his command chair's arm. Engineering, a voice rasped in his earbug. It's going to be ugly, Harland, he told his engineer quietly. No way in hell are we going to be able to catch all of it on the wedge, so make damn sure the tractors are up and ready. Understood, Lieutenant Harlan Wingate acknowledged. As Kay's engineer, he was also the tug's towmaster. You do realize, though, he continued, that my instrumentation down here isn't designed to grab ships that aren't trying to help me grab them. I understand, Sugematsu told him. We're just going to have to do our best. I'm putting Truida in charge of tracking and evaluation. She'll tell you which ones to grab and where they are. I can use all the help I can get, Wingate said grimly. Then he paused for a moment. Should I try emergency overpower? He asked. Sugimatsu started to reply, then paused. He knew what Wingate was asking. The tug's tractors were powerful enough that they had to be handled with great care under normal circumstances. Too much power, too much torque, and they could rip chunks right out of the ship they were supposed to be towing. In fact, under the wrong circumstances, they could destroy a ship outright. So what Wingate was really asking was whether or not he should deliberately redline the tractors and try to shred the wreckage into pieces too small to survive atmospheric entry. He might or might not succeed in any given case. A lot depended on the exact composition and structural strength of any piece of debris. But if he did succeed, that would be one more piece of wreckage, one more kinetic projectile Kay could try to stop. And if he pushes the tractors that hard, there's a damn good chance he'll burn them out and we'll lose something we might have stopped. Andrew Sugimatsu's jaw muscles clenched. He'd seen combat, he'd expected to see it again, but he'd never expected to find himself having to make this kind of call in the very skies of one of his star nation's inhabited planets. He thought for an eternity all of three or four seconds long, then... Crank the bastards to max, he said harshly. The people who'd planned Oyster Bay had carefully arranged their attack to avoid anything that could be construed as a direct attack on the planetary populations of Manticore or Sphinx. Given the nature of the war they were planning to fight, it wasn't because the MAN had any particular objection to killing as many Manticorans as possible, but there was that bothersome little matter of the Eridani Edict, and while it was probably going to take a while for anyone to figure out who'd carried out the attack and how, that anonymity wasn't going to last forever. Eventually, the fact that the MAN and its allies were the only people who'd had the technical capability to do it was going to become obvious. There were plans in place to prevent the Manticorans from returning the compliment once they figured out who was to blame, but the Mason Alignment's diplomatic strategies could be very seriously damaged if anyone figured out too soon how little the Eridani Edict truly meant to it. That was the real reason the primary destruction of the space stations had been left to the torpedoes, which had overflown the planets well clear of them. The follow-up laserheads had come in on a similar trajectory, but some of the planners had argued against using any of them. Despite all the safeguards built into their guidance systems, there was always the chance, however remote, that one of them was going to ram into the planet at relativistic speeds. And, the critics had pointed out, if that happened, the alignment's opponents would inevitably claim it had been deliberate. The final distribution of fire had been a compromise between those who distrusted the torpedo's ability to do the job and those who wanted no missiles anywhere near either of the inhabited planets. And as was the definition of any compromise, neither side had been completely satisfied. But however careful they'd been to avoid direct attacks on the planets, none of them had lost any sleep over the possibility of indirect damage from the bits and pieces of wreckage raining down into the planet's gravity wells. That was something totally beyond any attacker's ability to control, and no one could possibly question the fact that the space stations had been legitimate military targets. 
Under those circumstances, the Eridani Edict's prohibition against deliberate attacks on planetary populations had no bearing. So if a few thousand or a few hundred thousand mantis were unfortunate enough to get vaporized when a 50,000-ton chunk of wreckage landed on top of their town, well, making omelets was always hard on a few eggs. What? Andrew LaFollet snapped upright in his seat, one hand pressed to his earbug. Allison Harrington had been concentrating on her grandson and the bottle he was industriously draining, but the sharp incredulity of the colonel's tone whipped her head around towards him. He was listening intently, and she thought she could actually see the color draining out of his face. Then he stabbed the button that connected him to the pilot's position. Get us on the ground, Jeremiah, now! He listened for a moment, then nodded. All right, if we're that close to town, but get us there fast. He let go of the button, and as he turned to face Allison, she felt the limo's sudden acceleration pushing her back in her seat. What is it, Andrew? She asked, arms tightening instinctively around Raoul. I'm not sure, my lady, not yet. There's a lot of confusion on the emergency channels, but... He paused, visibly gathering himself. But it sounds like the system is under attack. What? Allison looked at him blankly, which, as anyone who knew her could have attested, was not her customary response. Someone's attacked Hephaestus and Vulcan, my lady, he said flatly. I don't know how, but it sounds like the damage is going to be heavy, and I want you out of the air and on the ground somewhere safe. Alfred and the kids, she said suddenly, her face tightening, but he shook his head quickly. They ought to be almost exactly halfway between Manticore and Sphinx, my lady, and it sounds like this has to be an attack on our orbital infrastructure. It's not another fleet battle, anyway, and I don't think anyone's going to be wasting firepower on a local puddle jumper that isn't even particularly close to either planet. Allison stared at him, then swallowed harshly as she realized he was almost certainly correct. Thank you, she said quietly. Kay hurtled across the wreckage stream, spilling down from orbit. Her sensor's view was restricted, but she had more than enough coverage out the sides of her wedge for Truita Verstappen to know the belly band wasn't getting it all. She'd set up her computers to tag everything that crossed the sensor's field of view, and Kay's cybernetic brain began plotting descent curves. They could only be approximate until the tug turned and brought her powerful forward radar and LIDAR into action, but at least Lieutenant Verstappen would know where to start looking. Had anyone been in a position to actually watch, they would have seen HMSK slash into the heart of the wreckage. Despite the impenetrability of the wedge itself, it was still a high-risk move. Sugematsu had to get deep enough into the stream to intercept the most dangerous chunks of it, and that meant intersecting its path late enough that quite a few major pieces of debris were actually swept into the open throat of K's wedge. He'd counted on that, since he couldn't avoid it anyway— and it didn't matter whether a piece of wreckage hit an impeller wedge on its way in or on its way out. What did matter was the distinct possibility that Kay might strike one of those pieces on its way through. The odds were against it. On the scale of the tug's overpowered wedge, both she and even a very large piece of wreckage were actually rather small objects in a relatively large volume. But the odds weren't as much against it as he could have wished, and he realized he was holding his breath. Something large, jagged, and broken, it looked in the fleeting glimpse he had as if it were probably at least half of a heavy fabrication module, which must have massed the better part of 35,000 tons, went screaming past Kay's prow and impacted on the inner surface of her wedge's roof, or rather was ripped into very, very, very tiny bits and pieces in the instant it entered the zone in which local gravity went from effectively zero to several hundred thousand gravities in a space of barely five meters. The ship shuddered and bucked as other multi-ton chunks of Vulcan shattered bones slammed into her wedge. Not even her inertial compensator could completely damp the consequences of that much transferred momentum without shaking her crew like a terrier with a rat but she'd been built with generous stress margins for a moment just like this one, and she came out the other side intact, already turning to bring tracking systems and tractors to bear on whatever had gotten past her. Verstappen's hands flew over her console. If she'd only had more time, 
time to really evaluate the wreckage before they physically intercepted it, she would have been far better placed to prioritize threats. As it was, she had to do it on the fly, and perspiration beaded her forehead. At their velocity, even with the range of a tug's tractors, they had only seconds, no more than a minute or two maximum, before their velocity would carry them too far from the debris to do any good. Take the cue, Harland, she barked, pressing the key that locked in her best estimate of threat potentials, and down in engineering, Harland Wingate and his two assistants went frantically to work. Kay's tractors stabbed out, no longer powerful, carefully modulated hands making gentle contact with other ships, but deliberately overpowered demons, ripping and rending, striking with so much transfer energy that even enormous pieces of debris shattered. In the 103 seconds they had to work, those tractors destroyed 18 potentially deadly shards of Her Majesty's space station Vulcan. Four more looming projectiles were dragged bodily after Kay as she went streaking away from her intercept. There would have been more, but two of her tractors had burned out under the abuse. Given how little time Kay had been given, she and her crew did a magnificent job. But magnificent isn't always enough. Several large pieces got past her, including three at least the size of cruisers, accompanied by a trailing shower of smaller bits and pieces, trailing a deorbiting arc across the daylight side of Sphinx. Sphinx's gravity produced an atmosphere which was shallower, flatter than that of most planets humanity had settled, and the wreckage of what had once been HMSS Vulcan, some with personnel still trapped aboard, hit the boundary of that atmosphere at an altitude of 95 kilometers. The first impactor struck the planetary surface 20 seconds later, even closing at a paltry 8 kilometers per second, barely 25 times the speed of sound at local sea level, the fragments were wrapped in a sheath of plasma as they shrieked downward. Not all the debris Kay had missed reached the surface, of course, but even those chunks that never struck the ground transferred their kinetic energy to the atmosphere, creating bow waves of plasma, and then a sequence of air bursts along the entire length of their descent paths, sparking forest fires and flattening anything beneath them. Twenty seconds it took. Twenty seconds of shrieking, incandescent fury— of superheated air exploding outwards in demonic shockwaves, 20 seconds of seething violence howling its way down the heavens. There was no one to backstop Kay. The only armed aircraft which could possibly have reached any of those pieces in time were the sting ship's flying escort on Allison Harrington's air limo, and there was too much confusion for anyone to get word to them quickly enough. Even if there hadn't been, they carried no weapons powerful enough to have destroyed such massive kinetic hammers. Multiple fragments, two of them massing between 200 and 300,000 tons each, slammed into the icy waters of the Tannerman Ocean. The resulting impact surge would kill over 10,000 people in dozens of small coastal towns and inflict billions of dollars worth of damage. But that was the good news. Twenty seconds was far too little warning to do any good, too little time for anyone to react. Alarms were only beginning to sound in the city of Yawata Crossing, emergency messages only starting to hit the public information channels, when an even larger impactor, 300,000 tons of wreckage, the size of one of the old Star Knight-class heavy cruisers, struck approximately five and a half kilometers from the exact center of the city of one and a quarter million people, with an effective yield of better than two megatons. The three follow-on strikes by fragments in the 40,000-ton range were barely even noticeable. Andrew LaFollet moved suddenly. Allison had been staring out the limo's window, her brain whirling as she tried to process the impossible information. She wasn't even looking in LaFollet's direction. In fact, her attention had been drawn by a brilliant flash somewhere out to sea ahead of the limo, and so she was taken completely by surprise when he snatched Raoul out of her arms. She started to turn her head, but La Follet hadn't even paused. Raoul began a howl of protest, but it was cut off abruptly as La Follet shoved the baby into the special carrier affixed to the mounting pedestal of Allison's chair, the one which would normally have been Honor's if Honor had been present. The internal tractor net locked down around the infant instantly, gentle and yet implacably powerful, and La Follet slammed the lid. 
That carrier had been designed and built by the same firm that built and designed life support modules for tree cats, and every safety feature human ingenuity could come up with had been designed into it. Allison was just starting to come upright in her own chair, her eyes wide, when La Follet stepped back and hit a button. Allison's shoulder harness yanked tight with brutal, bruising force, and battle steel panels snapped out of the limo's bulkheads and overhead, sealing her and the baby in a heavily armored shell. A fraction of a second later, the blast panel blew out, and the shell went spinning away from the limo under its built-in emergency countergrav. La Follet hit a second button, and Lindsay Phillips's chair followed Allison's. Then he jumped for his own chair and reached for the third emergency ejection button. Blackrock Clan was one of the older Tree Cat clans. Not so old as Brightwater Clan, from whence it had originally sprung, perhaps, but certainly of respectable antiquity. It was a large clan, too, one which had been growing steadily over the last double hand of turnings. The hunting was good, here in the western picket wood of the mountains the two legs called the Copper Walls. The gardening tricks the two legs had taught the people helped as well, and Black Rock had learned to look forward to the regular visits of the Forestry Service's doctors, which had kept so many of their young from dying in kittenhood. But for all that, Black Rock Clan, like most Tree Cat clans, kept largely to itself. There were no two legs living in Black Rock's immediate vicinity, and so there was no one to tell the people what had happened in the black emptiness so far beyond their sky. And perhaps that was just as well. At least none of the people realized what was about to happen. Chapter 30 The men and women in the conference room rose in a spontaneous gesture of respect as Queen Elizabeth III came through the door. The Queen normally had little use for such formalities— in fact, they usually irritated her since it was her opinion that all of them, including her, had better things to be doing with their time. But today she simply nodded back to them and crossed without speaking to her own chair. She carried Ariel in her arms, and Prince Consort Justin walked at her side. Justin's own tree cat Monroe rode on his shoulder, and the cat's flattened ears, the way Monroe's tail wrapped around his person's throat, reflected the dark emotional aura of the room entirely too well. Justin pulled back the queen's chair and seated her before he sat at his own place. The tree cats arranged themselves along the backs of their chairs, settling with tightly coiled tension, and then the standing officers and civilians followed the prince consort's example. For a small eternity, the silence was total, and Elizabeth surveyed the faces of her most senior advisors and ministers. She didn't need honor's empathic sense to know what all those people were feeling. None were the sort to panic, yet in many ways the horrifying impact of what happened had hit them even harder than the general public. For the public as a whole, the shocked disbelief, the stunned incomprehension, was its own anesthesia, for now at least. That was going to change, and given human nature, all too many of the old Star Kingdom subjects were going to blame her and, even more, the men and women sitting around this conference table with her. Rational or not, it was going to happen. Elizabeth knew that, just as she knew that entirely too many of those advisors and ministers already blamed themselves. And just as she knew the shock of the totally unanticipated cataclysm which had descended upon them had been made incomparably worse by coming so closely on the heels of the news from Spindle. In her worst nightmares, she would never have believed Manticore's prospects could be so catastrophically shifted in barely three T days. She knew how mentally and emotionally paralyzing that body blow had been for her, she suspected that even she couldn't imagine how stunning and traumatizing it had been for the men and women directly responsible for the Star Empire's defense. All right, she said finally, her voice level. I already know it's bad. Tell me how bad. She looked around the circle of faces, and her brown eyes settled inevitably upon one of them. Hamish, she said quietly. Your Majesty, Hamish Alexander Harrington said in a flat, unflinching, yet curiously deadened voice. I think the short answer is very bad. 
I'm not qualified to speak to the civilian aspects. I'm sure Tyler... He nodded across the table to Sir Tyler Abercrombie, the Home Secretary, has better information on the civilian casualty toll than I do. But from the purely military perspective, it would be extraordinarily difficult, if not outright impossible, to exaggerate the damage this has done to us. The Earl of Whitehaven looked away from Abercrombie, sitting very upright in his chair and turning it slightly to face the Queen directly. Hephaestus, Vulcan, and Wayland are gone, Your Majesty. There's been some talk about recovering some of the modules and repairing them, but my staff's current estimate, based on input from both Bewships and Bewebs, as well as from construction and repair, is that it would be faster and more efficient to start over from scratch. That means we've just lost every hard yard we had. I don't as yet have a complete count of the numbers and classes of ships lost with them, but I already know it represents a significant loss of combat power. In addition, we've lost better than 99% of the labor force of all three stations. For all intents and purposes, the only real survivors we have are people who, for one reason or another, were off station when the attack hit. Most of them, he added heavily, also lived aboard the stations, which means virtually all of them have lost their entire immediate families. That means it's going to be quite some time, and rightly so, before their morale recovers to a point at which they can really be considered part of the labor force again. His face showed his distaste at having to make that observation, Grief and bereavement, especially on such a horrific scale, weren't supposed to be reduced to mere production factors, but whether they were supposed to be or not, they were something which had to be taken into consideration this time, and he continued unflinchingly. The damage to the dispersed orbital yards is almost as bad. At this moment, my best figures are that fifteen of them— none of which had units under construction, are undamaged, and another eight are probably repairable, although the ships under construction have been so badly damaged, we're probably going to have to break them up and start over, rather than trying to repair and complete them. In effect, we've lost every ship under construction, the labor force which was building them, and the physical plant in which they were being built, and which was fabricating almost all the components the dispersed yards were assembling. That means that what we have in commission and working up at Trevor Star now is all we're going to have for at least two T years. For any capital ships, the delay will be more like four T years. Minimum. Despite all the disastrous reports the other people in that conference room had already received, people winced all around the table, and one or two faces turned perceptibly paler at the First Space Lord's flat, unvarnished admission. What about the repair facilities in Trevistar, Haim? Prime Minister Grantville asked quietly, and Whitehaven looked at his brother. That's still intact, he admitted and it's going to play a huge part in regenerating yard capacity within the time frame I just mentioned, Willie. But it's primarily repair capacity. It was never intended for sustained, high-volume component production, so it's going to require a lot of modification before it can really make its presence felt. And more importantly, we're going to have to divert a hell of a lot of its potential capacity to something we're going to need even worse. William Alexander's face tightened at his brother's last sentence. He started to open his mouth, then shook his head and waved his right hand in a small arc, inviting Whitehaven to continue with his report. No doubt there'd be time for even more bad news soon enough. Before we can begin any new construction projects, 
We're going to have to replace our yard capacity, Your Majesty, the First Lord went on, turning back to the Queen. We are fortunate in that our extraction and refining platforms are untouched, probably because they're so dispersed and they were too far from the building platforms for convenient targeting, but raw materials have never been a significant bottleneck for us. Fabrication has been, however, and any of our previous problems pale beside what we're looking at now. Before we can replace our yard capacity, we have to replace the core industrial capacity the space stations represented. Bew Ships is working on a complete listing of our repair and fabrication ships. Obviously, we'll be recalling them from most of our foreign stations. We're going to need them here at home too badly to leave them anywhere else. Given our situation where the League is concerned... The fact that we are going to be unable to increase the size of our wall of battle is obviously a huge problem. However, we actually have one that's worse. He inhaled deeply like a man stealing himself for the first touch of a surgeon's scalpel. Whoever planned this operation obviously knew exactly how to hurt us. Not only did they take out our building capacity... But when they destroyed Hephaestus and Vulcan, they also destroyed our missile production lines. I remain confident that the missiles we have deployed are superior to those of any probable enemy, but the ones we already have aboard ship, or aboard ammunition ships assigned to our fleet formations, are all the missiles we have, or we're going to have, until we can rebuild our production facilities, which is why I said we'd need the Trevor Star facilities for something else even more than for rebuilding our Manticran yards. At this time, I have no firm estimate for how long it's going to take to get Trevor Star up for missile production. We're still inventorying our mobile repair and construction capabilities, and I'm sure some of them will help, but I'll be extraordinarily surprised if we can get new missile lines into production in less than ten T-months. And even then, it's going to take us a long time to ramp back up to anywhere near the production levels we had yesterday. Given the fact that our tactical advantages are so hugely bound up with our missile superiority— and given the numbers of missiles required to destroy or mission-kill even a Solarian ship of the wall, that means our ability to take the war to the League has just evaporated. In fact, while it's likely we have enough Apollos already in inventory to finish off the Republic, if it comes to that, Doing so would leave us with essentially none for use against the League for almost an entire tea year. The silence in the conference room was even deeper and darker, and Whitehaven seemed to give himself a little shake. The solitary bright spot I've so far been able to find, aside from the fact that Trevor Star is still intact, is that Wayland was virtually empty when the attack went in. Several people blinked in surprise, and Whitehaven's lips twitched in something which might one day become a smile once more. Vice Admiral Faraday had scheduled a surprise emergency evacuation exercise. Given the interruption in the station's operations, not to mention the expense and the disruption of government services on Griffin when all those life pods dropped in so unexpectedly, I imagine Faraday probably anticipated taking more than a little flack over his exercise. The ghost of a smile disappeared. As it happens, he doesn't have to worry about that anymore. He and his staff were aboard when the station was destroyed. All of them were lost, as was almost all of the station's senior command crew and a quarter of its engineering staff. But because of his exercise... The entire R&D staff and over 95% of the station's manufacturing workforce and, thank God, their families, 
were on the planet and survived. That workforce will be literally invaluable when we start trying to rebuild. And how much research did we lose with the station, Hamish? Prince Consort Justin asked quietly. None, Your Highness, Whitehaven replied and gave Justin a hint of a nod. The Prince Consort, the Earl knew, had already known the answer to his question. He'd asked it to make certain everyone else in the conference room knew. All research notes and reports were automatically backed up at a secure location on Griffin every twelve hours, Whitehaven continued, still addressing the Prince Consort, even though he was actually talking to the entire conference room. They were downloaded by the ground station and backed up after the evacuation, so they're literally up to the minute. We've lost some experimental hardware and prototypes, but we have all the data and all the minds which created the hardware in the first place. Which is unfortunately of limited utility for the immediate future, Grantville observed. He smiled sadly. Until we've got some place to build things again, it doesn't really matter how many more wonder weapons they might be able to come up with, does it, Haim? No, I don't suppose it does, Whitehaven agreed. All right, Elizabeth said again. I'm sure none of us enjoyed hearing any of that, except the bit about Wayland, of course, but I imagine we're going to hear still more things we don't really want to know about, so let's start with you, Tyler. The Queen visibly steeled herself. What are the latest casualty figures? Sir Tyler Abercrombie was tall, broad-shouldered, and distinguished-looking. He was only a tea-year younger than Whitehaven, and his dark hair had silvered at the temples, adding to his air of distinction. The aura he usually projected was one of calm, competent confidence. Today, his brown eyes were haunted, and his hands trembled visibly as he adjusted his memo pad's display. Thirst, your majesty, he said, in a voice that was steadier than his hands, as he looked up from the pad at her. I'm sure everyone present will understand that any numbers I offer at this point have to be considered purely preliminary, and I'm sure everyone else hopes as much as I do that we're going to find our initial projections are wrong, that a lot of the people who are currently missing are simply that, missing in the confusion, not dead, and that they'll turn up later. Unfortunately, I don't expect that to happen. In fact, I believe the current figures are probably going to climb at least somewhat. Several sets of shoulders seemed to tighten, and expressions which had already been grim became set in stone. The loss of life aboard the space stations themselves is currently estimated at 5.4 million, the Home Secretary said levelly, looking back down at the pad. That number includes only those we know who were on board at the time— it does not include arriving transients who hadn't yet passed through immigration or those who were still in the concourses waiting to transship without ever entering customs in the first place because they weren't entering Manticran sovereignty. We don't think that latter number's going to be very high since most interstellar through passengers make made their connections at the junction, not Hephaestus or Vulcan, it also doesn't include military personnel aboard the vessels docked at the stations at the time of the attack. Additional loss of life from the attacks on the orbital shipyards amount so far to 396,000. We estimate that another thousand or so were probably killed aboard small craft and private vessels that found themselves caught in the crossfire. He paused again, then cleared his throat. In the case of Griffin, we were extraordinarily lucky. Wayland was less than half the size of Vulcan, so there was less debris to begin with. In addition, Griffin's population is still much sparser than that of our other planets, and it's concentrated closer to the equatorial zone. There were several major debris strikes on the planetary surface, but they were concentrated in the high northern latitudes— 
the most serious consequences would appear to be the damage to the local ecosystems and the consequences of one major ocean strike. Human casualties, however, were nil, so far as we now know, and the estimates from my biosciences people are that the ecological damage is all well within recoverable ranges. In the case of Manticore itself, we were once again fortunate. In this case, in that there were a larger than usual number of tugs moving vessels and freight in and around the volume of Hephaestus. Two of them were destroyed along with the station, but the others survived, and we were also fortunate that Lieutenant Commander Strickland, the captain of one of those surviving tugs, Stevedore, I believe, reacted quickly enough to organize her fellow skippers. Between them, they managed to intercept all but a half-dozen significant pieces of wreckage. The Mount Royal Palace defenses destroyed the two of those pieces which might have threatened landing, and the other four struck either uninhabited or only sparsely inhabited areas of the planet. None struck water either. We don't have anything like definitive numbers yet, but I doubt the total casualty count from debris strikes on the planet will exceed 200. We were less fortunate on Sphinx. He shook his head slowly, and his eyes, darker than ever, flicked briefly to an iron-faced Hamish Alexander Harrington before they returned to his memo pad. There was only a single tug in position to intervene. My impression is that its crew performed far better than anyone could possibly have expected. Nonetheless, the city of Yawata Crossing was effectively destroyed by a major debris strike. The city of Tanasport wasn't directly impacted, but there was a major ocean strike, it would almost certainly have destroyed Yawata Crossing even without the direct hit on that city, and it did destroy at least three-quarters of Tanner's port, and three other smaller cities were very severely damaged. There was too little time for significant evacuation before the first impact waves came ashore, and loss of life was heavy, especially in Tanner's port. Local authorities had more warning, further away from the actual strikes, and emergency evacuation efforts thankfully reduced human losses, although property damage is certainly going to run into the high billions of dollars. The town of Evans Mountain was also badly damaged by a cascade of smaller pieces of debris in its case, although the casualty count there seems to have been much lighter. And according to the Sphinx Forestry Service, Abercrombie's eyes flitted to the tree cats on the backs of Elizabeth and Justin's chairs. It would appear at least one tree cat clan was completely destroyed. A soft sound came from all three of the tree cats in the room. Whitehaven opened his arms as Samantha flowed down from his chair back and buried her muzzle against him, and Ariel and Monroe joined their voices to her own soft lament. Counting the known casualties on the planetary surfaces, Abercrombie concluded softly, the civilian human death toll so far is approximately 7,448,000, I've asked the Forestry Service to give us a definitive figure for tree cat fatalities as soon as possible. The Home Secretary met Ariel's eyes, not the Queen's. They're working on that. At the moment, the best estimate from their search and rescue teams is approximately 8,500. Whitehaven winced. Seven and a half million human dead was even worse than he'd anticipated. True, it was less than a third of the population of the city of Nouveau Paris. For that matter, it was about a million and a half less than the population of the city of Landing, 
and the permanent population of the Manticore binary system had grown to just over 3.6 billion, an increase of almost 20% in just the past 30 T years or so, so the percentage of deaths was still barely more than two-tenths of a percent of the total. But the people who'd been killed represented a horrendous percentage of the labor force which had been the backbone and the sinews of the Star Empire's industrial might. And from his own services perspective, the naval personnel lost, combined with the casualties already suffered during the Battle of Manticore, came close to equaling the total manpower of the entire Royal Manticoran Navy at the beginning of the First Havenite War. The consequences for fleet experience, training, and morale were going to be bad enough, especially given the whipsaw effect on the heels of the surge in confidence which had followed the Battle of Spindle, but working around the casualty total might very well be enough to bring Lucian Cortez's viewpurse to the breaking point this time after all. Against all that, less than 9,000 tree cats might not seem so terrible, but there were many planets occupied by human beings, while by the Sphinx Forestry Service's best estimate, the total tree cat population was probably less than 12 million, which meant those 9,000 lives represented almost a full percent of them. Not one percent of the tree cats living on the planet Sphinx, one percent, one out of every hundred, of every tree cat in the entire universe. And the cats were telepaths. Elizabeth had reached up to gather Ariel back into her arms, and Monroe had leaned forward, pressing his wedge-shaped chin into the top of Justin's shoulder while the prince consort caressed his ears. They sat that way for several seconds. Then Elizabeth bent and kissed the top of Ariel's head gently, straightened once more, and cleared her throat. Thank you, Tyler, she said quietly, then looked around the table again. I'm sure it's going to take a while for Tyler's numbers to soak in for all of us. In the meantime, however, and however painful we may find it, it's our responsibility to look beyond the immediacy of the human and tree cat cost and consider the future, specifically the extent and speed with which we can recover from the damage to our military, industrial, and economic power. We've already heard from the Navy, so I suppose it's your turn, Charlotte. Of course, Your Majesty, Dame Charlotte Fitzcummings, Countess Maidenhill, replied. Maidenhill was the Star Empire's Minister of Industry, and her expression was every bit as grim as Whitehaven's or Abercrombie's. Basically, all I can do is confirm Hamish's summation. The dark-haired Countess's normally pleasant voice was harsh, hard-edged. We've already begun an emergency mobilization of all civilian repair and service ships assigned to both the junction's central nexus and basilisk. We're also making plans to tow the junction industrial platforms back into the inner system, but to be honest, like the Trevor Star platforms, they're really designed for repair and routine service work, not heavy fabrication. We can increase their construction capacity, but what they have now is too small to have any immediate effect. My people are working on their own inventories of capabilities, and we've already arranged to coordinate as closely as possible with the Navy. Personally, I suspect we're going to find we have more capacity than we believe we do right this minute. The natural reaction to something like this has to be pessimism, but even if that's true, I very much doubt we're going to be able to significantly reduce the time constraints Hamish described. To be honest, what's going to hurt at least as badly as the hit our physical plant's taken is the workforce we've lost. She nodded her head slightly in Abercrombie's direction. No one ever contemplated the catastrophic destruction of an entire space station without any opportunity to evacuate personnel. Even if Haven's attack had succeeded, there would have been time to evacuate. But this... Bolt from the blue didn't give us any warning at all. For all intents and purposes, we've just lost our orbital infrastructure's entire skilled labor force, aside from the Wayland survivors, which completely disrupts our existing emergency plans. Not that any of those plans ever contemplated an emergency on this scale anyway. 
Somehow we're going to have to prioritize the workers we have left between essential construction tasks and training an entirely new workforce. She shook her head heavily. Our three biggest advantages, the ones that have kept us intact for the last 20 or 30 T years, have been our R&D, the quality of our educational system and workforce, and the strength of our economy. As Hamish just pointed out, we still have the research capability, and we still have the educational system, but we no longer have the workforce, and with our industrial capacity this brutally cut back, the strength of our economy has to be doubtful at best. Bruce, Elizabeth said quietly, looking at the elegantly groomed, slightly portly man, sitting between Maidenhill and Francine Maurier, Baroness Morncreek, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Bruce Weigenberg was one of the minority of the Cabinet's members without even a simple sir in front of his name, which wasn't because titles hadn't been offered, however. Like Klaus Hauptmann, Weigenberg was aggressively proud of his yeoman ancestry. Besides, he was from Griffin— Despite his sophistication and polish, he retained at least a trace of the traditional Griffin antipathy towards the aristocracy. He much preferred the House of Commons, and he'd been the centrist party's leader there before he'd accepted his cabinet appointment. He'd really been happier in that role, and he hoped to return to it sometime in the next few years, which would become impossible if he accepted a patent of nobility. He was also the Star Empire's Minister of Trade. There's no point pretending we haven't just taken an enormous hit, Your Majesty, he said now, meeting her eye squarely, his griffin burr more pronounced than usual. Our carrying trade isn't going to be directly affected, and our junction fees probably aren't going to fall too significantly, not immediately at least. The indirect effect on our carrying trade is going to make itself felt pretty quickly, though. As Charlotte's just pointed out, for all intents and purposes, we've lost our industrial sector completely. That means an awful lot of manufactured goods we used to be exporting aren't going to be available now. That accounts for a significant percentage of our total carrying trade— not to mention an enormous chunk of the old Star Kingdom's gross system product. And as our industrial exports drop, the resultant drop in shipping's also going to have at least some effect on our junction phase. Most of the rest of our GSP comes out of the financial sector, and I can't even begin to predict how the markets are going to react. There hasn't been an example of something like this happening to a major economic power since Old Earth's final war. And even that's not really comparable, given how interstellar trades increased since then. On the one hand, a huge percentage of our financial transactions have always consisted of servicing and brokering interstellar transactions between other parties— and the wormholes and shipping routes which made that possible are still there. What isn't there, and won't be for quite some time, is the dynamo of our own economy. People who were invested in the Star Kingdom, foreigners as well as our own people, have just taken a devastating hit. How well anyone's going to recover from it, how quickly that's going to happen and what's going to happen to investor confidence in the meanwhile is more than anyone except Nostradamus would even try to predict. Bruce has an excellent point, Your Majesty, Morn Creek put in. The small, dark baroness looked almost like a child sitting beside the taller, bulkier, fair-haired Weigenberg, but her voice was crisp. At the moment, we've suspended the markets— she continued. We can probably get away with that for a few more days, but we can't just freeze them forever, so we're going to have to respond with some sort of coherent policy quickly. And as the first stage in doing that, I think the most important thing is for us to stop and take a deep breath. As Charlotte says, we still have our educational system, 
And as Bruce just pointed out, shipping routes aren't going to magically change. We have the ability to recover from this, assuming we can survive long enough. How bad things are going to get economically before they start getting better is more than I'm prepared to predict, and the price tag's going to be enormous, but I'm confident of our ultimate capacity to rebuild everything we've lost if whoever did this to us gives us the time. She looked directly at Hamish Alexander Harrington, Sir Thomas Caparelli, and Admiral Patricia Givens, and her dark eyes were sharp. Francine Morier had been First Lord of Admiralty herself, and that lent her unspoken question an even sharper edge. I don't know whether or not they will, my lady, Givens admitted. She seemed to have aged at least a couple of decades in the last twenty hours, and her eyes were filled with bitter anguish. At this point, we don't have the least idea who did it to us, much less how. Samantha made a soft, distressed sound in Whitehaven's arms as the bleeding wound of the Second Space Lord's sense of personal failure reached out to her. The Earl didn't need Honor's empathy to understand his companion's distress, and his right hand twitched in an automatic reflex to reach out to Givens. "'Your Majesty,' the Admiral continued, facing Elizabeth squarely, "'what's just happened represents the worst intelligence failure in the history of the Star Empire, a total failure, and as the head of the Office of Naval Intelligence, that failure is mine.' Givens never physically moved, yet her shoulders seemed to hunch under the weight of her admission, and silence hovered. Then Elizabeth looked past her to Whitehaven. She started to speak, then stopped and shifted her eyes to Caparelli instead. Sir Thomas, the Queen said very softly. Your Majesty. The First Space Lord looked more granite-like than ever, yet he replied almost instantly, and his eyes were level and his voice, as granite-like as his face, was unflinching. Admiral Givens is entirely correct in at least one sense. We never saw this coming. None of us saw it coming. And that does represent an enormous failure on the part of your armed forces and your intelligent services. We were supposed to keep something like this from happening, and we didn't. The silence was deeper and darker than ever. He let it linger for a heartbeat, then inhaled deeply. You'll have my letter of resignation by the end of the day, Your Majesty, and the reason you'll have that letter is because the responsibility ultimately is mine. But in defense of my subordinates, including Admiral Givens, I don't think this was something any of them could have seen coming. I've already spoken with Admiral Hempel. Her people have been systematically examining every recorded sensor reading from every surveillance platform and ship in the entire binary system. She began with the moment of the attack, and she proposes to go back for at least sixty months. While that's going to take a long time, she tells me her preliminary assessment is that we're looking at the result of a previously unsuspected technological capability that's probably at least as revolutionary in its own way as anything we've managed. But that kind of capability doesn't just happen overnight. Whoever did this to us didn't just wake up the day before yesterday, pick the Star Empire at random, and decide to hit us with something he just happened to have lying around. Whoever did this and I have a few suspicions about who that whoever might be, developed the capability he just used for the specific purpose, the exact sort of operation he just used it to accomplish. And given what's been happening lately in Talbot and the League, I also very strongly suspect we were the primary target all along, from the moment he first set out to develop his new tech. So if there was an intelligence failure involved, it wasn't a failure to correctly interpret information. It didn't happen because someone overlooked something. I suppose it's remotely possible we're eventually going to discover there was some tiny clue somewhere 
But if this attack was the work of who I think it was, then we've been trying to put their capabilities under a microscope ever since the Battle of Monica. If we didn't realize they'd managed to put together the technology and the resources to pull this off, it wasn't because we weren't looking. It was because we didn't know, because nobody knew what to be looking for. No one spoke for a moment. Then Grantville cleared his throat. I'm very much inclined to endorse what you've just said, at least to the extent that it bears upon Admiral Givens's performance. The Prime Minister looked directly across the table at Givens. I've known you too long, worked with you too closely, to believe for a single moment that what's just happened represents any failure on your part, Pat. From what Sir Thomas just said, it's obvious no one over at Bewebs had a hint the weapons used in this attack were even possible, much less that anyone was actually developing them. That wouldn't be the case if whoever did the research and developing hadn't exercised extraordinary care to keep anyone from realizing what he was up to. So in my view, barring some totally unexpected revelation, this doesn't represent an intelligence failure on any one person's part. I doubt very much that it represents a failure on the part of our intelligence community as a whole, for that matter. Yes, we were supposed to see something like this coming, but to use one of Hamish's charming phrases, when you're ass deep in alligators, sometimes it's hard to remember your original purpose was to drain the swamp. With everything that's been coming at us over the last few years, how in the world were you supposed to realize someone was cooking up a totally new and presumably unorthodox as hell technology that could defeat the best sensor platforms and technology in existence? Givens looked back at him with those wounded eyes. She didn't speak, but at least she didn't disagree with him. Not openly, at any rate. He held her gaze for a moment, then looked back at Caparelli. I said I think I agree with what you've said, at least in as much as it bears on Patricia's performance at O&I, he said. But it's clear you're suggesting manpower might somehow be behind this. The Prime Minister shook his head. I know we're in the process of radically reevaluating everything we thought we knew about manpower and Mesa, but are you seriously suggesting they have this kind of capability? Look at our confrontation with the League. What makes you think manpower is more likely to be behind this than that the SLN's just demonstrated it has previously unsuspected capabilities of its own? Caparelli started to reply, but Whitehaven laid a hand on his forearm, stopping him. If I may, Tom, he said quietly. Caparelli glanced sideways at him, then nodded, and Whitehaven turned to his brother. On the face of it, Willie, it does seem more likely someone like the League should be able to develop and deploy something like this, whatever this is, than that an outlaw outfit like Manpower, or even an entire single-system star nation like Mesa, could. But I'm as certain as Tom that it wasn't the League, and not just because we've convinced ourselves of our technological superiority to the SLN. If they'd had this sort of capability, and some way to get it to us this quickly, they wouldn't even have bothered to talk to us after what happened at New Tuscany. Think about the scale and the scope of what whoever it really was did here. He shook his head. I suppose it's remotely possible Crandall could have been stupid enough to sail directly into a confrontation with us, even knowing the League Navy had something like this in its locker. For that matter, if the development was kept black enough, she might not even have known it existed. It could even have been developed by one of the system defense forces, not the SLN itself, although that seems unlikely. But none of those possibilities change the fact that someone like Kolokoltsov would for damn sure have told us to pound sand from the outset, rather than playing diplomatic games, if the League had had this capability and been busy moving it into position to hit us all along. 
I agree with Tom's assessment. Whoever developed this developed it for exactly the sort of operation he just carried out, and frankly, there was no reason for the League to develop it. When you're the biggest, baddest conventional navy in the history of humanity, which is exactly how the SLN's always thought of itself, you don't need something like this. For that matter, you don't want something like this because it's going to fundamentally destabilize the equation that's made you the biggest, baddest navy in existence. Grantville looked skeptical, and Whitehaven waved one hand in an impatient gesture, as if he were looking for the exact way to express what he was trying to say. This is like... like our development of the Grav Pulse Com and the multi-drive missile, Willie, only more so. You may remember just how much trouble Sonia had convincing certain members of our naval establishment myself included, to support her changes, despite the fact that even those of us who disagreed with her had an enormous incentive to figure out how somebody our size survived against someone the size of the People's Republic. It's human nature to stick with what you know works, and there's always something scary about cutting loose from known, quantifiable, predictable technologies and capabilities, especially when you know you're the best around, have a significant qualitative or quantitative advantage over your adversaries under the existing rules. That's why we kicked and screamed at each other so much and so loudly— but we did head out in those new directions, and we did it because we had to, because of that enormous incentive. Someone back on Old Earth once said that when a man knows he's going to be hanged, it concentrates his thoughts, and that's exactly what happened to us. But the League's never worried about that. It's never had any reason to, and that's precisely why the SLN's always been the most conservative fleet in existence. I can't conceive of any reason for the Solis to have changed that permanently ingrained a mindset so completely. Under the existing rules, they've always been the 800-kilo gorilla, and any fundamental change could only jeopardize their position, or at least require them to duplicate the new technology themselves, quite possibly at the expense of throwing away the huge numerical superiority they've spent literally centuries building up. But manpower, on the other hand? The Earl shook his head again. However uncomfortable the conclusion may be, I think just about all of us have decided Mike and Honor are right about manpower's responsibility for everything that's happened in Talbot which means that whatever we may have thought manpower was for the last few centuries, it isn't just an outlaw outfit. I still don't have a clue in hell what it is, but I know it's more than that. And, like Tom, I know it's managed to keep anyone from guessing it was. What I can't even begin to speculate meaningfully on is how long it's been more than that, but I'm sure as hell not prepared to assume the leopard just decided to change its spots the day before yesterday. So, given that someone's already demonstrated that he's developed both the intent and the capability to maneuver us into open warfare with the Solarian League, I think that someone is a much more likely candidate to have orchestrated this attack and I also think someone who's apparently spent a long time planning and building up capabilities he didn't want the rest of the galaxy to know about is a much more likely candidate to have very quietly embraced a brand new, completely destabilizing military technology. If you know anyone that description fits better than manpower, please tell me who it is. Grantville gazed at his brother for several seconds, then sat back in his chair. I can't, 
he said quietly. Neither can I. Elizabeth's grim voice drew all eyes back to her. Her own attention was fixed on Whitehaven and Caparelli, however. Am I correct in assuming you and Sir Thomas believe manpower, or whatever the hell we should start calling these people, wouldn't have hit us and left our allies alone? I doubt very much that they would have, Whitehaven said heavily. I suppose it's possible they left the Andamani out. They have to be aware the Emperor is more than a little unhappy about this confrontation of ours with the League, and the Andamani have always had that reputation for pragmatism, let's say. And there's got to be a limit on their current capabilities, how far they could stretch their attack when they started planning it as well. So they may well have figured Gustav would recognize a sinking ship when he saw one. For that matter, they may have figured he's smart enough and cautious enough to figure there's no reason they couldn't do the same thing to him later if he didn't decide to step aside. But anyone smart enough to put all of this together is going to understand Benjamin Mayhew better than that, Your Majesty. They're going to have had a page or two in their plans for him. I'm very much afraid our dispatch boat telling him about what's happened here is going to cross one from him telling us the same thing already happened at Yeltsinstar. I agree entirely with Hamish, Your Majesty, Caparelli said. And I'd add one other point. The Andermani still don't have their military hardware fully up to our standards, the Graysons do. I don't believe anyone would launch an attack like this on us without trying to make certain he took out the people most likely to help us rebuild as well. Elizabeth looked at him for several more seconds, then nodded. That was about the conclusion I'd reached myself, unfortunately, Sir Thomas. I would like to make one additional point, if I may, however, Your Majesty the First Space Lord said quietly. Of course. I realize that at this moment, what we're all most aware of is the damage we've taken and the fact that we don't have a clue how the attack was pulled off. Frankly, from a military perspective, the most frightening thing is that none of our sensor systems saw a single thing coming. My own feeling, and Admiral Hempel's tentative analysis supports the same conclusion, is that what we have to be looking at is some radically new propulsive system. The missiles used in this attack were essentially conventional weapons, variants on our own MDMs. Analysis of their maneuvers from the moment they brought their drives up further suggests they were delivered in pods, probably coasted ballistically in to their launch points at a velocity of about 0.2 c. The weapons that were used on the space stations were another case entirely. At this point, it looks like they were probably some sort of throwaway disposable version of our own shrikes, although nobody in Admiral Hempiel's shop has the least clue how manpower— excuse me, how whoever launched this attack— managed to cram a weapon that powerful into a remote platform, or how they gave its grazer that sort of pulse endurance. For all intents and purposes, though, it's basically only a larger-ranged version of our own mistletoe, probably using whatever new drive technology their ships use instead of relying completely on stealth the way mistletoe does. So, so far, the only fundamentally destabilizing thing we've seen, or rather not seen, is the drive technology itself. That's scary enough, but I suspect it's an advantage that's going to be considerably less valuable the second time it's used against someone who knows it's out there, even if he doesn't know how it's done. And whatever it may let them do in sublight maneuvering, Unless the laws of physics have been repealed, they still have to radiate a hyperfootprint when they leave hyperspace. Admiral Hempel tells me she feels quite confident she'll eventually be able to identify whatever trace footprint or hyperghost we failed to spot or identify properly at the time the ships which deployed this attack's weapons dropped in on us.
My point is, Your Majesty, that it's going to be much more difficult for this adversary to launch a second attack on this star system, or, for that matter, on Grayson or New Potsdam, without our at least spotting their arrival from Hyper. If we spot any unidentified Hyper footprint or ghost, we'll immediately saturate the space around it with Graf Pulse Comm coordinated scout ships and deploy remote sensor platforms in a shell dense enough for someone to walk across. Even without knowing exactly what we're looking for, it's extremely unlikely any significant force of starships could penetrate that kind of surveillance wall without our detecting something. And unless these people have been able to build an awfully large fleet of SDPs with Apollo capability of its own, something is all home fleet or the system defense Apollo pods are going to need. So a second similar attack is unlikely to succeed? Grantful asked. Obviously, no one can absolutely guarantee it won't, Mr. Prime Minister, Caporelli said with unaccustomed formality. I think unlikely to succeed would be putting it mildly, however. The First Space Lord shrugged and looked back at Elizabeth. Your Majesty, I fully realize that what I'm talking about here is, at best, an argument that we can defend ourselves against similar attacks. I'm not even remotely trying to suggest that until we know how it was done, and until we're completely confident we know exactly who did it, we'll be in any position to take offensive action. And one thing we've learned against the Havenites is that the side which can't take effective offensive action ultimately loses. But barring the need to expend a large percentage of our limited missile supply— against either the Republic or the League before we can get new production lines set up, I believe we ought to be able to protect ourselves against whoever this was until we do know what we need to know to go after them. Elizabeth started to speak, but Whitehaven raised an index finger requesting attention. She looked at him for a moment, then nodded. I'd just like to add something to what Tom said, Your Majesty, he said. First, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if the people who did this did it in hopes that either the League or the Republic will finish us off before we can recover. Frankly, I don't know how likely they are to succeed if that was their intention. There are too many political and diplomatic elements tied up in that kind of decision tree for me to offer any kind of meaningful opinion. But secondly, the one thing that struck me about this in addition to what Tom and Sonia have said about new drive technologies, is that the people behind it can't have a very large navy. What? Grantville blinked at his brother, and most of the other people around the table looked either surprised or downright skeptical. Caporelli, on the other hand, nodded firmly. Think about it, Willie, Whitehaven said. If someone had anything like the number of capital ships we have— and if all of them had this kind of technology, they wouldn't have had to raid our infrastructure. They could have simply arrived, demonstrated their invisibility, and demanded our surrender, and we wouldn't have had any choice but to give it to them. If they'd gotten a couple of dozen capital ships with this new drive of theirs, as far in system as they got their pods before launch, what other option would we have had? Even if we'd wanted to bring in home fleet— Every single ship at Trevastar, for that matter, they'd already have control of the planetary orbitals long before we could get into position. For that matter, they'd have been into missile range of the planets before we could even bring the system defense missiles online to nail them. And even under the Eridani Edict, they'd be fully justified in bombarding the planets if we refused to surrender under those circumstances— but instead of going for the jugular, they attacked our arms and legs. Not only that, but the nature and pattern of the attack strongly suggests that whoever planned and launched it was operating with strictly limited resources. Yes, it was extraordinarily well planned and executed. From a professional perspective, 
I have to admire the ability, imagination, and skill behind it, but successful as it was, it was essentially a hit-and-run raid, albeit on a massive scale, and its success, as Tom has just pointed out, derived entirely from the fact that it achieved total strategic and tactical surprise. If any significant percentage of the weapons committed to it, either those grazer platforms or the missile pods, had failed, or been detected on their way in, or even if we'd only suspected something was coming, in time to alert the stations and activate their sidewalls, and get the tugs deployed to interpose their wedges against potential attacks, the damage would have been much less severe. Give us fifteen or twenty minutes warning, and we'd have had a good ninety-five percent of our personnel off Hephaestus and Vulcan, for that matter, not to mention getting a lot of our ships out of the station docking slips. The people who put this together had to be as well aware of those possibilities as I am, and they have to know the axiom that anything which can go wrong will go wrong. True, they seem to have pretty much avoided that this time around, but they damned well knew better than to count on that, so if they'd had more resources to commit to the attack, we'd have seen overkill, not just exactly enough to do the job if everything works perfectly. He shook his head. All of it points to the same conclusion. They've got this revolutionary new drive technology, but they don't have it in large numbers. If they had the numbers, they'd either have been able to follow through with an outright knockout blow or have at least been able to deploy enough additional weapons to give them the sort of redundancy factor any competent planner would be looking for. Grantville's expression turned thoughtful, and several of the faces which had looked dubious began to look, if not more hopeful, at least less desperate. The queen looked around the conference table again, and her nostrils flared. I think you've all made very good points, she said. I know information's going to change over the next several days, that we're going to find some things aren't quite as bad as we thought they were, and that others are even worse. But the bottom line is this. Hamish is probably right about how the people who did this, and I think we all know who that almost certainly was, were thinking when they planned the operation. And now they undoubtedly think they've won. It may take a while, but between Haven and the Solarian League, with our industrial base smashed, it's obviously over, and they know it. We've lost. The silence in the conference room could have been carved with a chisel. And then, despite everything, the woman the tree cats called Soul of Steel smiled. There was nothing humorous or whimsical about that smile, no amusement. It was a thing of chilled steel, the smile of a wolf in the door to her den, between her young and the world, as the hunting hounds closed in upon it. It was grim, hard, and yet, in spite of everything she'd just said, there wasn't a gram of surrender in it. For better or for worse, it was the wolf smile of a woman who would die on her feet in the defense of her people and her home before she surrendered or yielded. No doubt they do know that. Elizabeth, Adrian, Samantha, Annette Winton said very softly. But there's one tiny flaw in their analysis, ladies and gentlemen, because even if they do know it, we don't. March 1922, Post Diaspora. History is filled with roadkills who thought they knew exactly where the inevitable was headed. Hamish Alexander Harrington, Earl of Whitehaven. Chapter 31 Inokenti Kolokolsov looked up with what he hoped was carefully hidden trepidation as Astrid Wang knocked once lightly on the frame of his office door, then stepped through it. She had what he'd come to think of as the look. 
If anyone had asked him to define the constituent parts of the look, he wouldn't have been able to. He knew it included worried eyes, tight lips, and a slightly furrowed brow, but there was a certain subtle something more as well. Something which tied all the other components together and warned him she was the bearer of yet more bad news. It was odd, really, how their definition of bad news had shifted. Once upon a time, it had meant, this is irritating and it's going to be bothersome to deal with. Now it meant, oh my God, what now? Yes, Astrid? His voice came out calmly enough, but a flicker in her green eyes told them she'd heard his wariness anyway. What is it? A courier from Admiral Jampet just delivered this, sir. She held out the red-bordered folio of a high-security message chip, and Kolokoltsov gazed at it for a moment, his lips puckering slightly, like a man sucking on an underripe persimmon. What was it about Rajampet, he wondered, that had produced this mania for hand-delivered, officer-couriered memos, rather than old-fashioned email or a simple calm conference over one of the innumerable secure channels available to the people who ran the Solarian League? Whatever it was, it was getting worse, pretty much in tandem with the situation. Which probably means that by next week sometime, he'll be sending them written in invisible ink on even more old-fashioned paper— probably with an entire battalion of Marines providing security between his office and mine. Somewhat to his surprise, the thought woke a flicker of genuine and much-needed humor. Not much of one, but given what had been going on here in the League's capital planet for the past couple of days, he'd settle for any humor he could get. After a moment, he sighed. I suppose you'd better give it to me. Yes, sir. Wang handed it over, then withdrew with just a little more haste than usual. It was almost as if she were afraid simple proximity to whatever fresh tidings of disaster had just arrived would somehow infect her with an incurable disease. Kolokoltsov snorted at the thought and the folio, dropped the chip into a reader, and sat back in his chair. What do you make of Rajani's latest brainstorm? Kolokoltsov asked considerably later that evening. He, Nathan McCartney, Malachi Abruzzi, and Agata Varlovsky were sharing a quiet and very private supper at the moment. It was the third night in a row they'd done so, and Omosupe Quartermain had been present the first two times as well. At the moment, though, she was off chairing a very hush-hush meeting with a dozen or so of the Sol System's most powerful industrialists. Kolokoltsov didn't expect much in the way of practical solutions out of her meeting, but at least it would be evidence that she and her colleagues were doing something. Precisely what, in the way of meaningful improvements at least, eluded him. But he supposed her idea of producing an industrial mobilization plan couldn't hurt. At least it would be something they could show the newsies. Which brainstorm would that be? The sourness in Vodolovsky's smile had nothing to do with the excellent wine which had accompanied supper. The one about redeploying every single frontier fleet battlecruiser to raid Mantikaran infrastructure, Kolokoltsev said dryly. Actually, compared to some of the other ideas he's come up with, that one sounds almost reasonable. McCartney's tone was considerably more sour than Vodolovsky's smile had been. Fair's fair, Nathan, Abruzzi said. None of us have come up with any better ones. Yes, McCartney growled. Well, it wasn't our precious navy that screwed the pooch either, now was it? And it wasn't one of us who forgot to tell the rest of us that that idiot Crandall was already in the Talbot cluster. Not to mention that he was the one who assured us no magical Mantikaran missiles were going to get through his defenses. McCartney, Kolokoltsev reflected, was the angriest and arguably the most frightened of their quintet. That undoubtedly had a great deal to do with the fact that Frontier Security reported to him, and that of all of them, he was the most aware of just how catastrophic the blow to the Solarian League Navy's prestige was really likely to be out in the star systems of the Verge. And then there's the whole Green Pines thing, McCartney continued in tones of profound disgust. Abruzzi seemed to stiffen, but the interior undersecretary waved a dismissive hand. 
I'm not blaming you for that one, Malachi. He did not, Kolokolta have noticed, say what he did blame Abruzzi for. But even that's going to turn around and bite us on the ass if we're not careful, thanks to Rajani. You've got the reliable newsies behind us when it comes to demanding a frontier fleet investigation, all right. Fine. Great. Exactly what we wanted. When Rajani was telling us how unstoppable his damned fleet was. The problem is that we've whipped up too much fervor in some quarters. They want us to go ahead and make the Montes admit their involvement and pay Mesa a huge indemnity, and the Montes have just proved we can't make them do anything. Not if Rajani's super dreadnoughts keep getting popped like zits anyway. I think we can all agree that neither Rajani nor the rest of Battlefleet have precisely covered themselves with glory, the Foreign Affairs Undersecretary observed out loud. On the other hand, much as I hate to admit it, the same thing could be said of all of us, whether as individuals or as a group. He looked around the table, and his level brown eyes were serious. We all took the mantis much too lightly. We didn't really press Rajani because, let's be honest here now, none of us really thought it mattered. No matter what the mantis might have tucked away in the way of military surprises, it didn't matter, did it? Not compared to our basic tech capabilities and the size of battle fleet. I don't think that's entirely fair, Inokenti, McCartney protested. We discussed the possibilities, and he... Sure, we discussed a whole range of possible responses, Kolokoltsev said bitingly. But what we didn't for even one minute consider was simply going ahead and admitting Bing was a friggin' idiot who'd fucked up, murdered the crews of three Mantikaran warships with absolutely no justification, and then gotten himself and everyone else aboard his flagship killed doing something even stupider. And unless my memory fails me, Nathan, a great deal of the reason we didn't consider doing that was the fact that we agreed with Rajani that we couldn't afford to let a batch of neobarbs get away with something like New Tuscany because of the way Jean Bart's destruction would undermine the Navy's prestige. McCartney glared at him, but this time he kept his mouth shut, and Kolokoltsev smiled thinly. Well, unless I'm sadly mistaken... The destruction or capture of over 70 ships of the wall, plus every single member of their screen, plus their entire supply group, by a force of Manticoran cruisers, has probably had at least some slight undermining effect of its own, wouldn't you say? McCartney's glare grew even more ferocious for a moment. Then it seemed to fold in on itself, and he sat back in his chair, shoulder slumping. Yes, he admitted heavily. It has. Well, Abruzzi said a bit tartly, I'm sure all that level-headed admission of reality is very cathartic, and I suppose it's something we really do have to do. On the other hand, deciding who's to blame isn't going to have much impact on getting out of this damned hole. Unless, Inokenti, you want to suggest we go ahead and acknowledge that this is all the League's fault— and ask the Mantis if they'd be so kind as to allow us to lick their boots while we make amends. Kolokoltsev started a quick, hot retort. He managed to stop it before any of the syllables leaked out, but it wasn't easy, especially when he recalled how airily Abruzzi had assured everyone the Mantis were only posturing for their own purely domestic political ends. It wasn't as if they'd really been prepared to risk a direct confrontation with the might of the Solarian League. Oh, goodness, no. No, Malachi, that isn't exactly what I had in mind, he said after a moment, and the shutters which seemed to close behind Abruzzi's eyes told him the Education and Information Undersecretary had recognized the careful and hard-held restraint in his own coldly precise tone. Mind you, in a lot of ways, I really would prefer to settle this diplomatically, even if we did end up having to eat crow. When I think of what this is going to cost, I'd even be willing to substitute dead buzzard for the crow if that offered us a way to avoid paying it. Unfortunately, I don't think we can avoid it. Not after pumping so much hydrogen into the green pine's fire, anyway, Vodolovsky agreed glumly. I'd say that's pretty much finished poisoning the well where diplomacy's concerned. And now that the newsies have hold of what happened to Crandall as well, any suggestion on our part that we ought to be negotiating's 
only going to be seen as a sign of weakness, one that turns loose every damned thing we've been worrying about from the beginning. Exactly. Kolokoltsov looked around the supper table. It's no use recognizing how much less expensive it would have been to treat the Manti's claims and accusations seriously. In fact, Kolokoltsov couldn't think of another single event, or any combination of events, for that matter, in his entire lifetime which had come even close to having the impact this one had. The citizens of the Solarian League had been told so often and so firmly that their navy was the largest and most powerful, not simply currently, but in the entire history of mankind, that they'd believed it. Which was fair enough. Kolokoltsov had believed it too, hadn't he? But now that navy had been defeated. It wasn't a case of a single light unit somewhere, one whose loss might never even have been noted by the League's news establishment. It wasn't even a case of a frontier fleet squadron surrendering to avoid additional loss of life. Not anymore, anyway. No, it was a case of an entire fleet of ships of the wall, of battle fleets' most powerful and modern units, being not simply defeated, but crushed, humiliated, dispatched with such offhand ease that its survivors were forced to surrender to mere cruisers of a neobarb navy from the backside of nowhere. The newsies who'd charged off to the Talbot Cluster to cover the new Tuscany incidents had gotten far more than they'd bargained for, he thought grimly. They'd come flooding home in their dispatch boats, racing to beat the Royal Manticoran Navy dispatches bearing word of the battle and of Admiral O'Cleary's surrender back to Manticore. The first rumors of the catastrophe had actually reached the old Earth media even before the latest Manticoran diplomatic note, this one accompanied by Admiral Keely O'Cleary in person, reached Old Chicago. The public hadn't taken it well. The initial response had been to brush off the reports as yet more unfounded rumors. After all, the news was impossible on the face of things. Cruisers, even battle cruisers, simply didn't defeat ships of the wall any more than antelopes hunted down tigers. The very suggestion was ludicrous. But then it began to sink in. Ludicrous or not, it had happened. The greatest political, economic, and military power in the explored galaxy had been backhanded into submission by a handful of cruisers. Estimates of fatalities were still thankfully vague, but even the Solarian public was capable of figuring out that when a super dreadnought blew up in action, there weren't going to be a lot of survivors from its crew. There was an edge of fear, almost of hysteria, in some of the commentary. And not just on the public bulletin boards, either. Theoretically well-informed and level-headed military and political analysts were climbing up on the the universe's ending wagon as well. After all, if the Mantis could do that, then who knew what they couldn't do? Indeed, some of the most panic-stricken seemed to expect Manticore to dispatch an unstoppable armada directly through the Beowulf terminus of the Manticoran wormhole junction to attack Old Earth. To be honest, there'd been moments, especially immediately after the news broke, when Kolokoltsov had worried about the same thing. But that was nonsense, of course. For a lot of reasons— not least because he figured the Mantis had to be at least a little brighter than he and his colleagues had proven themselves, which meant he very much doubted anyone in the Star Empire of Manticore was stupid enough to attack the home world of humanity and provide the League with such a wonderfully evocative emotional rallying point. But if there was an undeniable element of fear, there was an even more undeniable and overwhelming feeling of outrage. Things like this weren't supposed to happen to the Solarian League. The League's invincibility was a physical law, like the law of gravity, and just as inevitable. Which meant that if it had happened, someone was to blame. At the moment, much of that outraged anger was directed at the Mantis. The way Abruzzi's propagandists had milked Mesa's Green Pines allegations had helped there, since they'd managed to get public opinion aimed at the ballroom baby killers, and their Manticoran paymasters. Personally, Kolokoltsa figured there might have been as much as one actual fact in the Mason reports. There sure as hell hadn't been two of them, as far as he could tell, 
but the spectacular charges had been useful grist for Abruzzi's mill. Except, as McCartney had suggested, inasmuch as they'd whipped up too much heat. The public anger against Manticore, here on Old Earth at least, had attacked near-hysterical levels, and the fear bound up in it in the wake of New Tuscany only fanned its heat still higher. Yet there were already at least a few voices whose owners were looking for someone to blame closer to home than the Manticore binary system. The ones who wondered how the people in charge of the League's security could have been so soundly asleep at the switch that they hadn't even seen this coming. And other voices which wanted to know just what those same people in charge had been doing to let a loose warhead like Sandra Crandall plunge the SLN into such a disastrous fiasco. Those were the dangerous ones, and not simply because of the threat they posed to Inokenti Kolokoltsov's personal power and prestige. He wasn't going to pretend personal considerations didn't play a major part in his own attitude and decision-making processes, but they weren't the end-all and be-all of his concerns, not by a long chalk. The far more dangerous problem was that any thorough and open investigation of the disastrous decisions leading up to the Battle of Spindle would open some very nasty cans of worms. Any inquiry like that would lead directly to Kolokoltsev and his colleagues, and while the personal consequences were likely to be highly unpleasant, the institutional consequences might well prove fatal to the entire system which had governed the Solarian League for centuries. He'd actually considered calling for an inquiry himself anyway, there'd been enough blue-ribbon panels and impartial investigatory boards which had obediently produced the necessary conclusions to hand-wave away other embarrassing little problems over the years. This time, though, in the wake of such anger and such stunning and public disclosure of disaster, he wasn't at all confident any inquiry could be properly controlled. And one that couldn't be controlled would be even more catastrophic than what had happened at Spindle. Like it or not, there was no political structure to replace the bureaucratic one which had evolved over so many years. The very language of the League's constitution foreclosed the possibility of such a structure, especially in light of the centuries of unwritten constitutional law and traditions which had settled into place. Kolokoltsev strongly doubted that any political structure could ever be created, under any circumstances, to truly govern something the size of the League— but even if he were wrong about that, even if it had been possible to create such a structure under ideal circumstances and conditions, it most definitely would not be possible under the ones which actually obtained. Which meant he and his colleagues had to come up with a response. They were squarely on the back of the tiger, and the best they could hope for was that the beast came equipped with some sort of saddle and reins. So far... He hadn't seen any sign of them, unfortunately. Let's face it, he told the other three. It's too late for any sort of diplomatic settlement, and the two things we absolutely can't afford are to have the League's ability to deal with something the size of Manticore or our own ability to control the situation called into question. I don't disagree with you, Inokenti, Vorolovsky said after a moment. Unfortunately... I'd say the League's ability to deal with Manticore has already been pretty thoroughly called into question. In the short term, you're right, Kolokoltsev agreed. Rajani can dance around it all he wants to, but the truth is that until we figure out how the Mantis did what they did and how we can duplicate the same technology, we can't fight them. Then how... Abruzzi began. I said we can't fight them... That's why Rajani's idea of burying them under battle cruisers won't work. Actually, you know, it might, McCartney said slowly. Oh, we'd lose a hell of a lot of battle cruisers, but we could afford that more than the Mantis could afford what would happen to their star systems. No, Kolokoltsev said firmly. It won't work, Nathan. Even if it did work in the sense of so thoroughly shooting up the Mantis' industrial base and rear areas that they had to surrender, the cost would be catastrophic. What we'd be doing, and what there wouldn't be any way to keep people from figuring out we were doing, would be to use battlecruisers to run the Mantis out of missiles. 
Do you really want to have someone like that bitch O'Hanrahan and her muckraking friends baying at our heels over that once the smoke clears? Can't you just hear her now? Hear her explaining how we deliberately used warships and their crews, Nathan, as missile sponges, as targets that couldn't even hope to shoot back effectively until the Mantis literally ran out of ammunition? McCartney looked as if he wanted to argue, but the temptation faded quickly as he pictured exactly what Kolokoltsev was describing. And even if that weren't true, Kolokoltsev continued, it would probably be even more disastrous in the long run than simply giving in to the Mantis' demands right this minute. God only knows how many ships and how many people we'd lose, but despite everything Rajani's been saying, I strongly suspect casualties would only get worse, not better, and there comes a point when phrases like favorable rates of exchange lose their meaning. If we manage to defeat Manticore only at the expense of casualties ten times, or twenty times, or a hundred times as great as theirs, and right now the ratio is even worse than that by a considerable margin, we'd have set exactly the precedent we wanted to avoid all along. Sure, Manticore would be history— but do you think the example of what they'd done to us first would just disappear in the minds of all those people out there in the Verge, or the Shell, for that matter, who don't like us very much? Not to mention the possibility that we take so much damage against Manticore that someone else, maybe someone who's not even on our radar horizon at the moment, saw an opportunity to come at us from behind. I don't know about you, but I can think of at least a couple of system defense forces whose loyalty might be just a tad less than totally reliable under those circumstances. So what can we do? McCartney demanded. At the moment, I think we don't have any choice but to play defense, Kolokoltsev said frankly. The bottom line is that even if we can't afford to go after Manticore until we figure out how to match their weapons, they can't realistically come after us either. They've got to worry about the Republic of Haven, and even if they manage to settle with Haven somehow, it's going to take time. What we have to do is use that time to accomplish two things. First, we have to make it clear to everyone here in the League that what's happening is the result of Manticoran decisions, not ours. The only way to stay ahead of the mob this time around is to run even faster and shout even louder so I say we keep right on bearing down on Green Pines and endorse that recording someone sold O'Hanrahan as the real version of what happened at New Tuscany. As for what happened to Crandall at Spindle, we can't conceal our losses, but we don't have to confirm that the Mantis did it to her with cruisers and battle cruisers. What about the Newsies reports? Vodolovsky asked skeptically. We don't challenge them directly. Abruzzi said, his eyes narrowed in intense thought as he considered what Kolokolsev had just said. We point out that none of the Newsies were aboard either side ships during the actual battle. Oh, sure, some of them were allowed aboard a couple of the surrendered super dreadnoughts afterward, but none of them had access to the raw sensor data of the battle, and none of them have been allowed aboard any of the Manti ships to see firsthand whether they were really cruisers and not ships of the wall. They're taking other people's word for what happened when you come right down to it, aren't they? So we take the position that our analysts strongly doubt the Manticoran version, the only one that's been leaked to the media, of what happened. We should be properly open to all possibilities, including the possibility the Mantis are telling the truth, but insist the available evidence is far too sparse to confirm the truth either way at this point. Exactly. Kolokoltsev nodded and Vodolovsky's skepticism eased visibly. After all, this was a game they'd played many times. In the meantime, Kolokoltsev went on, we point out that everything that's happened in the Talbot Cluster is the result of Manticoran imperialism— We've had our concerns over their actions and intentions for some time, and what they did at New Tuscany and their attack on Admiral Bing have made us even more concerned. After all, the mere fact that they've changed their name officially to the Star Empire of Manticore is surely an indication of their expansionism and ambitions, and the reports of their backing for outright acts of terrorism and mass murder by the Audubon Ballroom 
The fact that they're clearly using the ballroom as a weapon against someone they've unilaterally decided is their enemy only underscores the kind of lunatic excesses their territorial ambitions and arrogance produce. As for what happened at Spindle, there are a couple of ways we might come at it. We could always toss Crandall to the wolves, exactly the way she deserves, especially since she's not around to dispute anything we say. We could observe more in sorrow than in anger that while her intentions were good and her suspicions about Manticoran imperialism were undoubtedly justified, she approached the situation far too impetuously. Or we could argue that the only records we have of her conversations with the Mantis come from Manticoran sources, just like the falsified censor recordings from New Tuscany. In reality, she was nowhere near as confrontational and bloody-minded as the Mantis version indicates. I'm sure someone over at Rajani's could create a much more reasonable version of her conversations with O'Shaughnessy and Medusa for domestic consumption. And the fact that she's so conveniently dead, under mysterious circumstances, would be only logical if the Mantis were going to falsify the official record of what she'd said to them. After all, it would never do for them to have left her alive to tell the galaxy they were lying, would it? The first possibility, laying the blame off on Crandall, could blow up in our faces if it leads to a demand that we acknowledge her fault and more or less accept the Mantis' demands in full. That would push us back into that unacceptable outcomes area. The second possibility has risks of its own, of course. The biggest one is that eventually someone, like O'Hanrahan, is going to start screaming that we knew the truth all along and suppressed it. If that happens, we might be looking at exactly the sort of domestic witch hunts we most need to avoid. On the other hand, the majority of the public so jaded where conspiracy theories are concerned that we could probably fob off any inquiry with a suitable cover story, unlike what would happen if the wrong people started nosing around our actual immediate post-New Tuscany decisions. And the reason we're doing all of this is, Vodolovsky asked, we're doing it because, in the end, we're going to have to go to war with Manticore no matter what we want, Kolokoltsev said flatly. And under the circumstances, given the fact that we can't go to war right now, the groundwork has to be set up carefully. We have to explain why the war is their fault and why we can't just go smack the hell out of them the way they deserve right this minute. Sounds like a tall order to me, she said dubiously, and he nodded. It is, but I think we've got at least a decent shot at it if we handle things right. First, we go ahead and admit that however many ships of whatever classes they deployed at Spindle, they've clearly demonstrated that at least some of their weaponry is, in fact, superior to anything we have currently deployed. Obviously, the Navy's been pursuing similar weapons developments for some time, but has declined to put them into service because the League was unwilling to take responsibility for such a dramatic escalation in the lethality of weapons of war, which, by the way, also helps buy us a little time. Because of that unwillingness to pursue such an escalation, we didn't press the R&D on it, and there's going to be an inevitable delay before we can bring our own systems fully up to operational status and start getting them deployed. In the meantime, however... The Mantis have become aware both of their current superiority and also of the fact that it's a fleeting one, and they've decided to push their imperialist agenda while they still have a decided edge in combat. Clearly, the way in which they've distorted what happened in both incidents at New Tuscany, and probably what happened at Monica as well, is all part of an elaborate deception plan. It's intended to erect a facade of Solarian aggression, in order to create a peace lobby here in the League which will agitate in favor of allowing their new empire to retain its ill-gotten gains rather than risk a lengthy, expensive war to force them to surrender those gains. That's probably why they're insisting on this nonsense about manpower being behind it all, too. So you don't think there's anything to that? Abruzzi said. To the idea that a single corporation, no matter how rich and well-connected, could arrange to throw entire battle fleets around the galaxy? Please. Kolokoltsev rolled his eyes. Oh, I don't doubt for a minute that manpower is involved in this thing up to its eyebrows, 
and everybody knows how all the Mason transstellars scratch each other's backs. For that matter, all that nonsense about the Mantis being involved in what happened in Green Pines is an obvious crock that came out of the official Mason system government. So, sure, manpower's involved, and we all know how much manpower's hated Manticore, and vice versa, for centuries. But there's no way a single corporation could be pulling the sorts of strings the Mantis are insisting it is. On the other hand, manpower is the poster child for corrupt transstellars, and thanks to people like O'Hanrahan, everybody knows the transstellars are involved in corruption and sweetheart deals all over the shell and the verge. The Mantis are trying to take advantage of that. You really believe that? McCartney sounded skeptical again, and Kolokoltsev shrugged. You probably know more about that sort of thing than I do, given what goes on with frontier security. I'm not casting any stones when I say that either. I'm just saying you're probably better informed about conditions in the Shell and Verge than I am, but I'm pretty sure that's what the Mantis are doing. It's what I'd be doing in their place at any rate. Whether they really have ambitions beyond the Talbot Cluster or not, and whoever is really to blame for what happened at Spindle, they really do have all sorts of powerful motivations to create exactly the kind of peace lobby I'm talking about. I think they've decided to waive manpower's involvement under the collective noses of our do-gooders here in the League, can anyone say Beowulf, to undercut public support for further military operations against them. And just how will we go about defeating this nefarious Mentikarin plan? Vodolovsky asked, frowning intently. One thing we're going to have to do is make sure there are no more Crandles, Kolokoltsev said. And I know Rajani's already begun activating units from the reserve. In fact, I suspect he's already begun redeploying his active units as well, under Article 7. Mind you, he hasn't told us that, but I'll be damn surprised if he hasn't. So as part of our no more Crandall's policy, one thing we're going to have to do is get him back under control, whatever happens. I think between us we can do that, McCartney said. Go on. All right. The most important thing is that we don't even try to seek a formal declaration of war. Especially with this bogus manpower issue running around, someone would be certain to veto the declaration even if we asked for one, and any debate in the assembly would have too much chance of triggering the sort of witch hunt the League can't afford. Besides, we don't want to find ourselves pushed into conducting some sort of offensive operations— and that could happen if we somehow managed to get a formal declaration after all. So instead, we go right on activating the reserve while we push, hard on R&D, to figure out what the hell they've done with their missiles and how to duplicate it. Rajani isn't going to like it, but we settle into a defensive military posture while we work on the tech problems and take the offensive diplomatically and in the media. We take the position that despite the horrible provocation Manticore has offered us, we aren't going to charge forward into a bloodbath, ours or anyone else's. Instead, we make it clear we're pursuing the diplomatic option, trying to find a negotiated solution that will get Manticore back out of the Talbot Cluster where it belongs, and ultimately hold it responsible for its provocative actions at New Tuscany and Monica, and probably Green Pines too. Sort of an offensive short of war, you mean? Vodolovsky asked. Exactly. What we're really doing is playing for time while we find a way to compensate for these new missiles of theirs. We keep up a barrage of diplomatic missions, news releases, that sort of thing, to keep things simmering along below the level of outright combat until we've managed to equalize the hardware equation. We don't need to have weapons as good as theirs, we just need to have weapons close enough to theirs to make our quantitative advantage decisive again. Once we reach that point, we regretfully conclude that diplomacy isn't going to work and we have no choice but to pursue the military option after all, which we then do under Article 7 without seeking a formal declaration. And you really think this is going to work? Vodolovsky asked. I think it's got a good chance. Kolokoltsev replied. I don't say it's foolproof by any stretch of the imagination. We're going to be juggling hand grenades, whatever we do, though, 
and the fact remains that Manticore has to realize the League is simply too damned big for them to ultimately defeat, no matter how good their weapons are. So as long as we're willing to talk, they'll be willing to talk. Because if they push military operations instead, especially while they have such an overwhelming tactical advantage, they'll be clearly perceived as the aggressors, not the plucky little neobarbs defending themselves against the big, nasty Solarian League. They're already halfway in the doghouse over the Green Pines allegations, and they can't afford to lend those any credence by acting the part of swaggering military bullies. There's no way they could survive rallying a unified Solarian public opinion against them, so they're not going to come to us and inflict millions of additional casualties in what's clearly a war of aggression. In the meanwhile, it's going to be obvious to the entire League that we're doing something. However we got into this mess, we're taking a measured, mature position, doing our best to reverse Manticore's expansionism without anyone else's getting hurt. Ultimately, that's going to have a soothing effect on public opinion. It'll probably even get a bunch of the people who cry most loudly over how evil manpower is, like those idiots in the Renaissance Association, on our side, because of how hard we're working to avoid additional bloodshed. And the more we emphasize how we're seeking a diplomatic solution, the less likely anyone is to notice that we can't pursue a military solution. But at the same time, we keep the pot bubbling so that everyone's used to the notion that we have this ongoing conflict short of outright shooting with Manticore. So that when the time's right, we can turn the heat under the pot back up in a way that either pushes Manticore into shooting again or gives us a clear pretext for going after them, Abruzzi said. He was actually smiling now, and Kolokoltsov nodded. I'm not saying this is a perfect policy, he said. I'm just saying that given what happened to Crandall and the way the public's reacting to it, I think it may be the best one we've got. And another... Excuse me, Mr. Undersecretary? Kolokoltsov turned in his chair, eyebrows rising in astonishment. His butler, Albert Howard, who'd been with him for over thirty years and knew better than to ever walk into the middle of one of Kolokoltsov's private strategy sessions, had just opened the dining room door. His expression was as apologetic as his tone, but he raised the small comm unit in his hand slightly when Kolokoltsov started to open his mouth. I'm very sorry to intrude, sir, Howard said quickly, but Admiral Rajampat is on the comm. He says it's urgent. I told him you were in conference, but he insisted I get you immediately. Kolokoltsov shut his mouth again and his eyes narrowed. After a moment, he nodded. All right, Albert. Under the circumstances, I'm sure you made the proper decision. He held out his hand, and Howard handed over the comm, bowed slightly, and disappeared once more. Kolokoltsov looked at the others for a few seconds, holding the comm, then sighed slightly, shook his head, and activated it. Yes, Rajani? he said as the small hollow display materialized above his hand. What can I do for you? Rajampit's image on the undersized display was tiny, but it was large enough for his odd expression to register. There was something wild and feral about it, and then the admiral grinned like a wolf. I'm glad to see the others are there with you, Inakendi, he said in a harsh, exultant voice. We just got an emergency dispatch over here in my office, and you'll never guess what's been happening with those bastards in Manticore. Chapter 32 I never knew idiocy came in so many flavors. Irene Teague looked up from her display, eyebrows raised, as Dowd Ibn Mamun Alfanudahi stalked into her office. Power doors weren't very suitable for slamming behind oneself, but Alfanudahi did his best. I beg your pardon, Teague said as he hammered the manual close button savagely with the heel of his hand. Her tone was only politely interested, but that fooled neither of them, and he glared at her. His obvious disgust and ire weren't directed at her, that much was readily apparent, but it was also remarkably cold comfort at the moment. It had become obvious over the past few days that even his earlier concerns over possible Manticoran military hardware 
had fallen short of the reality, yet even that hadn't been enough to fray his habitual control this way. So if something finally had... I cannot believe that even those... those Cretans could... She'd been wrong, she realized. It wasn't disgust and ire. It was blind, naked fury. What is it, Dowd? she asked considerably more urgently. It's just... He broke off again, shaking his head, and then, abruptly, the power of his anger seemed to desert him. He sank into the chair facing her deck, legs stretched out before him, shaking his head again, this time with an air of weariness, and Teague felt a tingle of something entirely too much like outright fear as she saw the darkness in his eyes. She started to say something else, then stopped, got up, and poured a cup of coffee. She glanced at him speculatively for a moment, then added a healthy slug from the bottle of single malt she kept in her credenza before she poured another cup, this one without the whiskey, for herself. She passed the first Navy-issue mug across to him, then perched on the edge of her deck, holding her own in both hands, and cocked her head at him. Drink first, she commanded. Then talk to me. Yes, ma'am, he replied, and managed a wan smile. He sipped, and his smile turned more natural. I think it's probably a bit early in the morning for this particular cup of coffee, he observed. It's never too early for coffee, she replied. And somewhere on this planet, it's well past quitting time, so that means it's late enough for any little additions. Creative timekeeping has its uses, I see. He drank more whiskey-laced coffee, then settled back into the chair, and she saw his shoulders finally beginning to relax. The sight relieved her. The last thing he needed was for Fury to betray him into saying something unfortunate to one of his superiors, and she didn't want that. In fact, she was a bit surprised by how genuinely fond of him she'd become over the last few months. The fact that he was Battlefleet and she was Frontier Fleet had become completely irrelevant as she began to realize just how justified his anxiety over possible Manticoran weapons really was. His persistent refusal to allow her to endorse his more alarmist analyses left her feeling more than a little guilty, even though she followed his logic. Unfortunately, she'd also followed his tracks through the reports everyone else had systematically ignored as well, and her own sense of anxiety had grown steadily sharper in the process. The number of other reports, which had apparently been creatively misfiled, and they'd discovered and managed to hunt down, had only made things even worse. Then had come news of the Battle of Spindle. Despite all her own concerns, despite Alphanudahi's most pessimistic projections, the two of them had been shocked by the totality of the Manticoran victory. Not even they had anticipated that an entire fleet of super dreadnoughts could be casually defeated by a force whose heaviest unit was only a battle cruiser. That was like, like having a professional prize fighter dropped by a single punch from her own eight year old daughter, for God's sake. But if the two of them had been shocked, the rest of the Navy had been stunned. The sheer impossibility of what had happened was literally too much for the Navy's officer corps to process. The first reaction had been simple denial. It couldn't have happened, therefore it hadn't happened. There had to be some mistake. Whatever the initial news reports might have seemed to indicate, the Mantis had to have had a task force of their own ships of the wall present. Unfortunately for that line of logic, if it could be dignified by that description, the Mantis appeared to have anticipated such a response. They'd sent Admiral O'Cleary herself home along with their diplomatic note, and they'd allowed her to bring along tactical recordings of the engagement. At the moment, O'Clearly was a pariah, tainted with the same contamination as Evelyn Sigby. Unlike Sigby, of course, O'Cleary was home on Old Earth, where she could have her disgrace rubbed firmly in her face, and even though she was Battlefleet, not Frontier Fleet, Teague found herself feeling a powerful sense of sympathy for the older woman. It was hardly O'Cleary's fault she'd found herself under the orders of a certifiable moron and then been left to do the surrendering after Crandall sailed her entire task force straight into the jaws of catastrophe. 
Despite the convenience of the scapegoat O'Cleary offered, however, there was no getting around the preposterous acceleration numbers of the Manti missiles which had ravaged TF-496. The reports which had confidently been dismissed as ridiculous turned out to have been firmly based in fact, exactly as Al-Fanudahi had been warning his superiors. Indeed, they'd actually understated the threat by a significant margin, and as fresh proof of the fundamental unfairness of the universe, Admiral Chang had seized upon Alphanudahi's original estimates, based on the lower acceleration and accuracy numbers in the original reports, and sharply reprimanded him for not having fully appreciated the scope of the threat in the analyses Chang had then proceeded to ignore. Nonetheless, the fact that Alphanudahi had been right all along couldn't be completely ignored, not any longer. And so the despised prophet of doom and gloom had suddenly found himself presenting briefings flag officers actually listened to. Not only that, but the Office of Operational Analysis was finally being asked to do what it should have been doing all along. Of course, its efforts were a little handicapped by the fact that it had been systematically starved of funds for so long, and that 90% of its efforts had gone into feel-good analyses of battle fleet simulations and fleet problems instead of learning to actually think about possible external threats to the League. Of which, after all, there had been none, which meant, preposterous and pathetic though it undoubtedly was, that the only two people it had who were actually familiar with those threats happened to be in Teague's office at that very moment. To be fair, at least some of their colleagues were immersed in crash efforts to familiarize themselves with the same data, but most of them were still running around like beheaded chickens. They simply didn't know where to look, not yet, and Teague felt grimly confident that they wouldn't figure it out in time to avoid an entire succession of disasters. Not at least if the idiots in charge of the Navy didn't start actually paying attention, really paying attention, as in processing the information, not simply acknowledging it, to Alphanudahi, which, even now, they seemed remarkably disinclined to do. If there'd truly been such a thing as justice, Chiang Hai Shuan and Admiral Karl Heinz Timar would have been out of uniform and begging for handouts on a corner somewhere, Teague thought bitterly. In fact, if there'd been any such thing as real justice, they'd have been in prison. Unfortunately, both of them were far too well connected. In fact, it seemed unlikely either of them would even be relieved of his present assignment, despite the catastrophic intelligence failure represented by the Battle of Spindle. And given the fact that Alphanudahi had been the bearer of uniformly bad tidings in the briefings people were finally listening to, Teague had an unpleasant feeling that she knew exactly who would end up scapegoated to save Chang and Timar's well-protected posteriors. For the moment, though, people had finally been at least listening to what Alphanudahi had been trying to tell them all along, which was why his present mixture of anger and despair was so frightening to her. Ready to talk about it now? She asked gently after a moment. I suppose so, he replied. He took one more sip, then lowered the cup into his lap and looked at her. What have they done this time? She prompted. It isn't so much what they've done as what they're getting ready to talk themselves into doing, he said and shook his head. They've decided that what's happening to the Montes offers them the perfect opening and I think they're getting ready to take advantage of it. What? Teague's tone was that of a woman who felt pretty sure she'd misheard something, and he snorted in harsh amusement. I've just come from a meeting with Kingsford, Jennings, and Bernard, he told her. They're working on a brainstorm of rajampets. Teague's stomach muscles tightened. Admiral Willis Jennings was Seth Kingsford's chief of staff, and Fleet Admiral Evangeline Bernard was the commanding officer of the Office of Strategy and Planning. Under most circumstances, the notion of the commanding officer of Battle Fleet meeting with his chief of staff and the Navy's chief strategic planner to consider the implications of combat reports might have been considered a good thing. Under the present circumstances, and given Alphanudahi's near despair, she suspected that hadn't been the case this time around. Maybe it was his use of the word brainstorm, she thought, mordantly. 
What sort of brainstorm? She asked out loud. As Rajampit sees it, what just happened to the Manti's home system offers what he calls a strategic window of opportunity. He wants to mount an immediate operation to take advantage of the opening, and he proposes to use Admiral Filaretta for the purpose. Filaretta? Teague repeated a bit blankly, and Alfanudahi shrugged. He's battle fleet, so you probably don't know him. Trust me, you're not missing much. He's smarter than Crandall was. In fact, I'm willing to bet his IQ is at least equal to his shoe size. Aside from that, his only recommendation for command is that he has a pulse. It was a mark of just how much he'd come to trust her, and vice versa, she reflected, that he dared to show open contempt for such a monumentally senior officer in front of her. What makes Admiral Rajampet think this Filaretta's in a position to do anything? For some reason known only to God and possibly Admiral Kingsford, Filaretta is swanning around in the shell halfway to Manticore with a force even bigger than Crantle's was. She looked at him sharply, and he looked back with a carefully expressionless face. And just what is this Admiral Filaretta doing out in the shell? she asked. By the oddest coincidence, he too is conducting a training exercise. Alpha Nudahi smiled without any humor at all. You might be interested to know, I checked myself out of idle curiosity, you understand, that in the last thirty T years, Battlefleet has conducted only three exercises which deployed more than fifty of the wall as far out as the shell. But this year, for some reason, Crandall was authorized to conduct her training exercise in the Madra sector, and Fleet Admiral Massimo Filaretta was simultaneously authorized to conduct war games in the Tasmania sector. And unlike Crandall, Filaretta's exercise constitutes, and I quote, a major fleet exercise, which is how he comes to be parked out in Tasmania with 300 wallers plus screen, Rajampet wants to reinforce him with another 70 or 80 of the wall, which just happened to have been deployed to various sector bases within a couple of weeks' hyper time from Tasmania, then send him off to attack Manticore directly. What? She stared at him in disbelief, and he grinned sourly, then extended his whiskey-laced coffee mug towards her. Care for a little belt? he invited. I don't think an entire bottle would help a lot, she replied after a moment and shook her head. You're serious, aren't you? Believe me, I wish I wasn't. What can he be thinking? I'm not sure I'd apply that particular verb to whatever's going on inside his skull at the moment, Alphanudahi said tartly. Then he sighed. As nearly as I could figure out from what Jennings and Bernard were saying to Kingsford, and the kinds of questions all three of them were asking me, Rajampet thinks that even if reports of what happened to them are grossly exaggerated, the Mantis have to be reeling. As Jennings put it, the moment is psychologically ripe. After a pounding like that, they aren't going to have the stomach for a stand-up fight against the SLN. Just like a handful of their cruisers didn't have the stomach for a stand-up fight against Crandall, you mean? Teague said bitterly. I think they expect things to work out a little better this time. They think the Manti home fleet won't fight to defend their home system when a batch of cruisers were willing to go toe-to-toe with Crandall over the administrative center of a province they haven't even firmly integrated into their empire yet? Teague hadn't even tried to keep the incredulity out of her savage tone, and Alphanudahi grinned with at least a trace of genuine humor. There you go, using that verb again, he said. Then he sobered. It does tie in with existing strategic planning, he pointed out. And apparently the theory is that getting hammered that way, completely out of the blue, is bound to have had a devastating effect on the Manti's morale and confidence, completely disregarding whatever effect it's had on their actual physical capabilities. In fact, Jennings suggested that the psychological impact was probably even greater because it came so close on the heels of what happened at Spindle. And of course, they can't be certain we weren't the ones who did it. So when a fresh Solarian fleet turns up on their doorstep, 
in about half the time they can have expected anyone to take getting there, and when they realize we're willing to go at them again, this time on their home ground, despite Spindle, they'll realize they're screwed and throw in the towel. Especially if they do think we're the ones who just hit them, and they're looking over their shoulder, waiting for us to do it again at the moment they're engaged against our conventional wallers. Teague looked at him again, then sighed, walked back around her desk, and flopped into her own chair. Go on. I'm sure there's more and better still to come. Well, I did point out, diffidently, you understand, that even allowing for the fact that Philareta is a lot closer to Manticore than anyone would have expected, it's going to take around a month to get him reinforced the way they're talking about, and then another month and a half to get him to Manticore, by which point at least some of the shock effect should have dissipated. Bernard agreed that was a possibility, but her staff psychologists, his eyes met Teague's and rolled, estimate that would actually work in our behalf. Apparently, they feel three months or so would be about right for the anesthetizing effect of the shock to wear off and give way to despair as a more sober evaluation of their situation sinks in fully. I don't suppose any of these staff psychologists are planning on accompanying Admiral Filaretta to Manticore. Oddly enough, I don't believe they are. Neither would I, Teague muttered. After that concern of mine had been suitably allayed, Alphanodahi continued, I pointed out that our reports indicate the Mantis probably have at least a hundred or so wallers of their own left in home fleet. Given the outcome of the Battle of Spindle, it seemed to me that perhaps a greater numerical advantage on our part would be in order. Admiral Jennings, however, informed me that Admiral Timar's reports indicate the Mantis took heavier losses than we'd originally assumed when Haven attacked their home system. You'll be interested to know that Owenai's best estimate is that the Mantis have no more than sixty or seventy of the wall left. I thought we were the Office of Naval Intelligence, Teague observed. No, we're the Office of Operational Analysis, Alphanodahi corrected in a chiding tone of voice. Admiral Kingsford was kind enough to point that out to me. Apparently, additional human intelligence reports you and I haven't had access to strongly support Admiral Timar's conclusions about Manticoran losses. Fascinating. I thought so, too, but after I'd had the opportunity to digest that information for a few moments, I pointed out that even sixty or seventy of their wallers would presumably be more than enough to deal with three or four hundred of ours, given their newly revealed advantage in missile warfare, which I noted didn't even consider any fixed defenses their capital system might have deployed after a couple of decades of active warfare with the Republic of Haven. Admiral Bernard agreed that that was certainly a reasonable cause for concern, but it's apparently the joint view of Admiral Rajampet and Admiral Kingsford that no one could have gotten in to hammer the Monty shipyards and space stations that hard without blowing his way through the fixed defenses first. In other words, whoever it was must have already taken out a lot of the combat capability they might have used against us. And with the damage to their industrial sector— not to mention their losses in trained military manpower, they won't have been able to do very much to replace lost capability. Teague realized she was shaking her head slowly again and again and made herself stop. They're insane, she said flatly. Or a reasonable facsimile thereof, he agreed glumly. Haven't they even considered the implications of what happened to the Mantis? she demanded. The only implications they're interested in are the ones that have left Manticore vulnerable, Alphanodahi replied flatly. I pointed out to them that we don't have a clue how whoever it was did whatever the hell he did. All we have so far are news reports, for God's sake. It's obvious someone got in and blew the crap out of Manticore's infrastructure, but that's all we know. Bullshit, it's all we know, Teague snapped. We know damned well that nothing we have could have done it. What happened to Crandall at Spindle's proof enough of that. 
I guarantee you that there's no way Spindle had anything like the depth of sensor coverage their home system has, and their home fleet is a hell of a lot more powerful than a handful of cruisers and battle cruisers. So if somebody got through all of that and got in close enough to do the kind of damage the newsies are reporting, or anything remotely like the damage they're reporting, they had to do it with some kind of hardware we've never even heard of, another kind of hardware we've never even heard of. My own thoughts exactly. Alfano Dahi agreed heavily. The two of them sat looking at one another in silence for at least a couple of minutes. Then Teague leaned back and inhaled deeply. You realize who it was, of course, she said quietly. Well, we've just agreed it wasn't us, he replied. And if Haven had anything like this, or if they'd even been close to getting something like this deployed... They never would have launched that do-or-die attack of theirs. So, from where I sit, that eliminates most of the usual suspects. And given what's been going on in Talbot, and the assassination of the Manti ambassador right here in old Chicago, and that obvious nonsense about Manti's sponsorship of that attack on Green Pines, and that attack on Congo, the name that pops to the top of my list begins with the letter M. Mine, too. Her eyes were as dark as his had been, and her expression was very, very grim. Dowd, I'm starting to have a really bad feeling. The sort of feeling a person might get if she believed the Mantis had been right all along about Manpower's involvement. It doesn't seem possible, but... Her voice trailed off, and Alphanodahi nodded. I agree, he said. And frankly, the one that no one, not Rajampet, not Kingsford, not Jennings or Bernard, seems to be so much as thinking about that, worries me even more than the fact that they don't seem to be aware that our hardware has just been demonstrated to be the third best, if that, in the galaxy. It's bad enough they aren't tearing their own commands apart, trying to figure out just how the hell manpower got so deep inside they can actually influence major deployment decisions, but even that pales beside the rather more pressing question of what could have inspired manpower, or whoever, to hit Montecor so directly, to risk stepping that far out of the shadows. So you think this goes a lot farther than just getting Manticor out of the Talbot cluster and away from Mesa? I wouldn't be a bit surprised if that was a big part of it. Maybe even some kind of triggering event, Alphanudahi said. But anyone who could pull this entire sequence of events together, anyone who could get whole task forces and fleets of Solarian capital ships deployed where he wants them, when he wants them, then pull something like the attack on Montecor out of his ass, isn't just improvising as he goes along. Either of those operations must have required a massive organization and very careful and lengthy planning. Bing and Crandall, even Filaretta, could probably have been steered into position by somebody with enough money and enough political clout to influence a handful of high-level strategic decisions. After all, as far as anyone knew, they were just routine peacetime deployments— so why not do a little favor for someone with deep enough pockets? But this direct assault on Manticore required serious industrial power, military planning, and almost certainly some sort of technological breakthrough that neither we nor the Mantis know anything about. That's way outside the parameters for even the biggest and nastiest transstellar, Irene. It's an entirely different level of capabilities. And whoever it is... Whether it's manpower or someone else who's just been using manpower as a front, there has to be a reason she's decided to go ahead and show us all she has that kind of capability, Teague said quietly. Precisely. Alphano Dahi rubbed his forehead wearily. Maybe at least part of it was opportunism. Maybe the real target's been Manticore all along, and the combination of the Manti's confrontation with us in Talbot and their losses in the Battle of Manticore was just too great a temptation, like Rajampet's strategic window of opportunity, 
and the bad guys jumped before they were ready. But I don't think it's that simple. I don't think someone who was able to build up the capabilities we're talking about in the first place, without anyone even noticing, is going to just throw away all that careful concealment, however great the strategic temptation, before he was pretty much ready to move anyway. Move against Manticore, you mean? Teague frowned with a dissatisfied air. I don't think you're wrong, Dowd, but at the same time, I don't see the point. She shook her head. Oh, don't get me wrong. Obviously, if we didn't even know these people were planning whatever the hell it is they're planning, it's not very likely we're going to be able to magically discern what it is they're after, what their endgame is. And I know Manticore's richer than sin, for its size at least, and its merchant marine is all over the damned galaxy, with its nose in everybody else's business. And I don't doubt for a minute that Manpower resents the hell out of the Mantis' enforcement of the Churwell Convention. I'll grant you all of that. But why go to such lengths to crush Manticore? God only knows how long they must have spent planning and building up their resources before they could pull something like this off— so why do it? Why make that kind of investment just to attack a relatively small star nation on the far side of the damned league from them? It doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't, Alphanudahi agreed quietly. That's why I'm so worried by the fact that no one else even seems to care about Manpower's involvement in all this. Because I agree with you, Irene. Nobody's going to go to all this trouble and the huge expense which must have been involved just because they don't like the Star Empire of Manticore. There's got to be more to it, and the very unpleasant question that's been occurring to me over the last day or so is why they got us involved in the first place. If they already had the capability to carry off something like this attack of theirs, why run the risk of trying to manipulate us into squashing Manticore? They could have done this on their own any time they wanted to without involving the League at all. And if their intelligence on Manti capabilities was as good as it must have been for them to have planned and executed this operation, they must have had a damned good idea of just how outclassed our Navy was going to be when it went up against the Mantis. So they obviously weren't counting on us to do the job for them. You are sure about that? Teague's question wasn't a challenge, but her eyes were troubled. You don't think they might have resorted to doing the job themselves only because they'd realized we weren't going to be able to after all? No way. He shook his head. Just getting their strike forces into position would have taken a long time. Unless I'm sadly mistaken, they would have had to start moving them before the first New Tuscan incident. Certainly before the second one, so that means they had both wings of their plan in motion at the same time. No, they knew we wouldn't be able to take the Mantis, but they maneuvered us into a war with them anyway. And that suggests to me that maybe it wasn't so much that they wanted the Mantis at war with us, as they wanted us at war with the Mantis. Why? Teague's frown was deeper than ever, and Alphanudahi shrugged unhappily. If I knew the answer to that question, I might be able to do something about it, he said. But what I'm very much afraid of, Irene, is that we just thought this was all about using the League to crush Manticore. I think it goes a lot deeper than that, and as preposterous as it sounds, I can only see one other target on the range at the moment. He looked across her desk at her, his dark eyes worried. Us, he said very, very softly. Chapter 33 Madame Président, Secretary Seisman is on the com. Thank you, Antoine, Eloise Pritchard said, suppressing a familiar temptation to smile. Antoine Ballardinelli, her senior secretary, was probably the only member of her staff who persistently forgot to refer to Thomas Theismann as Admiral Theismann. Everyone else was willing to accept that Theismann preferred his naval title, to which he was still entitled since he was CNO as well as Secretary of War, but Ballardinelli was adamant. As far as he was concerned, 
one of the most important features of the restored republic was that elected officials really were in charge again, and so he invariably used Theismann's civilian title. If that irritated the secretary, Bellardinelli was quite prepared to live with it. In fact, he and Angelina Rousseau, the president's personal aide, had been sparring over that little omission on his part ever since the first post-coup elections. Of course, although the two A's, as Bellardinelli and Rousseau were commonly referred to, were both highly efficient and both deeply devoted to Eloise Pritchard, they loathed one another with deep and reciprocal passion. Which might be the real reason Rousseau, never one to back away from a fight herself, especially with Bellardinelli, was so adamantly on the military side. If they hadn't been squabbling over Theismann's proper title, they would have found something else to fight about, after all. Personally, Pritchard was just as happy to have them use up at least some of their energy on something fairly harmless, and she knew Theismann found the entire situation amusing. "'You're welcome, Madame Président,' Bellardinelli replied now, and disappeared from Pritchard's display to be replaced by Thomas Theismann. "'And how are you this fine morning, Mr. Secretary?' Pritchard inquired. "'Did it again, did he?' Theismann asked with a smile. "'Unless I miss my guess,' Angelina was in the outer office when your call came in. He wasn't using his hush mic, anyway. My observations been that when he forgets to do that, it's usually on purpose. Have you ever considered just locking the two of them in a room with a pair of pulses to let them settle this once and for all? Often, as a matter of fact, she said gravely. Unfortunately, Sheila won't let me play with guns any more. Pity. Indeed. And now that we have that out of our systems, Admiral, to what do I owe the pleasure? We finished that study you requested, Theismann said in a much more serious tone, and Pritchard let her chair come upright. I see. And your conclusions were? Pretty much what I'm sure you expected, Theismann shrugged. Frankly, Spindle doesn't make much difference as far as our own strategic situation vis-a-vis Manticore is concerned. We're still where we were, screwed, in other words, if they come after us. What we know now is that we're not alone in that predicament. In fact, it would appear the Sollies are even worse screwed than we are. Personally, I take at least a modicum of dog-in-the-manger satisfaction from that conclusion— given how the Sollies made us pay through the nose for their tech transfers right after the First War started. Pritchard nodded. She knew Theismann would be sending her the actual report, along with a complete précis, but that wasn't what she wanted from him now, and as he said, his summary of the Octagon's conclusions were about what she'd expected. So, Admiral Trenis' analysts are satisfied that the sensor data Duchess Errington provided us with is genuine? she asked. The missile performance wasn't quite as good as what we've observed against our own units, Theismann said. But I suspect that's because their heavy cruiser's fire control isn't sophisticated enough to take full advantage of the FTL link. It certainly wasn't because anything the Sollies did knocked them back, at any rate. He grimaced. I can admire a professional job as much as the next man, but in this instance, those poor solid bastards were even more outclassed than we were during Operation Buttercup, which says really depressing things about how bad solid intelligence must be when you think about it. We and the Mantis have been throwing multi-drive missiles at each other for quite a while now, but it's obvious this Crandall didn't have a clue what that was going to mean. You'd think someone would have mentioned those unimportant little details to their Office of Naval Intelligence. Well, one thing I've never had any trouble agreeing with the Mantis about is that the Soles are the biggest, most arrogant pains in the posterior of anyone in the entire galaxy, Pritchard said tartly. I don't like the thought of that many people getting killed, whoever they are. At the same time, though... I'd be lying if I said a nasty little part of me doesn't take a certain satisfaction in seeing the almighty Solarian League flat on its face in the mud while somebody tap dances on its spine. By and large, I can't disagree, Theismann replied. Still, as your Secretary of War, it behooves me to point out that the Solis value as an additional threat to the Manticrans has just been... "'substantially devalued.' 
So you don't agree with young girl's argument that the league's sheer size is still going to keep the Montes running scared of a confrontation with old Chicago? Madam President, Eloise, let's be serious here. Theisman shook his head. Whatever else anyone might say about Mantecarans, they don't run scared worth a damn. If they'd had any inclinations in that direction, the legislaturalists would still be running the People's Republic, and the Manticore binary system would belong to us, neither of which, you may have noticed, is the case. Now that you mention it, I had noticed, she replied with a slight smile. In the long term, I'm sure the Mounties would vastly prefer to avoid a direct, large-scale confrontation with the League, Theismann continued soberly. They've already had a graphic demonstration from us about the transitory nature of technological advantages, and the League's so damned big and so damned rich, it could afford to scattergun a hundred separate research programs into each and every one of the Mounties' current toys. Eventually, they'd manage to duplicate them, too, and when that happened, Manticore would almost certainly be history. But unless the Solis' leadership consists solely of outright lunatics, which, unfortunately, no one over here at the Octagon is prepared to rule out, they're going to realize that for the next several years, any war against Manticore would be a one-sided massacre. It may be they're stupid enough to pull the trigger anyway, but I seriously question whether even the Soli public would tolerate that sort of bloodbath for any lengthy period. So what? Pritchard asked in her best devil's advocate tone. Who cares about a little thing like angry voters? It's not as if there's any real political accountability or oversight in the League, you know. Not now there isn't, Theismann said grimly. But personally, I think the Soli should be paying attention to more than just the operational aspects of events here in our corner of the galaxy. There's that little matter of what's been going on in the Maya sector, for example. And then there's us. If you'll recall, Madam President, the citizens of the People's Republic didn't have any real political oversight either, a situation which changed rather abruptly when the Mantis' Eighth Fleet came calling and Saint-Just got distracted dealing with that minor threat. Pritchard started to reply lightly, then stopped as she realized Theismann was serious. Had it been anyone else, she would have dismissed his suggestion out of hand. Corrupt though it might be, the Solarian League was still the Solarian League, and the notion that the system which had governed it literally for centuries could be changed was ludicrous. But Thomas Theismann had more first-hand experience than most in arranging exactly that sort of change, and although he disliked politics, he understood them well. Not to mention the fact that he was probably the best student of history she knew, so if he thought the League might be that fragile... Well, I suppose the point at the moment is that what's happened at Spindle is going to make the Star Empire more confident, not less, she said, putting thoughts of the League aside for future consideration. Since they've just demonstrated they have a decisive military advantage over the SLN, Maguire and Younger's belief that they're going to be even more willing to make concessions would appear to be, uh, ill-founded. I believe you could say that, yes, Theismann agreed dryly. Which, I might point out, is very probably the reason the Duchess handed the sensor recordings over to us. I'm sure she thought about that pretty carefully, since it had the potential to give us so much more data on their systems. But unless I'm mistaken, she figured that letting us actually see how effective their weapons were against the Solis would underscore the extent of, and the basis for, their confidence. And to be fair, the tactical situation was such that they really didn't show us a lot more about their capabilities than we already knew. I'd really love to have seen how their Nike's fire control would have done running the attack, for instance. At this point, we don't know whether or not they have the FTL fire control systems. In that case, I think it would be a good idea for you to personally brief Maguire and Younger, I know neither of them's on your list of favorite people, but I'd appreciate it if you'd take the opportunity to lean on them just a bit. You want me to do this wearing my military hat as CNO, 
or my civilian hat as Secretary of War. Both, I think. We need them to be very clear on this point, Tom. Pritchard frowned and toyed with one lock of platinum hair. Duchess Harrington's been remarkably patient about not bringing up that matter of our correspondence, so far at least, but she's never pretended it's not going to have to be addressed, the president continued after a moment. Personally, I think that, given the fact that we've already acknowledged we were the ones who started shooting this time around, she's been willing to wait on that point. I think she's been letting us wrangle and argue about things like plebiscites and formulas for computing reparations as a way to clear away the underbrush before she tackles what she knows is going to be the thorniest issue of all. For that matter, she's probably been letting the negotiations build momentum as well to help carry us past any portals further down the road. Admiral or not, she's got good diplomatic instincts. Either way, though, we're going to have to approach that issue pretty damn soon. In one way, it's going to be a lot easier for Alexander Harrington than she can possibly suspect, given what we think we know about Arnold's shenanigans. But it's going to be a nightmare for us on the domestic side, and I want every member of our delegation to understand very clearly just how bleak our military prospects would be if this thing goes belly up on us. And you think our two colleagues are stupid enough to have missed that already? Theisman sounded just a bit skeptical. I don't know. Pritchard's frown deepened. I do know I don't trust either of them a single centimeter past his personal perception of his own best interests. That goes without saying, I suppose— but I'm not sure how good either of them is at recognizing the limits of those interests, or their obtainability, at any rate. Frankly, Younger worries me more than Maguire. There's something about him, about his ability to believe he'll always come out on top, that makes me very nervous. Maguire's probably even more self-serving than Younger, if that's humanly possible, but I think he also has a more pragmatic grasp of the fact that reality sometimes has this unpleasant habit of being something besides what he'd like it to be. See if you can emphasize that to him in this case. Gosh, thanks, Theisman said. Consider it one of the perks of your position, Mr. Secretary. Yet another opportunity to meet the movers and shakers who control our political destiny. Sure. Will Sheila object if I take a gun? Much later that evening, the attention signal on Pritchard's desktop comm warbled softly. She looked up from the report she'd been reading. She was always reading some report, after all, and frowned as the signal warbled again. Then she bookmarked her place and pressed the acceptance key. Yes? I'm sorry to disturb you, Madam President, Angelina Rousseau said, almost before her image had appeared on the display. I know you're working, but I think you'd better take this call. Angelina, I've got that reception in less than an hour, Pritchard reminded her. I know, Madam President, Rousseau repeated. But it's Admiral Alexander Harrington, ma'am. She says it's urgent. Pritchard stiffened, sitting upright in her chair. Did she tell you what she needs to speak to me about? No, ma'am. All I know is that a dispatch boat just came in from Manticore. Just came in? Yes, ma'am. Angelina Rousseau was an extraordinarily attractive woman, but Pritchard hadn't chosen her as her senior aide on the basis of her decorative qualities, and the younger woman's brown eyes were dark. It made its alpha translation less than 30 minutes ago and burst transmitted an FTL message to the Manticoran delegation. I see, Pritchard said slowly, even as her mind raced. Obviously, whatever was on Alexander Harrington's mind, it had something to do with that dispatch boat. And if she was already on the calm... Well, you'd better go ahead and put her through. Oh, and Angelina? Yes, ma'am? Give Sheila a heads up. The president smiled thinly. 
It's possible we're going to be a little late to that reception after all. Yes, ma'am. Rousseau vanished from the display, and Pritchard found herself looking at Honor Alexander Harrington instead, with what she hoped was a carefully concealed sense of trepidation. At least Alexander Harrington's tree cat wasn't close enough to read right through her pretense of calm. That was something, but not all that much under the circumstances. The fact that Pritchard had discovered she really did like Alexander Harrington, quite a lot, in fact, didn't make the Havenite president feel any calmer about having the Duchess screen her so unexpectedly. Mostly that was because she'd felt a cautious sense things were going well. Given the tortuous and so often disastrous history between the Republic of Haven and the Star Empire of Manticore, that feeling that things were actually starting to work out had produced an automatic fear that another shoe was waiting somewhere, ready to fall squarely on top of her head when she least expected it all of which made Alexander Harrington's abrupt request more than a little ominous. Sometimes it's hard to believe I first met the woman barely two months ago, Pritchard thought. Still, I don't suppose it should be at all surprising I'd rather deal with her than some of my own allies right here in Nouveau Paris. That incredible jackass younger, for one. If nothing else, at least she has a brain that works and quite a lot of integrity to go along with it, too, which is even rarer, unfortunately. Left to their own devices, Pritchard suspected, she and Alexander Harrington could have hammered out a workable set of terms at least a month ago. On the other hand, she supposed that after the better part of a tea-century of enmity and two decades of actual hostilities, they were moving with blinding speed to have come as close together as they had, in fact, the only points still dividing them were the question of reparations and that matter of the forged diplomatic notes. What galled her most was that it was Gerald Younger and Samson McGuire who were throwing almost all the grit into the gears. Neither one of them had been at all happy about being required to accept the guilt for resuming hostilities, which Pritchard found especially ironic, given the fact that they'd been two of Arnold Giancola's closest allies and they were still trying to insist on settling the reparations question while the Mantis were still under Solarian pressure. Despite which, the president felt confident that agreement on that point, on Alexander Harrington's proposed basis, was no more than a day or two away now. Which, of course, would only mean they finally had to deal with the pre-war diplomatic correspondence, and she didn't expect McGuire or Younger to magically get more cooperative when that happened. To be fair, which she found extremely difficult in their cases, neither of them knew Giancola had manipulated the correspondence in question, or at least if they did know, they'd buried their connection to Giancola's thoroughly illegal shenanigans so deep, Kevin Usher's best investigators couldn't find it. And Pritchard still hadn't dared to tell them that their own Secretary of State— and close political ally, had betrayed his oath of office by forging the Star Empire's supposed diplomatic correspondence exactly the way Manticore had been insisting someone had all along. If she'd trusted the integrity of either of them as far as she could spit, she would have taken them into her confidence long ago. Now, despite the fact that she didn't trust their integrity, she was going to have to and she dreaded putting that sort of weapon into the hands of men who wouldn't hesitate for an instant to wring any personal advantage they could out of it, regardless of the consequences for the Republic and the peace process. Well, Eloise, she thought tartly, it's not like you haven't known this was coming, now is it? That's the real reason you sicked Thomas on the two of them, to get them to understand that our collective position's far too precarious for anyone to be playing personal power games. Not that what happened at Spindle's likely to make either of them suddenly see the light if the Battle of Manticore didn't. Frankly, I wish Alexander Harrington would just go ahead and strangle both of them. I'm sure she could do it without even breaking a sweat, and I'd be perfectly willing to write out a presidential pardon for murder on the spot preferably in their blood. For that matter, she's got diplomatic immunity now that I think about it. I wouldn't even need the pardon. Thank you for taking my call on such short notice, Madam President, Alexander Harrington said. 
I know how crowded your schedule is. You're quite welcome, Admiral. Pritchard smiled wryly. There aren't many people on Avon who'd take precedence over you in my appointments book, you know. Besides, our conversations are always so interesting. Alexander Harrington smiled back, but it was an almost perfunctory response, without the genuine humor she would normally have displayed, and Pritchard's mental antennae quivered. Well, I'm afraid this conversation is going to be brief, Alexander Harrington said. It is? Pritchard asked just a bit cautiously. Yes. Alexander Harrington paused for a moment, then inhaled as if visibly bracing herself, and Pritchard's trepidation turned into something much stronger. Honor Alexander Harrington was one of the least hesitant people she'd ever met, yet she was visibly unhappy about whatever she was about to say. Indeed, as Pritchard thought about it, she realized the other woman was almost shaken-looking. Madam President, I'm afraid we're going to have to suspend our negotiations, at least briefly. I beg your pardon? Pritchard felt the bottom drop out of her stomach as that long-awaited shoe came crashing down, and an emotion entirely too much like panic surged through her. If the negotiations failed, if Manticore resumed active operations, I assure you that it has nothing to do with anything that's occurred over the negotiating table, Alexander Harrington said, almost as if she'd read Pritchard's mind. I hope we'll be able to resume the talk sometime soon. In the meantime, however, I'm afraid I've just been recalled. I see, Pritchard said, although, in fact, she didn't see anything of the sort. Do you have any idea when you might be returning? I'm afraid not, Madam President. In fact, I'm not certain if I'll be returning at all. But why not? Anxiety, and not just over the negotiations, given the other woman's apparent unhappiness and the sense of kinship she developed where Alexander Harrington was concerned, startled the undiplomatic question out of her. Madam President, I... Alexander Harrington began, then paused. She gazed at Pritchard for several seconds, then gave a little nod. Eloise, she said in a softer voice, using Pritchard's given name for the very first time. It's not just me they're recalling. They've recalled Eighth Fleet as well. An icicle ran down Eloise Pritchard's spine. She'd actually become accustomed to having the Mantis' Eighth Fleet hanging out there like some sort of infinitely polite sword of Damocles, and at least as long as it was sitting there, like a spectator to the negotiations, she could be confident it wasn't off doing something else, something neither she nor the Republic might care for at all, but... Her eyes narrowed suddenly as Alexander Harrington's expression registered fully. This was a woman who'd faced death not just once, but repeatedly. The thought that anything could cause her to look this shaken was just this side of terrifying. In fact, Pritchard couldn't imagine anything which could have produced this effect, unless... Is it the Solis? she asked. Alexander Harrington hesitated for a moment, then sighed. We don't know. Not yet, she said. Personally, I doubt it, but that only makes it worse. She looked at Pritchard levelly. I'm sure you'll be hearing reports about what's happened soon enough, and when you do, I'm sure people here in the Republic are going to start thinking about how it's changed the diplomatic calculus. At the moment, to be honest, I don't have any idea which way it's going to change things. I hope even more than I hoped before I had the opportunity to actually meet you, Thomas Theismann, and some of your colleagues, that it won't force Queen Elizabeth to stiffen her position where the Republic is concerned, but I can't promise that. Pritchard felt an almost overwhelming urge to lick her lips, but she suppressed it sternly and made herself sit motionless, waiting, her expression as tranquil as she could make it. I don't have instructions to do this, Alexander Harrington continued. But before I leave, I'll have a copy of Elizabeth's official message to me made for you. In the meantime, 
I'll summarize. She inhaled again and squared her shoulders. Approximately one week ago, in Manticore, she began. <laughs>